but but wow, a mate is going to be on the board. Although, wait, was Queen A check a huge blunder? That looks like you. How you just, it's a huge blunder. How are you protecting the knight? Oh my god! You don't. He lost the two. The queen, queen and the three. Oh my god! Oh my gosh! That I, I don't even know what to make queen of this. Queen A8 check was a huge blunder. And he just missed Queen F3 check, securing the draw. So now he's going to fight for the draw all over again. He's going to lose this. Now White's going to win this. Oh my gosh! And but the, even even a draw is already a successful result. What a huge! That has just been a day and a half for the snowballs today. Wow! Queen A8 check feels instinctively like it should be putting the game away actually walks into a a, a, a losing position for for Kolars and and Jimmy and uh, I don't know, I feel like I accidentally just took a trip to Six Flags and I'm just been up yeah, and down the roller coaster this, this roller coaster is enough to uh you know and he's he's doing pop, this pop a ginger pill I'm oh. queasy <laughs>
Absolutely, and uh, the uh, the players are getting set here. We see that the crowd is set downstairs. The chat is set. We've already got people sharing their emotes, letting their letting their soul glow, so to speak, showing showing who they're here and rooting for. I'm rooting for you next. I'm rooting for entertainment. Yep. I'm rooting for for the uh, the whole just thing to be a blast here. I, I can't wait. I think this is going to be a very very close match. Um, and uh, we're going to, I think, start games when we come back from our last very quick break before the Pro Chess League final match of the 2019 season gets underway. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody, to the Pro Chess League finals. We are getting set for the championship match to begin between the bottom bottom snowballs, the St. Louis Archbishops. If you're just getting here, where have you been? But we're glad to have you with us on this Sunday. It's championship Sunday here for the chess world, and I think the championship match is about to get underway any moment. I can't wait for the action to take off because we have some great players. We're starting actually with Fabiano Caruana here against Ina Agres. And Ina, I felt really bad, badly for her because she went 0 out of 5, because yep. including the tiebreaker game. But she played some really good chess, in particular against Jun Zhao yesterday. Um, so... Yeah, you know, it, it, me. we talk about it. It's a team event, right? And obviously, sometimes you look at the scoreboard afterwards and a stat sheet, uh, while some would say it doesn't lie, it doesn't necessarily tell the whole story either, right? And we know that Ina has worked super hard as a manager to get the team here, but she also works super hard on the board. And, and like you and I said, even if it didn't show up in the result, we could feel the momentum shifting when she set the tone and was much better against the Sean Dupanda's board three, almost notched a victory. Yeah. And it just, it, it went, does that directly affect that in that exact same round, Donchenko beat Lee Chow with the black pieces? I mean, I don't know, but it felt that way to us. It felt that way to the crowd here, I think. Absolutely. felt that way to everybody. Uh, and, and I think that it'll be interesting to see how she holds up. Has she, has she uh, recovered from that? And maybe she gets on the scoreboard as well, in addition to kind of leading the team spirit. Yeah, we were just talking about this with Anna earlier about how Zhang Di lost that first game against Zavin Andreas in right. an amazing position. He played super well, and you have to just forget about your losses, just go for it. Even if you win the game, you got to forget about it next game. And so I think, you know, today... Forget about yesterday, new right. day today, and just play more quickly. That's my key piece of advice for her. Yeah. Well, this is going to be, I mean, this is going to be a battle of the titans. Obviously, it's, uh, it's hard for us. we got to, like, gather ourselves here, right? You get, you've already had the call for the Constellation match, which was a very, very close one there. Congratulations to Shang Du for taking the bronze medal. But now we've got, I mean, I feel like every one of these matchups, okay, I think Fabiano's a heavy favorite against Ina in any game, but she's white here, and yeah. I feel like every game in this in this setup between the Snowballs and, and the Archbishops is one that could have a surprise and go either way, but I think speaking of uh, going different, different ways, we actually have just been told by the producer that there's something special going on downstairs, so we're going to check in with Alexandra and with the crowd and, and with the uh, festivities going on down below. I'm here with Mike Klein and six youngsters who are competing in Puzzle Rush. One of them is going to win a very special prize. How are you feeling, you guys? Good. Could I have a little more enthusiasm there? <laughs> that, that was amazing. Um, Mike, can you tell me a little bit about how Puzzle Rush compares to the new feature that Chess Kid is bringing out? I think they didn't respond because they were too busy doing it. Uh, so Puzzle Rush has been around since November. And as everyone knows, you've got five minutes. It's a solitary game. You're trying to solve as many puzzles as you can. As of about a month ago on ChessKid.com, which is the scholastic version of Chess.com, you're actually racing another child in real time trying to fill up your power meter so you can try to beat your friend in real time. Right now, they're all playing on their own machines, but on Puzzle Duel, you can actually see this race happening, and so it adds that extra level of competition. I feel like we should be able to do Puzzle Duel no matter how old we are. I, that feels a little bit unfair that it's just on Chess Kid. What would you say to that? Well, uh, on Chess Kid, we do try to develop features mostly for kids. However, there's a lot of great coach features that coaches can actually see their kids' progress, how many videos they've done, how many puzzle duels they've done. So if you're a parent or a coach, you have a little bit more organizational control. But yeah, the experience is mostly for the kids. Well, should we check on how the kids are doing here? All right. Let's not put them under pre she finished? Five minutes went by that quickly. I don't think he started on time. All right, so we have 22, we have Keep six, going. we have 21, 23. Okay, somebody's an overachiever over here. We know how it's going. Uh, what about you? What was your final that wasn't a number, so I, I think he was doing okay, though. Uh, Eric Hansen would like to play. Eric, come over here. I think I'm allowed to do that. Okay. 
Uh, so we have a new kid challenger approaching. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with chess kid Eric Hansen? I love it. I love um, playing against uh, my uh, classmates. It's just something that we bond, uh, yeah, bond with. Yeah. Um, I know it's hard not being top of class. I see some kids who are doing better at Puzzle Rush than you are, but can you give them any words of advice? Don't only do Puzzle Rush, but it's... Uh, don't get tilted. That's, that's the best. Don't get too upset. Don't, you got a you gotta time limit there. I have a question for Eric. People have been trying to set the record on Puzzle Rush live in their stream. People keep inching closer to 60. Is that kind of like the four minute mile of Puzzle Rush? I think it's gonna, I think the record's gonna keep breaking as uh, more people are playing. But yeah, for now it is, but I think next year we'll be talking about different numbers. It's moving pretty fast. I see somebody restarted, so I'm gonna go make sure the kids are playing by the rules. Uh, why, why are we restarting here? Who got the highest score? <laughs> 28, 27, he has 44 seconds. Are you gonna beat the 28? 28. Keep going, guys. Keep going. How do you feel? He's gonna get 28. 29, oh, you got it. oh my god. What is it? 28 with two mistakes. Do you want me to stop distracting you and start distracting him? Yes. Okay, uh, you're at 29, he's at 28, you have 30 seconds. Oh, he's at 30. He's gonna beat my puzzle rush record. This is really intimidating. He's already double Eric Hansen's puzzle rush record. You're doing this, come on. The highest was probably like 24. Okay, you got 13 seconds. Left. 13 seconds. Okay, he's at he's at 30, 32. Keep going. Do you want to do some commentary on what he's doing here? Uh, he's failing. Four, three, two, one. Oh! He's still our winner. Okay, we have. No, guess what, guys? You all win, and you all get a prize. Signed Pro Chess League jerseys for everyone. Right. Um, Eric Hansen here is going to hand you guys a jersey. You can grab it from him. But yeah. Oh, everybody wants St. Louis here. Okay, so we're going to hand out the jerseys. Um, everybody's going to pick which one they get. They're continuing to play Puzzle Rush. Apparently, the jerseys are way too big, but I'm pretty sure they'll make a nice dress. Anyway, we're going to get back to you guys in the booth. I can't hear you over the excitement of the kids, so just just go back up there, please. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounded like she was trying to be safe. Go go back up there, please. That was awesome, though. I mean, you know what that's like. You have four kids. Oh, I, that, that, that was just like, I was having flashbacks right yeah. there back home. I thought I was on vacation there, but, you know. <laughs> no, uh, that was awesome, and... Uh, Fun, fun to see them go at it. I hope those kids appreciate the jerseys they got, though. Those are signed yeah. by all the players. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, everyone wanted the St. Louis one, I think, probably because Fabiano Caruana's signature on it. But every one of those jerseys is, uh, you know, that's a valuable little piece Absolutely. of hardware. Absolutely. No, it's a great token. And you said vacation. I looked at the Bishop on G5. I thought, that, that Bishop on a nice vacation from its E7. That, that E7's work. It just stuck behind the pawn on D6. It's a very passive piece. But that Bishop looks pretty good over there on G5. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how Fabi uh, got this position. It almost a, a Svezhnikov structure, and uh, people have talked about how he's adopted more Sicilians as part of his repertoire uh, since Magnus played so many against him again in the World Championship. But this was not a Svezhnikov, even though the pawn structure eventually becomes similar to one. Uh, it's actually a con Sicilian to start. And when we talk about uh, this structure of the Svezhnikov, we're specifically referring to the move E5, where Black is committing a pawn chain that will help create space and counterplay on the king side, but comes with drawbacks, like a weak dark square, uh, sorry, a weak, a weak light square in the center, a weak uh, pawn on a dark square here on D6. So um, we were all distracted by the kids doing puzzle rush, but in the meantime, this is the position we now have on the board here between Ina and Fabiano. And Robert, talk about some of the difficulties here because I, I think positionally, if you could just remove all the miners on the board, you'd love white structure, right? right. A horrible D6 pawn with a D file open and no minor pieces in the way. You'd think that uh, Ina would be happy, but Fabiano is not going to let that happen, right? We see uh, the man with the plan on camera right there, and that's part of what White's goal is. How do I how do I clear the smoke but not change the pawn structure? I don't really want to start taking things because now now not only do I fix black structure, but now I've got weaknesses of my own here in the center, you, right? So you probably even take with the B pawn, right? They say, same the idea. Now you got B file and D4, right? <sighs> yeah. So what are, what are what are Ina's plans here? Um, as we now have her 
on view and, and what, what's going through her mind right now. Yeah, she definitely does not want to take that knight on c5 because you just pointed out it fixes black's pawn structure, improves it, you gain space as black. But right. you also don't really want to retreat either. So you're in this tough situation of I, it, almost yeah, like you're choosing between two not so great options. Yeah. And I think white objectively is all right here. Mm -hmm. And like you can make a move like rook to a3. Or, I mean, okay, you could. Yeah, yeah I'm not saying... No, it's, it's actually interesting, right? Because you are pointing out that the trade is now really, really not in black's plans because b6 would become a target. Right, so black wants to keep that knight on c5. Yeah. It's essentially a great piece because it attacks the bishop, the knight, but it's also blockading the bishop on f2. And I think rook a3 is totally reasonable as an option here. And then what's the plan, though? Like, let's say rook right. a3 and black passes. Right. What's, what's my next what's move? Right? Next move? Well, I think one idea to consider is even though you said you don't want to retreat the knight, there actually are some ideas in these positions, right, where it goes to a1 and c2. Yep. And the reason, everybody, is the knight becomes particularly useful on c2 for a number of reasons. It supports b4, right? The knight on c2 guards b4. It overprotects d4. And in some cases, it actually pulls kind of a full Lopez, right? Never go full Spanish, but sometimes <laughs> you can go full Lopez. And, uh, and and bring a knight in here. And this is very similar to how you see the knights remaneuver themselves in a mainline Rui Lopez, right? Trying to control uh, the light square. So that's an interesting idea. I wonder if Ina will find rook a3. Okay, so she, she settles on bishop c2. Yeah. Um, I actually really don't like that move, unfortunately, because I feel like I wanted my knight on that square, specifically with ideas we talked about. But... Um, but maybe you should just retreat the knight anyway right. to say c1 and do the similar thing. But also, black is going to a5 because typically you don't want to play a5 when a knight's coming to b5. Right, but, but here... It takes a little while for the knight to go c3 to b5 over there, and the d4 square, like you pointed out, is blacks for the taking. So right. I think it's a very double-edged position. I mean, it's very clogged, so it doesn't right. seem like, well, where's well, the he, edge? And he goes for it. Yeah, but where's the edge, right? But I, I think black... I would prefer to have black here because I see more potential of ideas. And you don't think we're just suffering from a case of Fabiano-itis? No, I just have had the Fabiano-itis, whites... everybody, you may be also <laughs> afflicted with this disease. It's where you're biased toward Fabiano's positions because he's 2,800. For, for me, it's the control of the dark squares, not to mention the fact that I have uh, a little trauma looking at this position from having the white side of it. Right. And just like, I, it looks so good. My knight's on d5 is awesome, but then I struggle after that. Well, you know who doesn't have trauma looking at it from the white side? That's Ina. So let's zoom in and, and see what she's looking at right now. We've got uh, the last move played, rook f to d1. And this is her view with an eye tracker that we're hoping to see here in just a moment to get an idea of where she's looking. Maybe, maybe, she's, maybe her eyes are closed. Maybe her eyes are closed, right? little meditation, little zen. Um, or she's leaned in. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a bit because that doesn't seem to be on. The board I would like to go to now is actually board two for the snowballs. And uh, board three for the Archbishops, that's Donchenko versus Theodoro. Um, it's also progressed pretty far. Yeah, but another game has caught my eye. Can we go to Georg Meyer's yeah, game? Yeah, good idea. We, we started with board <laughs> one for the Bishops. Let's look at board one for the Snowballs, who uh, Georg forgot how to castle, or he uh, just decided his king needed some exercise, right? What's with these mean, pawns is, in the sixth rank? I, I have no idea, right? I mean, this is... Uh, this, this is unique. Let, let's back let's back this thing up and take a look at how we got here, shall we? So we've got a okay. Tries to go a French, but Perlenko instead keeps it in a d4 system. This is a London, of course. Knight h5, Bishop g3. Okay, I mean this is not the most standard type of position you would see. I think for either side, Black moving this knight to the edge, kind of breaking basic principles, everybody, but for a good reason. Moving a piece twice because at any moment he can now eliminate White's bishop here um, and get rid of a, a good long-range piece. I like b6, c3. I mean, Robert, this isn't necessarily traditional theory, but now that we look at it a little closer, I mean, <laughs> I, I guess it kind of makes sense. C6 is surprising because d5 usually would be more natural. Yep. But, but you know what he's doing? He's just he's just trying to be flexible, yeah. right? He's just saying, I'm not going to fix it. And, and let's provide some instruction for the viewers, right? Because D5, even as much as that may seem more natural, that actually has a drawback in the position, which is very standard for a London system, that you don't really want to let white access to that square. To, to show you, everybody, if you play D5 and let's say you just castle, white's going to pop a knight into E5 and immediately be in positions where suddenly the H file's open, you have diagonals, and this control over the center point kind of allowed the whole attack to leapfrog, right? Without the access to E5, that wouldn't happen. So sometimes you have to be careful before you just push pawns, right? Because you can't go back, right? Absolutely. And, and it also allows white to open up the position, right? So what uh, Georg did in the game with c6 keeps everything closed. Right. 
And so it's like, I'm not going to commit to anything. If you push control your pawns, the square, right. if you go e4, there's no pawn on d5 to attack. So you're not right. breaking open the position for your pieces. Right. Great point. So so now he plays g But I agree. After g6, it really looked awkward. <laughs> like, I mean, he was, you know, two moves away from playing checkers here. <laughs> I mean. Wait, but checkers are all the pawns in the same color. Well, Jesus. you get it, right? <laughs> I mean, no one's no one's counting the details on a show like this. I love you. Just threw a reference you know, out. Uh, yeah. One guy who's usually counting the details is Dan Smith, but this isn't poker. This is chess. So he's uh, uh, he's, he's currently counting shots at the bar. He's but also wel welcome, Dan. They walked right in front. Of this is a bodyguard. Whoever that was didn't realize Dan Smith was on camera, and he ruined our show. Security. Yeah. <laughs> that that might have been Dan's security. But that could have been right. He's like, hey, you got to pay to get that face <laughs> on camera. Yeah, um, but uh, well, what? Speaking of paying, I think White might pay down the H file. Yeah, with this, this is this is just a really interesting game, right? Yeah. Georg creatively brings the king to a safe position. And even though the king seems a little vulnerable there, everybody, there is no dark square bishop for white. And again, that whole plan started as early as black playing the move knight h5, right? That bishop, that bishop's fate was sealed. So it's just interesting to note that sometimes you can break principles, right, Robert? Not castle, take some time with your king, because the, the bigger picture features of this position are that white can't really get at the dark squares without yep. the bishop, and, and black is totally safe. I just can't believe that it's Meyer playing the black side of this. Yeah, I... I like you know, it. You better believe it. I like it. You know, I think he's trying to put on a show. His his biggest fan in the world is here, John Urschel. <laughs> he knows it. Last night, uh, John, who often looks big and intimidating, was like a giddy little schoolgirl when he met Georg Meyer in the hotel. <laughs> there you are. There's my guy. There's Georg. <laughs> John, John going nuts over there. You know, I, I think I um, I let John publicly talk about Georg, but the more I see his games, and mm -hmm. I mean, I've already been a fan of Georg for a long time. I. I might be a bigger Georg Meyer fan really? than John. Yeah, well, yeah. The, uh, we're, we're going to have some competition there fighting for Georg's attention later tonight. <laughs> um, all right, well, uh, what we've got now is Dimitri Kolars and Benjamin uh, Bach. Now, we didn't have as much time uh, to talk about the specific pairings of this round. Um, of course, we'll do that as the match goes on. But uh, if we were going to break down key matchups of, of this uh, of this first round set of games, this would have been one I would have highlighted. Absolutely. Benjamin Bach really brought it yesterday, Robert. Yep. But Dimitri Kolars has been bringing it all season for the Snowballs. Maybe the best board three in the league. Uh, I, I think this could be one of those early games that, okay, two hours from now, we're going to be talking about a winner, three hours. Yep. This could be a very early game to watch, everybody. And you just know that Alejandro Ramirez is down there somewhere shaking his head because he coaches the St. Louis University team. Yep. Benjamin Bach is a student at uh, St. Louis University. And look at the time situation. Clearly, Kolar's in his prep. Yep. He spent 30 seconds for the entire game thus right. far. And Benjamin's thinking. Time yep. is ticking, and he doesn't know what to do. And that e5 pawn is clearly a is. problem. And you don't, you don't want to play moves like f6 in these positions. This is not, this is not a move you'd like to a5 play. a5 might be winning a, a, a5 might be winning material. a5 and a6 are yep. coming. There's ideas of queen to b3. So, um, and this is an Italian slash Gioco piano that clearly went wrong. So let's let's see what happened. We have Kolar's in his prep, who, by the way, I know he didn't have the best performance yesterday, but you and I haven't had time to reflect that he's. It seems like he's one of the better prepared players this weekend. Yeah. For some reason, he's playing quickly and getting positions he feels comfortable in, with the exception being the game he lost uh, in, in the final round yes. to the to the pandas. Yeah. No. He but he also plays a bunch of offbeat things, which puts him in comfort zones and right. makes the opponent think. And here right. is his standard uh, opening play. Right. But we'll see uh, so, the early D5 lines. Okay. Can never be me. Never never be you. Yeah. D3, D5, rookie one. Now, the, uh, the reason Robert's saying that, everybody, is because there's the other way to play this type of uh, typical Gioco Piano, black and play, flexible moves. You can voluntarily retreat the bishop to B6. You can even sometimes bring the bishop back to E7 and kind of wait on this key change in the pawn structure. Because the moment you do that, while opening the D file brings pieces to the D3 pawn, you immediately give white a focus. That focal point is the E5 pawn, yep. because now we have rook E1, the bishop on B5 indirectly attacking the E5 pawn by removing the defender. So this is, um, this is interesting and... Okay, now we have a move by Bach. He plays the move e4. Perhaps he thinks that he's um, going to have plenty of time to simplify this, and, and we don't. He doesn't need to be as worried as we thought. The uh, the main idea here, everybody, is clearly just a, a trade, uh, where where Black ends up not losing that e5 pawn. But the move I'm looking at right now on e4 is to take here first. Well, he he actually took on e4, traded the queens off already. Oh, he's already moved. Yeah, he moved. And then now the question is, you want to play a move like knight g5. If you got everything you wanted, this would work perfectly. But the problem with knight g5 is then rook to d8. Yeah. Back, and, oop, back rank. 
Rook, yeah, Rook D8, there's a back rank problem. The Rook can move from... Uh, Remember, I, I have the Bishop coming to F1, but it doesn't matter. You're taking here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or maybe I... I, I mean, it, it's a little actually, weird. Actually, yeah. I mean, that's... I started calculating it and thinking that... Uh, I, I was I, trusting I, the Grandmaster. Sometimes I trust you even when I should I thought it was checkmate in one. I didn't see the Bishop oh, okay. back there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, pro tip, kids. Never believe a Grandmaster just because of that G title. I totally agree with that. No, I'm, I'm kidding. No, um, But it is a... Um, it is obviously a weakness you have to be aware of, and so maybe he does have this knight g5 idea. Kolar's now on camera thinking about his options here. Of course, um, you can also play a5, right? Just oh, even b4. Oh, he, say, he can play something on the queen's a5, go for a6 anyway. Where are those knights going? Yeah. So, like, bishop, if you have bishop d6 here, then you close the d file. So you don't even have rook d8 yeah. as an option. But I can go a5, try to go for a6. This is, this is a nice idea, and I, I almost like it combined with your little intermezzo, right? Bring that pony to g5, get the bishop off of that defensive diagonal, and then subtly you've got like a weird puzzle rush tactic here, and, and black might be losing material. Yeah, so black might be forced to take on b1 instead of retreating the bishop to uh, g6 to save a tempo, but the problem with taking on b1 is now I have the two bishops and a lot of open space to work with. Man, you say it, you just, sometimes you make chess look so easy. It's <laughs> magical, the way you describe things. Well... Uh, we'll see if Donchenko can come up with some more magic for the snowballs. If you didn't catch every detail of the Shangdu Pandas versus the bottom bottom snowballs yesterday, this guy here, uh, he was just, he was a monster. He was. Really the MVP of that match in, in many ways. Um, and, uh, and we had Georg Meyer up here who said, you know, can we get this guy a prize for, yeah, for best game of the event? Best game of the event. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he beat Li Chao, uh, the top player and manager for the Shangdu Pandas. Uh, with the black pieces, no less, and a brilliant exchange sacrifice. This doesn't look like it's going to be the same kind of game with, with fireworks in terms of exchange sacrifices, but the more I look, the more I do like Donchenko's position because that h4 pawn is a pawn that, again, chess.com just will not add this feature. I've been asking for it forever. <laughs> I just, it, you know. It's funny that knight takes h4 is actually a threat because it doesn't really look like it. Like, wait, knight yep. should just take with the queen. Right. But then the bishop's hanging, right? So you're removing a defender of the bishop on g5, yep. which allows knight takes h4 to be a threat. Yeah. No, I, I mean, so it, can you get away with g3? Is this what Theodoro's thinking about? You, you can. It's just not a move you want to play if you don't have to. And the, the problem for black is you don't want to take on g5 either, right? Because yep. if you ever play bishop takes g5 after pawn takes, you're not going to be very happy. Yeah, either. there's dark square problems here. But okay, if, if g3's played... Maybe there's another another option for Black to try to expose the Queen's sort of overwhelm, right? She has to guard G3. She's also worried about other things in the center and G5. So you just start wondering if there's something here. Yeah, I guess like the, the biggest advantage is White really overprotects the E5 square here. Yeah, it looks like he made a move. Um, it's just it's a little like Yeah, indeed he does it, yeah. He went G3. Yeah. So the more we look at it, the more I guess that, that makes sense to me because there just doesn't seem to be a way for Donchenko to, to punish it, at least not immediately. Right. Um, and eventually, White might even think about playing g4. Right? Like, if I get the h4 pawn protected, yep. I can start a kingside attack. Thanks to this pawn being on h5, I can start ripping open the king. Alexander Donchenko right there, um, who uh, is very calm and poised uh, up top, but I've been told is a bit of a nervous wreck down low, kicking his feet a lot yesterday. He actually shut off his own computer. Really? We had, we had a technical glitch that you and I didn't even know about. That's how awesome our team is. He shut off the computer? Yesterday, he was kicking his feet so much that he, like, turned off his monitor. <laughs> and it was, like, a weird a weird thing that happened. And everything everything worked out and got yeah. fixed. But it was uh, – so, anyway, he's uh, he's calm and stoic. But, you know, I like to say business up top, party down low. Yeah, the Skype interview. Skype interview. <laughs> Throw that shirt on. <laughs> exactly. You know, Sweatpants and, and then – Close uh, the bathroom door. <laughs> <laughs> So right. uh, here, he, I, I don't like his position very much. Rook h8 is to prevent a move like g4. So yep. You're like, why would you put a rook on h8 staring into your own pawn when you're not breaking through there? No, no, no. He needs to be defensive, and that way g4 is not going to become an option yep. for white. Yeah, I agree. That's uh, not a aggressive attempt of uh, bluffing at opening the h-file, really. I mean, maybe down the road, but, uh, but right away he's just trying to be a little bit prophylactic in nature. Now, uh, back to the game between Ina and Fabiano where it all started. It feels like Ina's holding her own, but something you you foreshadowed as would be a key factor for her at the time, yep. right? But, you know, when you're playing a 2800, you obviously have to pick your poison a little bit, right? Uh, do you want to get a worse position or do you want right. to have time in the clock? If, if you take the time and avoid a worse position, it's a rapid game. And if you play too fast, then uh, 
probably 2800s beat you most of the time. So it's, it's really been interesting to see how well Fabiano has played this event. We talked about he played, he went 4 0 yesterday, mm -hmm. right? And um, just every time we had Fabiano on camera, he just seemed right at home. He was calm. He said he liked whatever house music he found. Right, and, and with this format being so new and different, it's, it's been an interesting experiment in some ways. And now that we see the best chess players in the world, just because there's music on, just because there's a loud guy at the bar taking shots, yep. just because there's a crazy person up north with a t-shirt gun, doesn't <laughs> mean that it's not chess. Exactly. And the 2,800 players are still the best chess players on the planet, even, even in this venue. And, um, and Fabiano has, I think, been playing the best chess of anybody here this weekend, at least to this point. Yeah, absolutely. And look at that Bishop 1C2. That's not a good piece, right? Yeah, that piece is. I, I, I really like uh, Fabi's position here, and yeah, you can just it's somewhat like a queen e seven. Think about playing knight d four because people don't like opposite color bishops. Yeah, but that bishop on c two is a glorified pawn. Yeah, it's just protecting b three. It's not it's staring into brick walls everywhere. Yep. So if you do play knight d four and trade off that dark square bishop for white, the h four pawn feels weaker. That bishop on h six is much stronger. Yep. And uh, yeah, this d file, he's going at some point he's going knight d four and just closing it all down. I, I'm wondering if he'll keep the flexibility for yeah. He goes for this. I, I like that move by Fabi. He's keeping knight b four open, knight d four open. He's got the b file here and Ooh, bishop f four now. Yeah. yeah. One of the one of the main pro tips we can learn from Fabiano here, everyone, is that he doesn't make a a huge forcing decision when your opponent is getting themselves under time pressure. Look at that clock ticking down, right? You've got you've got a position where it doesn't mean you sh you play shuffle puck, right? We're not going mighty ducks here, but moving moving the pieces around a little bit when your opponent is sort of self-inflicting wounds. Yeah. Right. And you would love to push that pawn to g4 to g3 and attack yeah. the bishop, but that's an outpost. And if you ever trade Again, bishops, I keep requesting this. We've got the CTO the co-founder of Chess.com downstairs and the CEO here. If we could ever get a request for pawns to move backwards, you think the Pro Chess League Finals would be it? Yeah, seriously. You know, can't can't trust them for anything. You know, it's like, come on, guys. Um, H5, G5. I, I wonder if Fabi will find F6 here, or if he even wants it. But it's definitely something on the possible agenda. Yeah, you can all play rook g6 and then play f6. I mean, there's so but many options. My main options. point of this is that if you play g6, I just yeah. back up the lady and, and, and then the pawn falls with Tempe. So so maybe Fabi will play rook g6 first. But yeah, at this point, these pawns are going to be wishing that uh, J, our, our CTO, had developed that feature long ago, unfortunately. Um, all right, well, Fabiano preparing f6. Other games moving along. We haven't talked about the... The flippage of the scrippage on the other side, board one for the snowballs, board four for the bishops in a while. Um, position is opened up. I think we kind of like Jorg's uh, chances here with the bishop pair and, and maybe even some dark square action in the future. Yep. And I like the clock situation. Wait, isn't knight takes f2 a tactic already? Uh, is it? Yeah, oh, the hanging. d3's hanging. Oh, but yeah. it's rook c7 at the end. So, yeah. Ah, very nice. Chop, chop. Oh, but th this works. Yeah, I can, the problem is rook c7, I can take on f3. Yeah. But after g takes f3, I've just helped uh, white's pawn right. and a6 hanging in addition to the bishop hanging. So, okay. not so, advisable. But good tactics there. Tactics and maneuvers. Tactics and maneuvers, right? That was your middle name in high school? It still is my middle name. It is? Yeah. You should change your middle name to something like that. <laughs> <laughs> tactics Robert and Tactics and Maneuvers. <laughs> oh, oh there it happened. Yeah, he, he went for it. We I got, actually don't know if I like that decision. We have our first result in the books. Not a surprise where we left it. Unfortunately, Ina Agris was down on time, and we see the world number two doing, doing his thing, getting the first win on the board, and the bishops have, have, uh, have struck first here. Yep. And, well... In a loss on time, but the position was also, you know, we said Pretty tough. Bad. Yeah. Ooh. Here we, we have, go. We have liftoff here. You know, so in, in these early stages of the Pro Chess League, everyone, you kind of expect the board one to get it done versus the board four on both teams. Of course, it doesn't always happen, but you expect it. So, so the, the coin flip matches are these two, three matchups. Donchenko, the two seed for the Snowballs, Theodore, the three seed for the Bishops. And then, of course, the other game we talked about between Kolars and, and Bach, uh, respectively. So we kind of expect these games to tell who's going to get the early start. And what I like about that, Robert, is even though these are, these are young in the match, it's round one, they're already critical games, Absolutely. right? Because this is the only chance these guys will have to play each other. Bach's only chance to hold down board two versus board three and Donchenko's only chance to hold down board two for the snowballs. Yeah, and this 
uh, game in particular is very difficult for the snowballs because look at this F file. Yep. The king is on F2, yep. and I know the king can't move like a queen, unfortunately, but the king will step out of the way and try to help uh, unleash a huge attack. But look at the C file, right? That rook on C, it's perfectly placed. The pawn C3 is already hanging, and black is clearly going for counterplay on that side of the board, yep. which leads me to wonder, can I even just take on C3 at some point, sacrifice my knight, and go for the activity? Like pawn wow. takes C3. I kind of, I kind of like that. I wonder if with time pressure you setting in, like that's that. what he's thinking. You, you know, I would like that. I love sacrificing pieces. Takes here, takes on F5, and okay, you're down immediately on the board in terms of a knight versus the two pawns. But take a look at the position, everybody, right? And then tell me you don't want to play white, right? Tell me you want to play white under under a minute on the clock. I don't think you do. Nope. So um, that's an interesting. I, I, I'm going to be surprised work. if he does it. Yeah, it but shouldn't work. But pr as a practical try, it might be a decent one. But I think just knight d6 yep. here as well. What's where's what's there to fear? I don't see it. Well, queen f6 check is in the air. If knight d6, the king moves to to this square. There's but then, uh, then knight c4 check. Yeah, uh, knight, you're gonna eliminate the knights. You would yeah, do that. Yeah, dirty Robert. Um, okay, yeah. I mean, I guess Donchenko's position is he has some options. Doesn't doesn't have to go for the peace sack. You start to look at the clock and and wonder what he's thinking about, but. Let's quickly check on the other 2-3 matchup. Uh, well, actually, I just figured out what he is thinking about. Oh, yeah? You want to go back? Yeah. Let's show it. Honestly, knight d6, there might be some queen f6 check. Like, that that might be part of uh, uh, the plan. I, and, like, I, rook a6. And it's like, oh, if you move your knight, I move my king with check, and I win f7. Some kind of, something like this ooh, is... very nice. Discover check, f7 falls, and, and probably the game with it. Um... Okay, interesting. King, King G2, G2 played first. very quickly by Theodoro. Oh, this is getting complicated here. Yeah. He's on camera there. We see the fans behind him. Somebody's either keeping score or or drawing coloring there. I mean, <laughs> there we go. If that's a sign. <laughs> it's homework. <laughs> it's homework. That makes sense, actually. You know, yeah. you got to bring your kids to a, to a game, right? Like a baseball game, a sporting event, none bigger than, uh, than the Pro Chess League. Then they got to get their homework done. Absolutely. But I'm, I'm still very uncertain here about this uh, kind of pawn c3 stuff. Like, if you take on c3, what's happening here? Is queen of six check. Well, I don't know if I want to go queen of six anymore. I'm like, yeah, because the king can just hide. Yeah. But that that actually still works. So one idea is to play rook d6 first, yeah. rook a6 with the idea of taking, and then you know mating, taking yep. and mating. Um, For, I mean, rook a6. So we have to can you go C2 or something like that? Take on D6. C1. You're all in. But I'm, I'm attacking the square twice. I don't know if that matters. Um, it kind of does, because I can take. And if you take here, I play Rook D7 in Oh. Yeah. Right? So I think that might do the trick. That's nasty. That is nasty. Look at me bringing the tactics. I mean, it's just, I'm trying to go for some Rook A6 was played. Yeah, Rook A6 actually looks really, really sharp, and Theodoro goes for it. We'll see if Donchenko either missed this move or had something up his sleeve. But this could be this could be our first kind of big moment of the match here, because if uh, Donchenko makes the wrong decision here, this could, be the, this could be an upset. Board three taking down board two for the snowballs. Yeah, I'm trying to... To see how you stop rook takes d6, but it doesn't look like you can. Starting stop at to all. regret that I didn't sack my knight when you told me to, right? Did. You see Donchenko clearly uh -oh. nervous. Yeah, he he definitely missed this move. Yep. Unfortunately, you can you can see it in his body language. A very kind of fun guy to follow all weekend. He just really lets his emotions show. So um, you can use like a pawn takes c3 here and just take the pawn back, but pr probably there's something more forcing. Yeah. You got to be looking at everything you can here. There's also knight c... Ooh, he plays rook a7. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Does that work? Yeah, queen f6 check. What in the world? The d8 rook is hanging. That was awesome. There's no way Donchenko saw this. Nope. Which means also rook a7. It's a huge moment, everybody. Now less than 20 seconds. We're about to have our first upset of the day. The bishop's sending a message here that Donchenko is not going to have as easy of a time as he did yesterday versus the Pandas. So now the question is, you queen of, I think you go queen of six check. You can just take the knight, too. You can, but I don't want it. Queen of six. I want it to take it because no, I have leave f7. It. Leave it. Why? Because then you take on b2. But queen of six, king g8, okay. and knight takes g6. Okay, and it's not too slow. If I take here, I'm mated. No, queen f8. I'm threatening queen h8, mate. No, you take uh, on g6, queen f8 check, and rook h1's mate. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think you're right. Queen f6 and knight takes g6 will do the trick. 
I think my queen takes d6 well, was queen good d6, too. I'm still you know, worried about some kind of pawn takes b2. Tomato, tomato. What? I'm worried about like, the pawn taking on b2 and then promoting. Which is why you like queen f6 better. Yeah. Okay. I, I, it just okay. feels a little safer. No, this is huge. I mean, uh, the the storyline coming in was who was going to help Fabiano is. Caruana, who already won versus Ina Agres, and it looks like Nicholas Theodoro says, sign me up for that J-O-B. <laughs> I'll help out. I'm going to get a big upset versus Donchenko in round one. We were talking about Donchenko having the uh, game of the event yesterday. This is uh, this, up there. This could be the game of the event for uh, at least for the first round of play. We Again, if you're just joining us, Fabiano Caruana already two. winning his first game. It's mate. Rook H1 mate. On Puzzle the rush. board, Queen F8, Rook H1 mate, Donchenko just resigns. Wow. He knows that it's over. That was a huge Sits up. victory for Nicholas Theodora there. Absolutely. Now, the other board two, board three matchup. <laughs> Lucky for, uh, I think, was that was that Coach Mike? Yeah, it was Coach Mike. Coach Big Mike? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. You can follow him, Big Come STL, on Twitter. Yes, you can. There you go. Um, we've got uh, Rook to C1. Yep. And with the rook c1, you're protecting the pawn on c3. Yep. And note the pawn on c7 will be hanging for a while. You can play a move like rook to d7, but anytime you put this rook on d7, I'm already worried about like b5 ideas yep. breaking over. Oh, he goes side. for it. Or, yeah, he did. Yeah. Now b5 is potentially possible. We've got a lot, a lot of love, I think, for St. Louis in the Twitch chat. I, I've seen more Baden Baden. Uh, chat in the chess tv room if i'm totally honest diamond member anthony 5127 predicted a 10 to 6 win for baden baden that would be six? dominant and i see hikaru's in the chat classic hikaru showing up shout out to hikaru from the ivory coast and uh thank you to all of you that are with us whether you're watching on chess.com tv or twitch tv slash chess thanks I, for being here i actually like to move knight h4 now as well because i'm a i love bishops and not just because I'm rooting for St. Louis Archbishop, which I'm not, but Knight <laughs> H4 threatens the bishop on G6. Yep. If you go bishop F7 or something, I go bishop G4. Yep. And then how are you going to protect your C7 pawn? I can't go to E7 without things like Knight to F5 coming exactly. in. Yeah, this uh, this move Knight H4 looks good. I mean, I, I liked your initial idea as well, B5. I guess one one thing to consider is whether exactly. I can take A5. I was like, I don't want to trade too many pawns yeah, it's over just, there. It's not, not fast enough there for white. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I... Knight H4, you can start to feel it. We've had two results now in the book. We have a 2-0 lead for the St. Louis Archbishops, and can you feel it? You can, all of a sudden, the level of noise downstairs just went up. Yeah. Right? The, 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 I was wondering. It like, went up a decimeter down like, there. Am I getting quieter or is everyone else getting louder? Yeah. I think it's everyone else getting louder. The, uh, the bar is open. The party has begun. The Pro Chess League championship match is underway, and uh, right, now, right now the bishops being led by Fabio and Caruana are in control. Yeah, I didn't like this king e1 move. I think bishop f7 was a good response. And now knight d2. So just going for the two bishops end game, yep. which is, will still be good. But what I don't like is that eventually the black bishop might land itself a d5 and be a nice resource. Let's defense. head back to the game between Meyer and Proleko. I, I think that Meyer is moments away from, from getting this one, which obviously the snowballs are desperate to get on the board. Yep. Um, shout out to our last couple subscribers, and thank you to everyone for your support. Big event. We won't always have time to shout out, but we appreciate all the love, all the cheers, all the bits, all the subs. You're awesome. Um, this is just, obviously, this is a tough matchup for the St. Louis Board 4, but getting down on time, that's something that happens when you're playing much stronger players. We saw it happen to Ina Agres, who actually lost on the clock to Fabiano. Yeah, and this situation here, we liked Georg's position earlier on. He's now up a pawn, so you can't argue with that. And... I'm just wondering when he's gonna go play h4 and break the pawn chain. He's kind of he's kind of just sitting pretty on the position right now. Clearly not in a rush. Classic Jorg. Classic Jorg. That just, is classic. That Jorg. is classic Jorg. Literally just sitting tight. <laughs> but there are some difficulties, right? Give Proleko credit. You can't move the bishop to the other diagonal without a5 falling. If you play a4, I think the problem is that maybe this pawn becomes a target, yep. and then you're worried about letting a4. So just kind of. Analyzing what we see in front of us, uh, Jorg is, is pulling a classic Jorg, but it's also not that easy. Right, and why are they repeating? Wow, I'm. Oh, because Rook was the other Rook coming to C8? No. Kind of. Uh, okay. I'm kind of surprised. So now Jorg ultimately puts the bishop on B6. At some point here, you, if you you repeat one more time, you, you're giving up a huge upset here to the board four for the Archbishop. But I think you have Rook B3 here, just like hang in there, play Rook B3, put pressure on B2, because what yep. the plan for White is to go Rook C to C8. I try to mate you. So yeah. like Rook B3, actually, you might just give up the pawn on B2 and go for the mate. Yeah. Is this is this trickier than we thought? Something tells me it would be shocking if Georg doesn't get the win. But notice, everybody, if you play 
F pawn to try to get freedom. We have E6. If you play the G pawn to try to get freedom, now you real got problems, right? You real got problems. You real got problems. That's right. I mean, this is uh, this is not that easy for Yori. Are we about to see a very, very strong start for the bishops? They fell behind two and a half, one and a half. For those of you who didn't watch their match yesterday versus the Armenian Eagles, but they might be on pace to to have that exact score themselves headed into the next round. So bishop d4, that's a good move. And look at Proleko getting counterplay. Getting counterplay. Just going straight for the f7. Ignored the a5 pawn, which yep. was hanging. He says, I'm going to go e6, or I'm going to go rook f6. And, and he's pointing out that if you take b2, you give up the a7 square. Right now, the bishop is preventing doubling rooks on the seventh rank, but but you also want the pawn. So I think Yorick has to find the right move here. Oh, he oh, goes for it. And he took Whoa. that one. And Proleko takes a5. I don't know that that was right. I think. Why do you go e6? Yeah, I think e6 and rook a7 Still e6. Better. What is going on uh, here? This could be a huge upset oh in the no. making. Look at that. E6 is there. But King Beef, it's e a race. It's a race. King, it's a race. The king, B pawn is strong, and the bishop should be better than the knight here. But The knight's trapped, actually. But the king f2. Just bring the king in. King f2. Now you're threatening knight e3 as well king as king e2. e2. Mm -hmm. I can't even draw the arrow. There we go. All Great. Right. Here so comes knight d2. The knight pawn's falling. The g3 pawn, though. Watch out for that one. Okay, if g3 falls for b3, the question is, can white hold oh. on to e6? Whoa. Whoa, look at that move. You take rook e3 check. What a move. If you take, you lose the rook on the spot, everybody. That's a huge move, and it may be enough to get the youngster under time pressure. Proleko, very focused there. Rook b4. Okay, that's actually a good move. Just trying to distract that, that bishop away. But do I have some... No, I don't have rook c2 because king d3 is... You can play bishop f6, but then knight e4. No, bishop f6, knight e4. Knight e4. No. Oh, or taking on B2. B2 is hanging because there's no rookie 3 check anymore. York has no time. He's repeating the moves. Okay, he found a better. Oh, now rook bishop, bishop c3. c3. Okay, he has rook, rook to d3. But Proleko has held in there. But now York can no, take and take on g3. g3. The rook ending's winning for black. Yep, because you're going to take on oh, e6 no. and the kings go to f5. Proleko had this. Proleko had it. He held his own with the 2700 from oh. Germany, but it's not going to be enough. Now two B1 pawns queen. are better than B1 one. B1 equals queen, and then rook, B, rook G1 check. That's a backdoor trick you can take home to mom and dad. Make sure oh. you put that one in your pocket. Very useful to know. Yeah. That little skewer right there. Man. Wow. Georg. Georg. Of the jungle. Georg, Georg, Georg of the snowballs. <laughs> Strong as he can be so far. Um, oh, look at this ending, by the way. That pawn on B7, not your friend. With a two to one lead right now, all Bach needs to do is hold a draw. Now, if you remember yesterday, Robert, he also started on a position we didn't like. Yeah. We thought he was going to lose, and then he came back and held a draw. Right at the time, it, it still felt like the momentum was in the Eagles' in Eagles' court, so to speak. But, uh, but ultimately, that draw really helped Bach, I think, find his bearings. And he played one of the best games in the entire event as well when he beat Zavin Andreas. He did. That was a marvelous. Game. Absolutely. So again, it was a similar storyline. It was a board two mm -hmm. getting a victory. The board won. Yeah. Benjamin Bach beating Zavin Andreasin. Uh, uh, Alexander Donchenko did that for the snowballs over Li Chao, and so. Um, these two teams have just had very similar paths, right? Very parallel in their in their roads to get here to the championship. And I'm trying to figure out what white is aiming for. Is the black is figuring out, do I want to play c5? Because if I play c5, then I trade a pair of pawns on the queen side, and that looks favorable because otherwise the white king's going to go to d4, mm -hmm. and then white can try to go c4, c5 himself and gain some more space. But that still looks... Like, even that doesn't seem like something that has a ton of winning chances for white. The problem is the, the b7 pawn, right? You need yep. to somehow keep that protected. If I force your king to c7, I bring my king to e5 and go to the king side. Right. No, it's a great point. And these are things we highlight in all these. Oh, and, and indeed, Bach agrees with you. He needs yeah. to try to trade off some of these weaknesses. Whenever you have pawns stuck on the same color square of your opponent's bishop, it's just long-term problems. you got to avoid them. And... And as Robert said, if you ever get yeah. in a position where somehow the bishop can hold the king, then this king may run to this side of the board. Unfortunately, I, I don't for, think it's going to happen. No, I think it's going to probably be a draw. This is level now. The bishop on d5 is an excellent piece. There's no problem. It protects b7. Not that you can even attack it. And yeah, is he trying to he's trying to go king b5? So that's why. Bach leans back there, and I think probably taking a, sort of a, a sigh of relief there, recognizing, all right, I don't think. I'm worse anymore. You could see in his body language, Kolar is a little frustrated, shaking his head. Yeah, um, you, I mean, a position like that was just so one-sided. Yeah. Like he it, had great winning chances, could yeah. never lose. He's not going to lose, but you have to win those kind of right. games, especially in a team event. 
Right. Well, it is young. The match is early, but we do have four games in the books. It is a two and a half to one and a half lead for the St. Louis Archbishops. The crowd is filling up here at the championship. It is the final match of the day, and shout out to all the fans that are with us downstairs. I'll get the t-shirt gun out soon. Don't you worry. <laughs> we'll get it out. We'll get out. But Robert, all right. So four games in the books. Yeah. Um, the top boards did what they were supposed to do, but in totally different fashion. Fabiano Caruana is still rolling. We've had five dominant wins by him. Georg kind of got got away with one there. Yeah, that end game looked like it was actually almost problematic for him. And yeah, he liked his position early. He was doing well, and then he but he went all in for the team. Right, right. He didn't take the caution he would as if he was playing an individual game. But he said, "I need to win this game." And yeah. unfortunately for Dimitri Kolos, he's had an amazing season. But that was a huge missed opportunity. So, but before we go to break, let me ask you then, because sometimes in the we talk about sometimes in tournaments where when you when you get tough games early on, that actually helps you be in more shape later on. Like we've talked about how we both had good tournaments where we, we almost lost our first game yeah. and that sort of wakes you up a little bit. Do you think that maybe some of the momentum here might help Georg later on in when the big matches happen? I definitely think so, but the competition is also about to get a lot stiffer for right. him. He goes from playing uh, the board four to someone three hundred points higher rated right. than that player. So he doesn't really have that much time to wake up, and when he does, he's going to be sitting across from a player that's you know, about as good as he is. Well, we still got a lot of time left here, though, and three more rounds are ahead of us. We will be back in just a few moments to preview the second round of pairings, talk about what just happened in, in round one a little bit more as the Pro Chess League Championship continues. Don't go anywhere. Fisher Random Chess, a game where creativity is king and memorization impossible. 960 different back rank configurations turn the world's best chess players into mere competitors trying to outwit and outclass each other with every unprepared move. Only one will be worthy of the title of Fisher Random Chess Champion, but the best part is that champion could be you. The Fisher Random Chess Championship will be unlike any tournament ever held. With a global qualification system, for the first time ever, everybody truly has a chance to prove themselves the best player in the world at a chess variant. Are you a chess artist worthy of the 11th World Champion's admiration? We're going to find out. The tournament features open qualifiers beginning on April 28th and the title player qualifier stage beginning in June. Over $300,000, Fabiano Caruana, Hikaru Nakamura, and world champion Magnus Carlsen await you at the later stages. The Fisher Random Chess Championship title is there for the taking. Will you make a run at it? Go to frchess.com today to register, and stay tuned to chess.com for all the latest news and updates regarding this historic event. It's the FIDE World Fisher Random Chess Championship, organized by Dune AS and chess.com. I'm here with International Master Greg Shahadi and PCL Commissioner. Oh my God. It's very exciting to be next to you right now, I'm not going to lie. Awesome. Going into the last round, if you were coaching Baden Baden Snowballs and one of your team members needed to take down Fabiano Caruana, what advice would you give them? <laughs> That's a difficult question. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> Do you want to tie him in the back of here? Maybe we'll just tie him up in the back. He won't be able to go on stage. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You know, he's such a strong player. Just play your best. Don't get rattled by his rating. Um, it helps if you have white. I think Donchenko is going to have the white pieces, and Georg and Collars will both have the black pieces. So that'll be tougher. But it is important, I think, that somebody they can't let him go 4-0. If he goes 4-0, they're in trouble. So. Do you think the psychology is a lot harder when you know you're going up against world number two? How do you start to try and humble that down and play a fair game? I mean, I don't have experience playing somebody that level, but it is, like, I feel like it's easy to play worse against strong opposition. Like, you always feel like they see something that you don't. But somebody like Jörg Meyer, you know, he's played the top players in the world. He just got done playing Magnus Carlsen. So he has experience against a player like that. He's good at rapid. Um, these guys definitely have a chance. I know Fabiano's 5-0 and so far, but it's not like he's just going to wipe out everybody. This is your second year seeing the Pro Chess League being done live. 
going into next year, do you have any suggestions for how we can make this even better? Although it's very exciting as it is. Probably just start with the tie break. <laughs> That's it. Nothing else? No. <laughs> All right, well, next year you're going to come here. We know who the champions are. We're starting with the tie breaks. I'm joking, though. Yeah. And what do you think the future of rapid chess is? So we see this is super exciting. A lot more people make, ex make mistakes. Do you think that faster time controls lead to more exciting viewer events? Um, you're asking the right person. Like, I definitely think the time control needs to be sped up, like, massively. Um, this is, like... A perfect pace. You know, you get to sit down, you watch a game from beginning to end. People can actually make mistakes. You know, it's like a nice feeling knowing that a really good player can actually mess up. Like in slow games, you it's just not it's just not as exciting to watch. I think everyone kind of agrees with that. Um, it is more accurate chess, but I mean, you know, this is fun. One of the really cool things that we did during the Pro Chess League is get the eye trackers on. We've been able to see what players are thinking. Do you think we should add more things like this, maybe heart rate monitors? Do you have any suggestions? Well, one thing I, I find funny about the, the eye tracker is like, they'll be looking at like, there'll be all this action in the center of the board and then suddenly their eye will go like to the corner for a little bit and there's like nothing happening there and I don't know what's, what's going on. Um, heart rate monitors are cool. What else? Like brain waves, something you can actually read their minds and know exactly what they're thinking. Like implant like some kind of some kind of brain reader. We got that coming soon, I guess. I feel like a lie detector test would be really great. So I'd ask you a question like, who do you think is gonna win? You'd say you're unbiased, and then we'd see it go off. No, that's the one question you. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're suggesting? Sorry, I, I was joking. Okay. Um, Anyway, last question before we go back to Robert and Danny back in the booth. Is there anything you'd like the live audience watching who maybe doesn't understand the environment and what it's like being here in person to know so that maybe they can come out next year? Um, it's super fun. There's people like you can have a full blown conversation. You can have drinks. You can have food um, during the games. You know, like you're just it's just not normal. Usually you just have to sit there completely silent. And here, actually, people can be even louder than they are, and they, they're just not quite used to it. But, you know, you, you can hear the applauding. You can hear the screaming when games end, and I think that's really cool. You're right. It's so loud I could barely hear you answer that question. So I love the environment here. Back to Robert and Danny in the booth. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you. Asking Greg chess questions about how to improve the league. You know, you could, you could see my heart rate going up. Yeah, like, Greg I, has enough ideas. You know, no. You, sunk your nails into my yeah, arm. No, 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 you're kidding. No, Greg obviously put in, uh, puts in a ton of work, and this is, uh, he, he loves it. He spends so much time, and I'm not surprised that he answered Alexander's question of what could you do to make it more exciting with a very specific chess thing that he's already thinking about, because yeah. Greg is a super chess fan at heart, uh, loves watching the games, loves having uh, the teams play great chess, and he sits down there on the edge of his seat like everybody else. You, you know, one thing that he brought to my attention, he's like, what if we did, uh, you know, me, you, Greg, and someone else, like a pro chess league team? He said that to me, I was like... Commentator team? That would make the team worse. It would be funny. It would make the fun. league worse. Yeah, especially <laughs> if we all streamed commentary and played horrible chess, right? Who wouldn't want to tune in to see that train wreck? Anyway, <laughs> we're going to keep tuning in to see what happens here between the Archbishops and the Snowballs, and let's review the results from round one before we preview round two. Obviously, Fabiano Caruana getting it done on the top board, and we say obviously not because Ina Agres didn't actually play a really good game. I think she may have been better in the middle game. At least it was very unclear, but but time was of the essence, and ultimately she fell on the clock. Board two, Robert. Uh, Bach held a bad position out of the opening, just like he did in game one for the Archbishops against the Eagles, right? So maybe that's a bit of an indicator of the success that's coming. Yeah. Theodoro uh, did get a big win. That that was probably the, uh, the the game of the round, really, right? It was a very nice attack conducted on the F file. Alexander Donchenko seemed just a little a little rattled. Uh, maybe he'll find himself. Clearly, he was he was key for the snowballs yesterday. So they hope that that uh, that ship writes itself very quickly. And Georg Meyer did what he was supposed to do. Now now let's preview the next set of games here for round two because Robert, when you look at this. Give me your key matchup of this round, the game that for you is maybe a coin flip or something to really keep your eye on as a fan. You know, honestly, it's that you look on the third row there, Nicholas Theodoro against Georg Meyer, because Nicholas Theodoro played an amazing game, one of the best of the entire weekend. I expect Fabian Akarwana to beat Dimitri Collars. Just, you know, he's the white piece, he's the stronger player. Benjamin Buck, I also expect to win. I mean, Ina's great, 
but Benjamin is a really high-level player and playing great chess right now. And then I expect Donchenko to win. So to me, it's all about that third matchup right. there. Nicholas Theodoro, Georg Meyer. And I think this, this could be the a huge round for the Archbishops. Yeah, I mean, if they have an opportunity to really get a little separation, they are up by one game right now, two and a half, one and a half. It might be on that board, you're right. Although, I'm going to pick a different game and surprise you. I think that Kolar's game right there, I mean, I know he's black, but look for Fabiano to have a tougher game, right? He's now 5-0 and oh on the weekend, and, and we'll see if Dimitri, like we said, you can't really stop Fabi. Can you contain him? Even a draw would be a successful sort of uh, nicking of the shield there. Right for the for the leader of the archbishop. So, as uh, as we get set, let's talk a little bit more about the teams and their performances, uh, as far as what their ratings were coming in. Because we sit here and, and preview every matchup individual board by board, but we also uh, just have the overall season to talk about. These teams have fought so hard to get here, and uh, of course, these are the top players that were on site this weekend. Fabiano being the only north of 2,800 player. Those are their feed eight ratings, but what are their actual performance ratings in the league? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna see that right now because I think that it gets a little more interesting the farther you go down the line. You see, uh, Georg Meyer performing at about a 2,700 level. I often just refer to him as 2,700. Yeah. Right. You do. Sh Sean Sargassian, uh, no no longer playing, but also having a very very good performance all year. Um, Lee Chow did help the Pandas ultimately get the bronze medal. Um, but uh, let's let's move forward here and talk a little bit more about the uh, the overall. I think we have the team stats we want to look at. Yeah, and I mean, w we see the different teams, players representing different teams here. Sean Sargassian also had an amazing season. Yep. One of the best performers in the entire league. Definitely performing way above his rating. But as we go into the second round of this match, Denny, I just said this, but I am really concerned about the snowballs particularly here. I know you have faith in Dimitri Kolars. You think that he can handle um, Fabiano Caruana with the black pieces. The game has just started and got underway here. Well, I didn't, I didn't say he could handle it. I said I think that Dimitri has had a great season. I think he has an opportunity to contain Fabiano, and I think he's a strong enough player to get a draw but if he's really bringing his A game. Can so. Fabiano really be contained? I mean, I don't know. I mean, you can try. Right? Yeah. And then he busts out also, that like crossover dribble. You can also dance if you want to. Right? I mean, Harden's pushing the rules of the NBA. Oh, you're, you're getting on this and right so now. So maybe Fabi's pushing the rules of the PCL. Uh, I don't know. Right? I don't know if I go that far. <laughs> he's not, you know, as long gather, as he's, he's not gather stepping his way to a championship. He's not right gather now. stepping. He's uh, inventing a different type of chess step, though. Um, yesterday, he was playing so quickly and so dominant, we thought it was home cooking, right? But it uh, turns out he was just uh, coming with stuff over the board. So. Um, here we have a, a quick a quick start here by both players. We are in a Spanish game, and you said Colars kind of has a, a it, he has one of these hybrid repertoires where he plays main lines, but then always a sideline within the main line, yes. right? And there are guys that like that, right? He's yesterday we saw a G6 Spanish, although he ultimately lost in that game to Wang Yue. Here we see um, an, an Archangel kind of Morphe defense weird weird Gioco Piano Spanish. I don't even know what to say, but this is not the most common maneuver of the bishop. Uh, along with having this bishop already outside the pawn chain. This is going to lead to a different type of middle game than a normal Lopez. And I love it because you know that Fabiano right now is thinking, and then we actually have the eye tracker up here, yep. that uh, this is Kolar's, Kolar's eye tracker. You know, We know that Fabiano is thinking, can I play G4? Yep. Right? Because, or am I walking into this guy's preparation and he's just going to blow me off the board? Because as good as Fabiano Caruana is, he's not as good as the best engines in the world. Right. And so if Kolars has studied this with an engine, you're like, oh no. Right. Let me be a little careful here, right? Yep. We see that mouse creep over to rook b8. But overall, Kolars is very focused on the center. Obviously, the tension of the b5 pawn. At this, at this stage, I don't know that I put as much stock in where their eyes are as much as they're kind of thinking about things uh, Nakamura style, right? They could be looking up at the chandelier. They're just sort of calling on memory here, likely in terms of prep. Um, but what variations is he trying to remember here? Something around the critical tension of when white is going to strive for d4, likely. He's focused on that square, and there's a lot of decisions that have to be made as soon as that tension uh, gets in the middle of the board. So he's trying to remember how he wants to handle that. Yeah, d4 is already a standard plan, but especially with the bishop on c5, when you gain a tempo, it becomes even stronger. That said, it's not the end of the world if d4 is played, so Kolaris can try to castle. I I'm very concerned about g4 at some moment, and the reason why is if g4, bishop g6 happens, yep. you have this really terrible bishop on g6. Yep. And I I can't stand it when I've had games where I just keep this bishop there. It's not doing Something anything. Something like this. Right here. Yeah. 
And you have to be really careful. Like you're saying, you can, it's it's really tough if the center is going to stay closed. This bishop will just feel completely out of it. The risk for white, of course, is if you go for this structure and black does manage to blow things open and change it, well, now, as we keep saying, right, now that becomes a pawn. You wish you could move back. So um, the uh, that is a critical decision. Somehow I feel like there has to be something that goes along with that. Okay, so he plays b4, and we see he's... He's still focused now, obviously, considering the c4 square. Uh, maybe white wants to prepare a knight maneuver that's typical, so so Kalar says, I'll, I'll be prepared for that. Knight a5 immediately threatening to take on c3 and, and then on b3, everybody. So Fabi says, no, thank you. Yeah, and this bishop c2 maneuver that's very common rerouting in the Spanish. You are saving your bishop, and so you keep the bishop pair, but it also helps you play d4 because yep. now e4 is even uh, more defended. Like loading up a t-shirt cannon. Uh -oh. Right, you got to pack it in there tight before you pull the trigger, and then let those things out. But you have to have safety on before. Always you have your safety on whenever you're pumping up a t-shirt cannon, which is what I've been doing here <laughs> for a while. I know. I'm just like I'm, I'm looking over at you, and you're just so ready. Just trying to get the uh, get get the energy up here. Well, yeah. the snowballs are going to need Kolar's energy here. I see that uh, Doncheko and Proleko have also just begun their game, but they're going to need Kolar's to hang in this game because the worst thing that can happen for your team is a quick defeat. You yep. may end eventually lose. That's you know That happens when you're playing Fabiana Caruana. But if you lose very early in the match, then all of a sudden your, your team feels a little bit deflated. Yep. And it's like, okay, we're down two games, and that's a really, I don't want to call it an insurmountable comeback at that point, but... St. Louis is good. St. Louis is good, and they're just playing well this weekend, too. I mean, I, I think that this three GM lineup of Meyer, Donchenko, and Kolars is, is here for a reason, right? Yeah. They're in the championship for a reason. And I think ultimately, uh, though, in order for this match to be one that that uh, the Snowballs have a chance in, I, I think they may need some help from their board four. I think it might yep. be really important that Ina beats Proleko when she plays, uh, plays Julian. Um, and, and maybe even try, try to get a draw off a guy like Nicholas Theodoro. So here, here we see the board four for the bishops, trying to get his first point on the board. Um, currently has lost all five games that he's played this weekend. Yep, he and Ina are in the same place. In the same place, and so he's trying to help his team, and right now spying that A5 pawn that wandered too far from home. But something feels very artificial about that move. I feel like Donchenko can quickly play bishop D2, and indeed he does, so... I'm not really a huge fan of that last move because that trade probably doesn't do anything to help Black's dark squares, if we're totally honest. Yeah. Um, but Black is just going to castle quickly, maybe play e5. or. Yeah. But it did help white, de helped white develop. It, it didn't feel necessary there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? Yeah, so he, he, I think Donchenko also a little surprised by that. Um, plays c3 quickly, which of course supports the idea of b4 to protect a5. Also a move that creates a luft a lift square for the queen so that you can connect your rooks and then maybe play e4. So pretty pretty standard play right now. Um, I'm expecting queen c2 or b4. It's just very flexible. Honestly, flexible for both sides. Yeah. And the bishop on g2 is staring to a brick wall. This, oh, look at all these pawns in the light squares, right? So you're not actually getting an open diagonal anytime soon, but you can play for e4, you can play for f4, yep. you can play for g4, you, have, you can play for c4. You can play for B4. I mean, you keep, have keep all naming fours, man. Uh, H4. You can't okay. play for A4. Though. Can I get a? Can I do I do I have H4? Do I have H4? Uh, uh, I'll tell you what C4 is. It's dynamite. Uh oh. First awkward dad pun. Moving on. Yeah. Not, oop, um, there's the G4. G4. My favorite emote. Subscribers to the channel that rarely goes live. Twitch.tv slash Daniel Wrench. There's a G4 emote over there. There is. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, just for G4. I like it. I think and it's no other the, emotes. I hope. That's it. I mean, besides the one of you. Aww. Yeah. Aww. All right, well, this is a typical uh, idea here in the Spanish. Obviously, you push the G4 pawn and then put the pony behind it. Uh, lots of reasons why this is a good idea. Whenever knights and pawns work behind and with each other, everyone, you overprotect the squares directly in front of it. Right? That's just something to know about the geometry of how the pieces move. You also have potential ideas of H4, H5 in addition to knight F5. So... This is very standard, but also what Collars is doing is standard. When when they go all in for this Lopez G4 idea, which you called, by the way, partner, yep. that Fabiano would do this, you want to open the center. So I, I like what Collars is doing. Even if this works out in the most likely result, a win for the 2800 leading the Archbishops, I feel like this is going to become dynamic at some point, and and that's what Collars need. You got you, Like we say, you can't take get a nick in the shield of Captain America without taking some swings at it with a sword. You've been obsessed. I have. Because I saw Marvel's Endgame. Uh, I know what you saw. You want to talk about it? Uh, I've looked at enough Endgames today. 
Oh, <laughs> we had a lot uh, of end games in yeah. the earlier match. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, Although I will say, and you're going to be surprised I'm saying this, I think Kolar's, in my opinion, his chances have increased just looking at how this game has progressed. Mm -hmm. I think this is the kind of tactical position that any player, not a, a slight of Fabiano, yep. struggles with. Yep. And I feel like as the position opens up, you, you become a, a more uncertain of certain things, and then you start thinking, okay, can I go forward with this, or is my king going to become too unsafe? Yep. Can I trade queens, or is that end game going to be more equal? And so I think that Kolar's chances of holding this, in my estimation, have gone up as I see where I move to 16, and I actually quite like his position. Well, we've got Fabiano looking very relaxed there. Uh, yesterday he said the music he chose. We have white noise, classical music. Shout out to Cash Menke with the gifted subs. Cash Menke is here in the audience. What's up, dude? Cash Menke's downstairs throwing <laughs> subs at people. Um, thank you for being here on site and uh, and for the support there. It's probably like one of those payback methods. We're like, hey, I lent you ten bucks. Yeah. But like, instead of going to buy me a beer at the bar, can you just yeah, just some throw some subs. But yeah. anyway, so Fabiano obviously, uh, like we said, feeling relaxed that he's kind of enjoying the environment. That it looks like he is in his body language. But I agree with you. I think Kolarz's chances have gone up if this becomes more dynamic. It's all you can ask for against a stronger player. Um, and uh, honestly. You know, he's doing well on the clock. His position is very solid. Watch out for this a6 pawn, by the way. Yep. Queen on e2 is saying, if you ever take me on e4, and I take back with my pawn, now your That's a6 a, pawn yeah. is a target. That's how blunders happen right there, right? Just because human beings, you're going to be focused on the tension. We've seen where their eyes are looking, oh. and uh, this is a pawn you got to watch what out for. What if I want the bishop pair? So if I go bc3, okay. bc3, and I go knight to b3. You would want the bishop here. And he took on c3, so the live board okay. is b takes c3, b takes uh, knight b3. And he's going for it. All right, he likes Am it Am I as playing well. this game? Uh, he, he, he hears you. He likes yeah. your idea. I mean, mentally, of course, not actually. Um, and uh, but it makes sense. Right now, you've opened up the b-file. You've got this light square bishop in the, uh, in the fold. I honestly would even consider playing d takes e4 here and, like, sacrificing an exchange. That would be the all-in approach, right? Yeah. If you're really going for the... For the gusto here, but no, I think rook b8 was safe. It makes yeah. sense. Totally unnecessary, but I'm just, you know, those kind of positions are still interesting because white is extended on the king side yep. so much that some potential sacrifices are looming. Well, we're about to get extended as far as our commentary goes because all four games are officially underway. We see Benjamin Bach and Nina Agres quickly out of the gate here. A g3, King's Indian, double Fianchetto, and then, of course, we have Georg Meyer who just started against Nicholas Theodoro. It's completely symmetrical. On that board, could not it, be Georg Meyer playing this game, could it? It, it seems it seems like we've been here before, right? <laughs> a little bit of deja vu, and uh, you know, jokes aside, it's one of the things that Georg does really well. He's uh, super super consistent in his repertoire, which helps you in, in all time controls. He said that yesterday when we yep. interviewed him, he was Blitz saying that rapid, he feels yep. very comfortable in certain yep. positions. So even if you get a quote unquote bad position, yep. you can play quickly because you feel comfortable with the yep. general structure. Well, and Nicholas Theodoro. I, I want to say played a similar approach to a G3 Kings Indian against uh, against someone yesterday. I feel like we had this on the board, and I'm I'm. It's been a long weekend, but uh, but I, I'm pretty sure we had this on the board at some point. Um, and uh, and okay, now we have this nice C3 and E5. It's it could have gone a reverse Grunfeld direction. Not going to happen anymore. Um, what are the tactics in this line that start happening in the center, Robert? Knight takes D5. Queen takes d5, and knight takes e5. Doesn't really do much after queen takes d4. I guess there's knight takes c6 there. But I, th I think in this line, black can just take back, and yeah, they get, they get compensation. Well, I was going to say, don't take on d1. Because if you take yes. on d1, there's you lose intermezzo. Lose inter intermezzo. Never assume a recapture, right? Um, but if you take here, the point is that black gets some, some compensation in, in the form of the open lines, the pressure on b2, and this is kind of a theoretically known idea. Um, although after take, wait a second, takes e4 is the is the the intermezzo. Speaking of assuming recaptures, I just did it. I just assumed Black was taking back, and instead e4 knight e5, and Jorg still playing quickly, still saying he knows what he's doing here. I think b takes c6 is the best move here, but it's one that if you're not very familiar with the position, would be hard to play. Very difficult to play because yep. you're giving yourself double isolated C pawns, give yourself an isolated A pawn, but by taking on A6 with the, the B pawn, you also open up bishop A6 avenues, rook yep. to B8, things like that. But, um, yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to commit to that if you don't know that that's the idea, right? You're like, hey, that, those are some those are some ugly peshki. Um, 
But okay, I think Theodoro's going to pause 10 seconds. And there it is. And come up with the right move for station identification. Now let's go back to Alexander Donchenko versus Julian Proleko. This one moving along. Um, feels very comfortable for White. Donchenko looking to rebound after a loss to the Archbishop's board three. Whose bishop do you like better in this position? <laughs> very funny. <laughs> uh, do I like the logo next to Julian Proleko or do I like the one on G2? I think it's the one on G2 speaks for itself. That thing's a monster. It's <laughs> so good. It's a ninja. You like hardly ever see a bishop this good. Yeah. Well, there's no challenger for it, right? Yep. And I mean, at what point do I just go BC6, B6, maybe Rook B6 or right. something like that? As soon as, as soon as you have the opportunity, right, probably. Right now you can do it. He's thinking about it. Um, making sure there's no tactics, perhaps. Always be a little bit careful there. But what happens on takes, takes, rook b6 if uh, if black can't defend the pawn? I mean, Maybe e4? Uh, e4. I, I was looking at things like knight d7, but then we would take it. Looks like a lot of moves are, are happening. So let's see. Indeed, Donchenko agrees this is the clear plan. So yep. the problem with queen d6 is, is now on knight b3, takes and takes, I, the a6 pawn is going to fall. Yep, and knight f d7. Falls right into rook takes a6 as well. Don Donchenko's getting surgical up in this, right? Oh, yeah. He's just, you know. Knight fd7, the queen's no longer protected, so rook takes a6 works. Oh, wow. That is a pin emote waiting to happen. Yep. And I am happy to see you. Oh, man. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Look at you completing my... Sandwiches. That's right. By the way, we're going to get some sandwiches after this. Are we? Yeah. Some Sammies? Better than Jimmy John's. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. Jersey Mike's? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> you actually seem pretty excited about it. You looked at me like, wow, that sounds pretty good right yeah, now. I was like, ooh, you went, you, you know. Okay, also, what do you think about this position here? Because the queen on c6 is perfectly placed. Yep. And the king on g2 is a bit exposed. Yep. But black does have some pro pawn problems over there on the king side as well. I got 99 problems. But dull and pawns. My, my pawns are like six of them, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in fact, you have to be careful of the d3 pawn, though, with uh, potential removing of the defender of the knight. Whenever you have a king potentially exposed on the light squares, you got to be willing to go all in. Make sure you can consider sacrifices because a light square bishop may indeed be better than a rook if you can open up things. I don't think it's going to be possible. I'm just just saying that as a general general right. pro tip. Um, and queen f3 is coming. As yeah, well. queen f3 coming, hitting f6. The more I look at this, the more I actually feel like that plan seems more straightforward than anything I can find for black. Visually, I love the bishop here. The moment we got here, the more I look at it, the more I feel like Fabiano. Is, is doing okay, and with a three-minute time advantage on the clock, you, you start to see the 2800 flexing. Yeah, the problem is that the bishop on g6 is a terrible piece, and you can get rid of it by taking on e4, but then that knight hops into f5 and remains there for the rest of the game. We see Fabiano once again along with one of his seconds, and now the, the head coach of the Mizzou the, the 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 brand new Mizzou chess program. Chess program. <laughs> you see that? He's count. I saw I saw the peace sign. He knows when he's on camera. That guy. Yeah. He's he's got his eye on it. <laughs> a very well trimmed beard, I might say. Hashtag jelly over here. Yeah, it is. He, he's looking perfectly quaffed. How, you you, uh, you quaff that every day, Christian? Give me a <laughs> nod. Yeah. No. I don't know if you can hear us. And then Fagan <laughs> is looking for his teammates' games. The yeah. Good team player that he is. Good and team he's, player. He's, really enjoyed this format. Like Throughout yep. the year, uh, we've talked to so many of the top players about this. Uh, Maxime vachet le Grave, MVL, uh, Levant, yep. Aronian, all these people. It's fun for them to play new faces. Yep. MVL has stressed this a lot. You play the same top players over and over and yep. over again, you're like, it's like looking in a mirror at that yep. point. Yep. Like, please get me something new. Yeah, give me something new. Especially so, when I look in a mirror, that's how I feel. Yeah. Uh, I definitely don't feel that way when I look at you in the mirror. Oh. <laughs> 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 this just got so weird. <laughs> uh, which we actually do, sharing a room here yeah. uh, often. Yeah. I appreciate you making space for me. I need to shuffle around you. It's all good. So, anyway. It's all good. Queen of three was played. F6 is under fire. Kolars is getting lower and lower on time. Um, uh, yeah, he needs it. It's going to be a critical decision coming up. About which is, we talk about that because you need to speed up. It's it's so easy to fall into kind of a trance, right? When yeah. you're like playing these guys because you start thinking, I got to find the best move on every move. But then what happens is you get down to two minutes, and now you're really in the critical moment, and you don't have time to find the best move, yep. right? So well, speak to that a little bit. I know that you struggle with that some, right? I mean, you you uh, talk uh, seriously. I, I know. Way to put me on the spot. No, no. Though. But <laughs> what is the psychological thing there? Because you say it's like, hey, like I know this is every move is critical. I want to be as accurate as I can, but you always have to be weighing the practical evaluation of the moment along with the X's and O's on the board. Yeah, and especially in a position like this, you see the light squares, right? So right. You this knight, oh, there it Ooh. goes. I was, was going to tell him to take on e4, but the wow. problem with take on e4 is look at the f5 square. Mm -hmm. That 
pony is that turned to unicorn and yep. stay there for the rest of the game. Yep. Why not and a Pegasus with wings? Anyway, oh. continue. Yep. I mean, I learned about an octopus. There earlier. you go. Did you, you heard that part? What? Well, earlier it was like, oh, a square like that. Is an, it's called an octopus. An, oh, because it attacks everything. Yeah. What? I, I've I never, never heard, heard that. Me neither. Way to go, Anna. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> that is an octopi right there. Okay, <laughs> anyway. So, yeah, the light scores are weak. But, yeah, so how do you balance your time management there? Yeah, so essentially I'm trying to come up with concrete ideas because I know that I'm going to have some – there are going to be drawbacks no matter what I do. Either right. there's going to be a knight on e4 that's going to sit there or a knight on f5. Right. But I need to see what can I do for myself. And here, look at the d3 pawn. Right. If white had taken with the pawn on e4 instead of the rook, then my rook comes down to d2, and I see a counterplay in the f2 square. So even if you get the light squares, I have a dark square bishop, I can attack uh, that square. And so now after rook e4, moving the bishop, look at the c3 pawn. The a4 pawn is not exactly the best pawn either. The d3 pawn is not the best pawn. So what does knight f5 do? You're sitting on a square that looks really pretty, right. but there's no there's no follow-up there. Right. In fact, this rook e6 move played earlier is very useful because that rook not only protects f6, it can swing over to d6, doubling, or once the queen moves, you can come to b6 and maybe get active mm. over there. So I think that this is good decision-making by Dimitri Kolars, and right now a move like queen b6 is an option. Um, and he plays your move rook d6. d6. You know, a a four hanging, right? Oh, then c no queen a, a four c five. Queen a four. There's knight f five. Got to be something Fabian is playing. But this is going to become an all-in kind of affair where Fabi has sacrificed the queen side for the hopes of whatever this attack might amount to. Right? Yeah. It's going to be a fun one to watch. Yeah, and a queen a four. C5 looks like it wins the rook, but I can block with rook D4. Yep. So how do I feel about giving up F6? Well, your D1 rook's hanging. Ah, uh, look at you, spying tactics. I knew poking the bear about time management. Yeah, you really, wake, wake you up woke my me up. Here. You're there. like, <laughs> you're not queen, doing enough now. No, no, I'm kidding. Queen D7, okay. Oh, I like that too. He goes for D3, and that's actually, that's a high-level move there because that's accurately... Trying, that's how you can punish even a strong player like Fabiano because you know he probably looked at lines like queen a4. He doesn't just blunder a pawn. But he might have missed the idea of not taking and playing a retreating move. You talk about how psychologically those moves are often missed in your calculation. Yep. You just don't look at retreating moves when you're considering candidate moves for your opponent. Right. I'm looking at the move d4 here, by the way. Oh, wow. Can you get away with that? I'm saying if you take with the pawn, I go knight f5, and now I'm going to win back this pawn on d4. Your rook on d6 is under attack. If you take with the rook, I swap on d4 with the, maybe the d. I don't know which rook, but I say f6 is falling. But still, this actually gives black good chances. Yeah, like it's, it's queen weird. seven. The queens yeah. are forced even, off. The even d3. D3 like, for sure. There's no next move for white, right? But a queen e7 forces the queens off. So if you're like really feeling really scared for your safety, yeah. So you move your queen, you lose the knight on on uh, h4. All right. Well, this is this is dynamic. I, I kind of want to stay here because it just feels like such a big moment. But the one you really picked as a potential big a big one as well was. Uh, the board won on the other side of things for the snowballs against Nicholas Theodoro. Georg Meyer looks to be a little a little better here positionally, right? I just look at the structure and I I, ha I have to love love White's chances based on that. But but Theodoro's active. Yeah, and I look at the quality of the bishops. Black's bishops are way better. That bishop on G2 is entombed. The bishop on E3 is a, a little bit of a passive piece. So despite having the weak pawns, I have the strong pieces. That said, mm -hmm. if the queens get traded, a rook goes to C the C file. Then it's clear that White is the one picking up the momentum. Yeah, you're, you're right though that this G2 bishop is gonna have to wiggle its way out if, if White's ever gonna be better, right? Yeah. You're gonna have to maybe play something like Bishop of Four so you can play E3 and get here, but that by itself not only takes time, it's kind of committal as far as weakening your squares long term. So, so yeah, this is this is an interesting one. Um, quickly touching on the others, it looks like Donchenko won that pawn on C6 for free, right? Didn't even cost him anything. That's uh, right. good. It cost him a couple minutes on the clock. Uh, yeah, I mean, he is down on time, but he's, he's, he's up a pawn. He's got the right color bishop if we're talking about the second weakness in Black's camp. But oh. if you make a move like bishop d5, mm -hmm. I think I can trade rooks and play a5. No, I can't. You'd b7 too quickly. b7, knight here, I have bishop in, or c5, possibly. Yeah, c5 was definitely. Yeah, c5 would protect and, and assault. Push. Right? Okay, and the other game we, we haven't had much time to look at is between Benjamin Bach and Ina Agres. Obviously, Bach going to be the heavy favorite here, but okay, look at look at Ina's position. The thing I don't like most about it is the clock. I think that she's got an interesting fight in the center, although, wait, the more I look at this and I realize it's hard to actually use these dark squares, clear the smoke, and there's there's one one issue here at the end. Right, that D6 pawn looks like a goner, and what is the plan for black? Yeah. Like... Queen. One of those things where you look at the space and you're like, yes, the mighty spear, and yeah. then what? Well, you want that pawn on a6 to be on a4. Yeah. 
Right, if the pawn's on a4, yep. then you um, uh, you can break open the queen side. Yeah, also a feature we've been asking for for a long time. <laughs> jumping two squares jumping over. Jumping two squares over a queen. Well, Fabiano Whoa. is going to try to jump into a square called f5 here. We've got multiple rooks hanging. Okay. <sighs> Bishop's going to come back to g5 with tempo, though. and I th Oh, he goes to f4 instead to cut off the queen from hitting f6. Yeah, this bishop g5 move, I guess there was knight f5 on h4, but that didn't seem yeah. to help that much. Yeah, so instead he does this, but again, that knight on f5 looks... Uh, Maybe it looks better than it is, right? Yeah, I mean, it looks beautiful. It, I mean, okay, it is, it is beautiful, but it needs help to be effective. Although the more I look at this, the more I feel like something slipped there. If there was, if there was a critical moment earlier, I don't know, I'm... I'm worried about any type of end game now if I'm black. And I'm worried about back rank checkmates, yep. any end game. But what I mean is like I think if we had just a pure knight versus bishop ending, I like white. Yeah. If we have even, you know, rook and knight versus rook and bishop, we like white, right? Yeah. And that's tough when you start evaluating the big picture of your position and you don't really like any transition. Fabiano sacrificing the a4 pawn for a chance. E4 doesn't work. E4 would pick up the rook on d1, but after queen f4, queen d1, queen h6. You get out of perpetual. Yep. Just like that. And, and Bob's mean, your uncle on g7. Checkmate. Checkmate. Oh. Uh, uh -oh. oh. Did he blunder? He must be blundering. Yeah, yeah, Fabiano takes it instantly and says, hey, think you miscalculated that one, buddy. Is and there, is there Fabiano is going to continue to roll here at the 2019 Pro Chess League Championship. He is just, again, it's not even that he's 6-0. and He's just played very well in, yeah. in this time control, in the format. He seems to be right at home, right? He's lounging in his chair half the time. Someone get him a beer. I mean, maybe this is, this is the new Fabiano. Yeah, maybe that's the only way to stop him. Right? Get him a beer. Get him a beer, right? <laughs> I mean... He's leaned in right here because um, he just probably knows he's about to stand up. But he's uh, <laughs> he's been he's been good all day. He's waiting for that resin. There it is. Yep. And uh, puts the headphones down. We shake hands. The Carwana train keeps on trucking. Um, he's kind of good at chess. Yep. All right. Well, uh, Fabiano Carwana helps the bishops spread spread that lead to two games. Um, we can we can go a number of places, but let's go to the 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 counterpart of the same pairing, board one versus board three on the other side. Um, I like Georg's position here more and more, um, but but maybe I'm maybe I'm uh, you know overestimating how quickly the C file can become a problem before the D four pawn does for White. Yeah, I think you just hate double pawns. I, I really do. You know, you got me, got me guilty. Guilty, I hate double pawns. Is that because that was your nickname in middle school? Guilty. Guilty or double pawns? <laughs> double pawns. <laughs> double pawn Dan? Yeah. That's a, that is a lot of, lot of memories about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings on stream. But I do like for black because whenever you have double pawns, mm -hmm. the adjacent files are now open. So you yep. can put a rook on B8 or just slide that rook over to D8. The right. d4 pawn is really hard to defend because there's a bishop on e3 when you want a pawn there. The reason why a pawn isn't on e3 is, well, where would that bishop have gone? And right. once you play e3, the light squares are more uh, vulnerable. Yep. You'd like to play two moves. You'd like to put the pawn here and the bishop here. Yep. Right? And uh, I don't know that white can pull that off. Again, we'll work on that. But um, but this was the critical matchup I was talking about. It looks like Theodore is really holding his own here. Okay, so can I... Take a2, or is that too risky? Taking a2 is, in theory, I think a good idea, everybody, because you would be trading a healthy pawn for an objectively ugly pawn, <laughs> right? I um, love you throwing it objectively. You just does double pawn. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure it's not just my bias. I mean, it's an ugly pawn, regardless of my nickname in high school. Um, but... But the issue is, is is it also giving white other types of activity, right? Is it is it giving my rook um, more pressure against c7? Can I get d5 in some positions, right? So you're you're trying to evaluate not just the trade of the pawn for pawn, an eye for an eye, whether your opponent is getting more than you are in that trade. Um, yeah, and like if you go queen takes a2, there's some b3 attempts. So mm -hmm. if you blunder with queen a3, oh, then I have rook a1. And the queen has to run away, a skewer emote. But the queen would go back to a5 to keep the bishop safe, but it's right. still a 
Still a mess. Queen a5 here. You would go to b5, I think. b6 would allow a discovery. And probably, you know, black is just fine. Yep. Um, there it is. He goes for it. Wow. Well, I mean, this is... Uh, right now, you gotta be you got to be feeling the pressure here if you're in the Snowballs camp here. Every single game so far has uh, has been tough here for the Snowballs. They're down by two games. They need a big win, right? They need a moment to go their way to change the momentum of this thing. Yeah, I mean, they need Ina Agres to hold on against Benjamin Buck here because uh, right now she's closed the time gap. That's 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 the, the thing. that's the biggest thing. Ooh, exchange sacrifice. Wow, that is just giving up the rook for the bishop. Saying I'm going to control the dark squares, and and also it immediately exposes kind of a uniquely sort of bad placement of black's pieces. Right, the chances of there being more tactics, especially when the dark squares are now open for business. The knight may come to d5, right? So this, I mean, this feels like the right practical moment to go for something like this. You know, rook b6, I like that move. Comes up with rook b6, a move that's going to try to simplify whenever you're up material, get pieces off the board. And maybe you can swing it to e6 exactly. now. Exactly. Right. Or play bishop b7. That way you can capture a knight if it jumps to d5. Okay. You know, I'm worried that you're just going to plan a knight on d5 and it's going to be very problematic. Okay, the move order doesn't really matter. If knight d5, you can still go bishop b7. But honestly, I don't think her position is that bad. Yeah. No, the more I look at it, the, the less I'm confident about the exchange sack. I think that white's two moves short of, of real compensation, like a bishop on h6 and a pawn on f4. Yeah. Right? And when that happens, you could start prying open more, more opportunities. Um, but I, I think just... Play bishop b7. Yeah, right? I would definitely rather have white here, especially considering in, the time control. Yeah, in a practical game for sure. Uh, and the bishop can move from f4. You can play knight e2 to f4 at some moment. So yeah. you have plenty to work with as white here. But the material could be important later in the game, especially yep. if some lines open up for the rooks. Back to the game between Donchenko and the board for Proleka, who feels like he's getting closer and closer to his first point. And I don't know that that comes in the, in the form of a full one or a half a point, but Proleko has played better as the event has gone on. Um, he, he did very well in the first set of games versus Georg Meyer, if you're just joining us, although ultimately lost. Um, here again, I think Donchenko should find a way to win this, you, you think, but the more I look at it, h how? Um, yeah, is, there, is there like a fortress going on? I mean, yeah, you know, is F4 you know, going to happen though. and stop E3? Because that's my worry, is that if, if Proleko could get this, E3 stopped, H4 stopped, I can't target any of these pawns. My bishop is kind of a helpless bystander. Um, and if you go king E1 to go, because king wants to go to G4 if you F4. But then the A pawn at the right moment, don't push too quickly. Yeah. As the, soon as you push A4, the king goes right back to the queen side yeah. to go take it. So you, so you sit tight, I guess, yeah, a little king bit? C8. And if the king gets too far out of the box, right? If the king really goes out of the box, now but A4 then comes in. I can in. sacrifice my bishop for the pawn. And then yeah, just... ooh, that would be an interesting way that Georg is planning to win. Wow. Wouldn't that be some technique? Yeah. If, uh, and that might be it. Yeah, if Don Jago can pull that off, that would be... Yeah. F4 was indeed played. Okay. Knight to C... I, I don't know that it really works. Um, takes. Uh, takes here, takes. You'd have to come back to stop F3. The knight gets here. I mean, is it? Is it... What's happening in lines like this? But may maybe White is is having enough. He goes back to E1. So we're gonna find out. Donchenko, maybe maybe has this exact idea in mind. Um, frankly, if I that's not the idea, I don't know that there is another yeah, way to play it. I don't think it works. I don't think it works. Yeah, King F2. I go A4 immediately, right? I just. And if I pop back A3, King up A2, and I'm too fast. I mean, I'm yeah. too slow. And that way, I can just go to this nice E3. I, yeah, this. Okay, let's pause for a second. Is there any? There's nothing. Yeah, I don't see a way that Donchenko gets in, and this this could be the moment that Proleko gets uh, gets kind of off the bench, right? Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. I'm ready to draw. Um, he's, he's trying trying to help his team here. The board four for the bishops. And this is a moment that shows how bad bishops can be. Yeah. Because that bishop would love to be able to reroute itself somewhere, but the knight just dominates it. Oh, it's going to a4, but then what? Bishop a4, yeah. he's going king c8, king b7. The problem is you, you can't Yeah, you can't get the knight out. It's just uh, the bishop, as we've said, he's kind of a, we call this a purposeless bishop, right? It looks good. It can move fast around the board, but, but lacks real purpose in oh, life. Oh, wait, I see a potential trick. So watch this. King d8. Okay. King a2. 
Okay. King C, uh, King C8, okay. King A3. Okay. If you go back King D8, which you shouldn't do, Bishop G4. Ah. And then I'm going to try to push B7, then King A4. And the point, everybody, is black is in Zugzwang, because if the king moves, then B7 can't be stopped by the king. And if the knight moves, you let the king into A4. Yep. Very, very nice idea, so, Robert. Oh, oh. oh, and he's gone no, he for King it. E7. No, that's... Okay, but he's getting his king to a D6. Okay, so if King A3, King D6... He's there in time. Yeah, and so Perleko is going to be holding this one, I think. He, but he if, came so close to... If King D6, B7, King C7, Bishop F3... So you, you King D7 here. There it is, okay? And he needs to get that position back. Somehow he needs to to be able to cut that king off again and go B7 to sacrifice. He's only got 20 seconds, and that's Donchenko, the higher-rated player. Running out of ways to create a mess for the board four from the archbishops, and this position may have already been repeated three times on the board. I, I mean, we've, I've, we've definitely seen this dog and pony dance before. Yep. How many times have we seen it? And what a fortress that he came yeah, up with. Yeah, what a fortress, and just look at the, the, the visuals, right? You see dark square versus light square dominance. The geometry of the chessboard really kind of in full display. And uh, I think I think indeed we're about to see a handshake and a draw. And for the uh, for the kid, the kid, as we said, to get off the bench. That's huge. And score a half a point. Some board four points is absolutely huge. And he was like very upset yesterday, I could tell. Yep. Uh, you know, he had some really tough games, didn't play his best chess, but you know he's really here for his team. Like he yep. wants him to win so bad. He wants to be a part of that win. He doesn't want to be the guy who lost all his games while yep. Fabiano carried the team. Right. He wants to play his part and he's doing it right now because yep. look at the rating gap between these two players. Oh, okay. What up? Okay, the king king's too far, but he keeps doing this thing where his king's getting cut. Oh, off. he just allowed King C six. Uh Okay, it should still be a draw, but now who's playing for the win? Uh, Black's playing for the win. Did Donchenko go too far? Oh, my god! And his refusal to uh, to let Proleko off the bench with a half point, he, uh, he may have pushed this one too far. And a, a win would be too much here for the Snowballs to overcome if, if the board four took down Alexander Donchenko, yesterday's hero in many ways for the Snowballs. F3. Oh, he's going for the win. He's going for it. Look if, at the time if situation. If pawn takes, d3 falls. Yep. If bishop takes, the king gets in. Oh, my gosh. And and look out. But I don't think he can win this because his knight can't really move. The c pawn will roll. Okay, you're going to have to guard h3 and potential tactics on e2, though. So you have to be very careful if you're Donchenko and you don't have a lot of time to defend. Can Donchenko just go king b2, like king a3 forever? The problem is the knight can't help the king attack e2 because the c-pawn will just start running mm, away. Yeah, not fast enough. Yeah, okay. Well, Proleko, did he push too far now? Because yeah. now now there's a question. If, if, you, if you're oh not careful, gosh. there's uh, my ideas of e3. Yeah, I think he's okay because he's got his knight b3. He's yeah, you have to, all of a sudden I was looking at it and you wonder if Proleko got a little too frisky for his own good because if, if, if Donchenko can sacrifice and then get two pass pawns Draw. going, Draw. it would be good enough. But unfortunately... Wow. It's not, but you got to be happy if you're an Archbishop's fan. That, Proleko. I honestly wonder if that's the best result of his entire chess career. I wouldn't be surprised. Donchenko's a, a fantastic player. It's a huge result regardless, and we have to keep it rolling, though. Back to Benjamin Buck's game with Ina Agres. Uh -oh. Buck looks like he turned that exchange sacrifice into, into a, a real boy, right? Yeah, definitely a real old boy for me. A real old boy here. He's, uh, we've, uh, when you wish upon a star... You get an attack on the dark squares, and I think that dreams I, come true. Dreams come true, right? I mean, this uh, this looks like a sacrifice that worked out well. Uh, we don't know exactly what the tactics were, but at this point, it's it's you just have to be impressed with the the dominant performance right now that the bishops are putting on, and 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 really highlight that the snowballs have to find themselves one way or another before this thing gets out of hand. Yeah, and, and Georg Meyer is struggling on this board as well. He has the white pieces here. The I love the bishop on e5. Yep. The king on g looks a little bit breezy, but there's no way to attack it, especially because that bishop on g2 isn't able to run away. Right, you would need that bishop on g2 on e6 and just go for an attack. Yeah. Or, or g4 and open this this up. I think the g4 might be... Oh, uh, he didn't go for it. I, I worry about... This plan seems dangerous because the two rooks could be very, very difficult for the queen yep. to contend with. And rook d8 forces a trade of bishops because yep. as a rook d8, you have to go e3 to protect. And then I don't even have to take you there, but I can make you can. You, yeah, I can take there, exactly. And then but play. you can also just sit like you're saying, you know, 
something like this, and Black is probably can't lose. Yeah, the, probably not win. It looks like it should be relatively even here. Right. And wow, I mean, with that draw right there, the score is officially four and a half, two and a half. Scoreboard will update momentarily, but we've we've got a two point lead for the Archbishops, and Georg Meyer is in more position than ever as okay. far as needing to win. Four two is right. Four two is correct. Yeah. Okay, four two is correct. That's right with that last draw. Georg looks nervous. He looks very nervous and unhappy, and realizing that St. Louis is kind of good. Yeah, they're good. They're playing well today, and yeah. again, it's. Uh, I, I still think that, you know, if you're talking about the storyline of this match. Oh. Okay, sorry, go ahead. In the last round is where the snowballs really have a chance, I think. If Meyer holds Caruana, Agrest is, is finally favored in someone like, uh, in a game versus someone like Julian Proleko, right? Yep. And then you have Kolars and uh, Donchenko with a chance to, to right the ship. So I, I don't think that this is, a, this is a match that is over with a couple points, but... Um, but yeah, right now it's really just been the momentum of the thing, right? It's just been that, I mean, as you see right here, just that the bishops have just been rolling from start to finish. That's the real problem. Yeah, that bishop on d5 was a pretty good bishop as well. Yep. And uh, taking f7 would have been mate. Queen f8 mate. Queen f8 is indeed checkmate on the board. And we have one game remaining right now with a three-point lead currently for the archbishops. And I don't think this is a position that Georg Meyer is going to win. Yeah, well, there's two rooks for the queen. There's no infiltration scores, really. The queen, well, if it ever goes to a3 to attack a6, you're losing b4 in the process. So that's not really a trade that you want to make, uh, but you have to. You have to go for it here if you're Gormire, because honestly, at this stage, it draws almost the equivalent of a loss. You're down 5-2. to two. It's a three-game uh, deficit. Of course, if the position is going to be a draw, so be it, but you have to try at all costs to win this game. And look at the clock situation. Yep. Theodora down under a minute. Georg at a minute and a half. He is the superior blitz player between the two of them. So just keep it going. Go king f1, king e2. And you and I often talk about the fact that the queen is the easier piece to manage in a time scramble. Absolutely, right? because you and can check on a diagonal and all of a sudden a rook's yep. hanging. Yep, and uh, so, you know, just from a practical point of view, forget whether it's the unbiasedly, you know, best approach. You, you create open lines, right? H4, H5, H3, and G4, right? Try to create some weaknesses that your opponent will have to worry about with less than 30 seconds on the clock. Yeah, I would, I, I would even think about going king f1 to c3, like just get my king over there, and then protect the b4 pawn so my queen can start running into the uh, position. Yeah, I kind of like creating some sort of opening here, but I realize now that if I'm if I do too much, I actually could it could backfire, right? I could open up things yeah. that uh, that may be more more effective for my opponent. Maybe g4 um, at some point is an option too, especially yeah. now with the queen on a5, because then f5. Okay, well now so g4 much, is yeah. <laughs> it was so much of an option that Nicholas Theodore agreed with you. I think we see the uh, St. Louis. Ooh, uh, the Kings and try to go into g5. Ah, that's wow, the that problem actually, with h5. It's getting harder for Nicholas to hold, the, I think. The clock situation. Georg takes a look up. He knows that his team queen is down. Queen d8 check. Throw in queen d8. Queen d8 check. Look to play the move king h4 as long as you don't get your king mated. Keep the pressure. There it is. Keep it fresh. Keep it funky. Old Spice. Sounds about right. King h4 now. Yep. Give up the b4 pawn, I think. Not the easiest decision to make, but king h4 rook b4, king g5. I don't really see an exact way to make progress, but it looks scary. So I have a king f6 by king h4 first, actually. Why? G5. Yeah, because g5 isn't really a threat. Even if you back up, these pawns may end up regretting how far they've pushed. Right. So yeah, I would play king h4, induce induce the idea that your opponent goes for h, uh, g5. Um, and don't listen why you don't take on h5. Yeah, I was going to say, you don't take because checkmate is real. Yep. Um, but... Uh, but I like your move, King H4. Georg taking a moment to gather himself. We have both our players on camera. You can see the, the oh. nervous manager from St. Louis, Mike Cummer, in the background oh, there. Oh, that's a nice watching decision, the too. Board. Queen C3 stopped any King F6. That's interesting. Now, A6 is falling, but you don't really want to trade it for B4. Just play King H4. Yeah, King there H4 it is. coming to G5. Now you've made King F6 impossible with the threat of discovered check. This feels like a Georg Master Grind. Yep, King King G5. Which just happened to be his DJ name, Georg <laughs> Master Grind. <laughs> King, Back in his days in the in the German Baden-Baden clubs. So there might be some checkmate ideas. What, the Queen A3, F4 check. Yeah. 
check that out, right? You got to be very careful about pawns. I think Georg sees it. Yep. He backs up and says, "I don't, I don't want to get mated." And he can put his pawn on h4 now. Yeah. And just, then you oh. really hold the king's safety with h4. No longer will there be threats of, and, and now there's always the threat of the king even running all the way in with yep. backdoor mates on the eighth rank. So this is, this is, like I said, looking like a Georg master grind here. Um. It's funny because people think that, like, I just support Georg, but this is what he does. Right, oh, he does. Oh, you know what? Rook before Queen A3. I, yeah. I saw it right as you did. And that was a free pawn there, so Queen... You can you can play... I thought he would play Queen A7, little tickle. He's going he's gonna to keep working he's this. He's going to keep working it with no diggity. King G5. There it is. There it comes. The king comes to H6, and look out for D5 oh and Queen gosh. G7. You're absolutely right. Here he's it. working it. Working the back door. Theodoro's down on time. One second. Oh, my gosh. Here comes D5. It's over. D5 is coming. Queen G7 wins G6 with check. And oh. Georg is keeping the Snowball's hopes alive with this one. Uh, wow. It's actually still not even over yet because the king has wandered so far that there's some rookie six check ideas. And I thought he was going to take with the king there, honestly. But I guess he'll get H5 on the next move. So as long as that queen doesn't have to settle on a perpetual, does it? Is she trapped? No. She no. can go Queen some, G5? Queen G7 and then go what is she? What is he doing? No! No, he just repeated three times. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Shocking, actually. Yeah, I... I this, this, this game had gone a direction where Jorg Master Grind was, was, was spinning himself some, fresh, some freshness. Yeah, I mean, I thought and it was going to be some kind of Queen G7 check and bring yeah, the Queen let's, back. Yeah, let's pull this up and see if we can find out if there was an opportunity that, that maybe didn't happen. What ha okay, you can't take with the, with the Queen... Right away because of rook to d6. Uh, Can no, you? Actually, go rook, no, go rook e6. Okay, rook e6. And I, and I run here and I get to f8. And it's one of those positions oh where the queen gosh. and king work together. Yeah. So I, I know Georg was clearly nervous, but it it didn't seem like a position that uh, that was as dangerous as it looked. Why why can he not take oh, h5? Maybe a rook d6. No, because rook d6. The problem with rook, rook d6 is I get to f4. Yeah. Oh, rook g7, no, rook, no. No, you take on f5. King f4, rook g4 check. and then you Take f5 and the rook falls. Yep. I mean, obviously, no. Ju I mean, it's very hard to calculate all this under time pressure. Oh, yeah. He's nervous. He doesn't want to let the match get completely away from his team. Yeah. Right, by losing this game. But at the same token, they're down three points now, right? And this was an opportunity for it to only be a two-game lead. And I'm... I'm I'm genuinely surprised. Obviously, we felt like this one was heading the direction of a victory for White after a very, very nice maneuver by Meyer, recognizing the queen and king working together. Long-distance relationships can be good, yeah, he, apparently. He really outplayed Theodora, but credit Theodora two days in a row. Yesterday against Zavin Andrasin, wow. he had a tough position. He defended opposite-colored bishop position that looked very bad at one point. And here against Georg Meyer, he defended this one. So credit to him as well. Well, uh, credit to the entire St. Louis Archbishop team's bishops team, who right now are in complete control of this match, up by a score of five and a half, two and a half at our halftime, so to speak. Two rounds are in the books, and uh, the St. Louis Archbishops are are right now running away with this. The snowballs probably in a team kind of meeting right now, gathering themselves, finding yeah. a way. To, uh, to, to pull maybe their emotions together and not lose sight of the big picture. There's still opportunity, plenty of games left, eight in the match. What would be your advice for them? I mean, at some point, you just have to play for a win, right? Yeah. That's the scary part, because then you start losing your objectivity and you often play worse. Right. But if you're the snowballs and you're saying, I'm down three games, I'm not trying to beat Fabiano. I mean, I would love to beat Fabiano, but that's not really where we're targeting. We need to beat board four. The yeah. fact that Julian Proleko scored half a point is a problem. It's yep. awful for right. the snowballs. And I would say, you know, you're playing well. You just got to keep your composure. You'll get one of those wins. And now's the time for her to try to beat uh, Nicholas Theodoru of right. the Archbishops. Well, Theodoru gets a ton of credit for holding that last end game, despite the fact that it felt like Jorg let it slip. But we will not let any of the big moments slip from you for the rest of the day. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, round three will be getting underway. Don't go anywhere. The Pro Chess League Championship when we return. To the team right there behind the scenes. These guys working so hard. That's 10-0, our production crew. Are in Hawaii. A lot of people who watch chess shows know him. We got the, guy, the guys from Twitch, Michael and Bryce. Michael, so many people work so hard to make this whole event happen, and we're just super thankful. So thank you, guys. Let's go down to Alexandra and see what interview she has on the floor. 
I'm here with the one and only grandmaster, Fabiano Caruana, world number two, hopefully one day world number one. He hasn't lost a single game yet in the Pro Chess League semifinal or final. How do you feel about this perfect score? Can you keep it up? I hope so. Uh, yeah, it's been going like a dream so far, and our team has been doing very well. Uh, I mean, especially so far in this match. Of course, it's still wide open, but uh, everyone's been playing great. So it's going, so going well so far. You guys are very close to clinching the overall Pro Chess League final championship title. When you guys are this ahead, do you have any plan to just try to play a little bit more conservatively to just get the final score you need to win? Uh, not right now, but going into the final round, if, uh, if it's clear that I, I need to play solidly and maybe make a draw, then, then of course I'll do that. But, uh, but I, I still think it's too, too open uh, and there are too many unpredictable results that could happen to, to try to play drawishly or, or very solidly or any different than I, I normally play. Have you ever changed your strategy going into the third round when you still have a final or do you guys just continue to play the same solid chess that you have until now? I, I don't change my style. I don't know about other players, but I, I don't change how I play, no. Do you give any other advice to your teammates to try to play differently, or that's about it? Well, I'm just worried. I mean, I could give advice on how I think a player should play, but that only reflects how I feel I would play. And I, everyone has a different style, so I wouldn't want to uh, tell someone something and then they change the way they play or they overthink uh, their own game, and, and it might not work for them. Like, what, what works for one player won't work for another. So I, I don't want to interfere with anyone else's process. I was talking to one of your teammates earlier, Benjamin Bach, and he was talking about how at some point he looked at Zavin and he could see him over the computer screen when he played an interesting sacrifice. At any point in this new structure, have you been able to maintain eye contact with who you're playing, or has it been very much like playing online when you can't see the person? No, you can sort of feel how your opponent... Uh, I mean, you can't really see them, but sometimes you can see that they're sitting up uh, and maybe... That means that it requires calculation and they're, they're really concentrated or they're leaning back and they, they're either defeated or they're kind of sure that they're going to win. So yeah, you can sort of tell in small ways how your opponent might be feeling. We talked a little bit right before the interview started about how you're looking forward to the new Game of Thrones. Is that how you're going to celebrate if you win today? <laughs> um, I, there was a plan to watch it tonight. I really want to see the, the new episode. Um, but I don't think that's how we'll celebrate. I think that's maybe one thing that will happen tonight and a, a long list of many things that will happen tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much. Going back to you guys in the booth. I mean, what else is going to happen tonight? Yeah, how I, long do you think that That list? was a rabbit hole that opened up. I thought we were going to continue to jump down that thing. Oh, if I were interviewing, I would have made him do it. But, you know, the uh, the rabbit hole is, is, is wide right now for the snowballs, and uh, it's... It's rolling. The snowball is rolling down the hill. How do they? How do they stop the? How do they stop the momentum from continuing to go all the way the bishop's direction? Yeah. <laughs> Fabiano I don't have Caruana to that is question. 2,800 right now. But I, I know I, I think that Fabiano mentioned something that I think was really insightful in regards to whether he gives advice to his teammates. And he said, you know, I, I follow my style and I would yeah. want other people to do theirs. And I think the difficulty at this point in the match for a team like the Snowballs is you've said a lot when you're down this many points, you, you may have to go away from your style. You know, you, you, you are forced out of your comfort zone, whether you like it or not. If you get some big wins, maybe that pays off. But but right now, I think this this next round is is really for the championship. If they don't keep this thing within, within a two-game striking distance, I think the Bishops will have it locked up. And I say that because I, I do think that the Snowballs have last round comeback potential in the matchup, right? The, Ina Agres is going to be favored against Perleko, although Julian seems to be playing well. Yep. Found himself with a half point. So I, I don't think this is out of the woods, but this round here is really critical. Got, got to try to contain Fabiano. Yeah, and actually really did appreciate what he said and we're looking at the uh, results from the past round. Fabiano beat Dimitri uh, Collars again. Benjamin Bach wins against Inna Agrest. Nicholas Theodoro held that draw against Georg Meyer despite probably being in a losing position. Right. And then Julian Proleko, that 
huge upset. Th with those draw. two draws might have just been a win. Might as well have just been a win for St. Louis, right? One of those games might as well have been a full point, and that's a huge upset no matter how you look at it. Absolutely, and that's what contributes to the 5 and F, 2 and F score. You know, if, if they got two wins on those boards, if Donchenko had done what he was supposed to do, and if Meyer had converted that position, they would be at 5 and F, 4 and a half. Right, a, a 4, a 4, oh, uh, sorry. two more a points. 4 and a half, 3 and a half. 4 and a half, 3 and a half, right? It, it would be a two-game difference, I've right? I've been here but all day. Let, let's look at the <laughs> bearings for round. Hey, dude, I'm not, I'm not checking your math, you know. Um, We've got, we've got Fabiano Caruana against Donchenko, who just hasn't had the same mojo going today as he did against the Snowballs. But um, if there's ever a time to find it, it's now, right? I mean, maybe he can return the favor and get a, uh, get a half point off of Fabiano in a way that, the same way that Nicholas Theodoro did um, against him, against Georg Meyer. Sorry, I just got distracted by some on-site gifts here, but we don't need to talk about those. So <laughs> we've got, uh, we've got um, uh, the other round, the other big matchup in this one, I think, is Ina Agres versus Nicholas Theodoro because this is an opportunity for her, I think, much more within a realm of something she might be able to handle, maybe for an upset, and this um, a, big, a big game for her coming up. Yeah, there definitely are chances here for the snowballs, and I just want to track back to what Fabiano said, which I thought was an excellent point, when he said that you know he obviously is a great player and he can help people out with specific chess questions. Right. But stylistically, when you don't match up, it's not actually good to force your chess style on right. somebody else. And as a coach, you know, I've coached the I feel Olympia like you're team. delivering a message to chess coaches of America right now. <laughs> like, you really are. Like, uh, a, a subtle message. No, this is actually, like, it's, it's essential. For example, when I was working at the, uh, at the Olympiad, right. and I don't tell players, you have to play this. Right. I say, what do you want to play? And they'll tell me, and then we'll work through variations together. Right. Sometimes you have to, you know, kind of put your foot down, be like, this variation isn't that good. It's like, not you're good. not playing the French. Yes. <laughs> LOL. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, against a certain opponent, it might not be their wisest choice. Right. But in general, I give them the floor and say, you tell yeah. me what you want, and then I'll right. work with you in those windows. Right. Well, and I think with a guy like Fabiano, who's clearly established what his style of chess is, how the kind of positions he wants, I mean, it's it's something that he should commit to. And But I think it's, it is advice everyone should take to heart for sure. Yeah. So um, I, shout I, out real quick to last year we got um, some gifts that ultimately uh, – Maybe maybe the the mojo really helped um, help the Armenian Eagles go all the way this year. They brought they brought gifts as well. Wait, why did you get the no e six one? Got, I got the no e six one yeah, from, from our talk, the manager, and my face on a on a dollar bill like uh, I got, I like got the Tigran There we go. I'm gonna maybe put something in it. We also we also got some. By we you mean you? Some what is it? It's we, we is it's, I, don't, I don't know what this is. It's music. <laughs> And I'm gonna I'm gonna jam to this later, <laughs> Fabiano. You're invited to this party. <laughs> Put Game of Thrones away, right? We are gonna have an Armenian dance party up in this. So that's the that's the dad bod shuffle right there. Yeah, you're there ready, you ready for the disco. I'm ready for the disco. I'm ready for round three to begin, and uh, we we're having a great time here at the Pro Chess League finals in San Francisco. Uh, the the third round of games are getting set to begin, but before we shoot down to the main to the main area and get the games underway, let's ask our daily question here. Pro Chess, our hashtag on Twitter, please use it, celebrates rapid chess, but we're always wondering what your favorite time control is and uh, in, inadvertent kind of kind of just survey and curious, but let us know. What's your favorite time control to play? I mean, do you still prefer classical, play and watch, rapid, blitz, and bullet? Um, I'm, I'm very much at home here in this why, rapid format. Why is it not re retirement somewhere? Retirement somewhere. No, that, no chess. That, that was the option we chose. That was D, none of the above. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of numbers being thrown there in the Twitch room. Give us your vote. We appreciate that. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look for some of your answers on social media. Uh, if you're on site here, use the hashtag ProChess. Take a selfie, maybe. Get involved. I don't know. The selfie's a thing. Uh, at, at the ProChess, it's like a pelfy. A pelfy. A pelfy. Take, take a pelfy and be healthy. It could be a selfie. <laughs> what? A selfie. A selfie. A selfie. That sounds like a disease I, I had. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we weren't going to talk about that. That's right. It's supposed to stay between us. That's right. Hashtag, you know, some things do come back from Vegas. <laughs> anyway, um, we've got Fabiano Caruana getting ready to play here round three. Someone's got to contain the 2800 from St. Louis. It's not going to be me. Right. <laughs> so, definitely, I mean, you're, you're trying to invite him to listen to Armenian music. You're clearly right. trying to contain him. You're trying to have him unleash his inner disco. Yep. Maniac here. Nicholas Theodoro looking good in that uh, Pro Chess League jersey there. And uh, seems very fun. I mean, he's played well today. He just drew Meyer. Played well all weekend. Yeah, and um, he's had some really, really resourceful saves. So he's yep. actually been, I would say, an underappreciated hero for the yep. St. Louis Archbishops. Yep. 
We've got Alexander Donchenko. Speaking of underappreciated heroes, he was he was uh, really the man of the day yesterday, and right now seems to be struggling a little bit to find to find that magic. But uh, never never a better opportunity than against the top board for the opposing team. Right, an upset here would go a long way. Yep. And then there's the uh, the guy on top of it all. Yesterday, the Shangdu Pandas met their end at the blitz hand of Georg Meyer. He would love an opportunity to do that again. At this point, given that they're down three games, he would love to send this thing to an overtime tiebreaker for sure. Yeah, it's going to be a tough task for the Snowballs, but we see two of their best players, Meyer, Donchenko. And Donchenko has played some excellent chess this weekend, but yep. you have to be kind of kicking yourself when you're playing the board four. Not your computer. Don't kick uh, your computer. Don't, that's already been done. Apparently. Just yourself. That's right. <laughs> um, but... Uh, and then we have the full shot there. The players getting set for their headphones. I'm not sure which games are, are going to begin first, but we've got Ina and Nicholas, Julian, throwing the headphones on, hoping to continue the ship of, of not losing, um, which that sounds like kind of a joke, and we don't mean it that way. Obviously, it's very difficult for the board fours on either of these teams. You're playing grandmaster after grandmaster, and so any result is a big result. And uh, we've got our first Mike Comer emote in the chat there from Face Chess. Shout out to Face Chess for the bits we saw earlier. We've had a lot of people here throwing love our way, and we just—it's just been awesome. This is like, this is just—it's been a—it's been four months. It's been a long season, right? It all comes down to this match right here. It's not over yet, but uh, but the archbishops are are trying to make it over. They're trying to—they're trying to end everyone's PCL season right here in this round. So. Yep. Um, Worst thing that could happen for the Snowballs is be down by four games before the last round even begins. And uh, Bach, Bach is going to try to help that be the case. I have an interesting question for Mike Klein. Hopefully he's watching this, our you know journalist. Is it the first time all season when players of the same exact rating have played each other? I'm going to guess no, okay. because we just have so many players from all around the world. But um, that is a stat boy worthy of his hasks, though. I'm You're right. I just thought of it. I was like, super curious. And... I feel like that's your way secretly for picking on people who like baseball and obsessive <laughs> over stats that don't matter. You know, I saw Mike yesterday. He was on his uh, app doing his fantasy baseball. Yep. And I was just, no, <laughs> no, just go away. But in this game here, Georg Meyer is the white pieces, and of course he has Fien Kettered his bishop to G2. And typical Georg just going for the long game. Yep. He's not trying to force matters. He's not playing any sort of intense theory. He just is going with what he feels comfortable with. And, you know, you ask, what do you do when you're down three games in a match and you're playing someone who's your exact strength? Well, you just go to the weapons right. that you feel that you know the best and just well, play and from I, there. I think that this is the last round where they can, they can really stay true to themselves, their style, without a panic button yet, right? I mean, the, they're down three games, but mathematically it's not over for a reason. So you have to stay true to your game plan, stay true to the style and the openings you know best. Don't... Put your, don't beat yourself at this point. Stay true to your school. Stay true to your, um, your heart or what? You, you, no, never mind. Bishop to e7 was played there. I do stay, stay true to my heart though. By, that's why, that's why I'm Bach. sitting next to you doing yep. commentary at the Pro Chess League Finals. Listen to your heart. Oh gosh, there you, you did go. that? I yeah. did it. I did it. Um, bishop, bishop to e7 is played, and one of the ideas here for Black is. After getting castled, you will see a, a change in the structure, either e5 or c5. Probably e5 if you can get away with it. You're trying to fight a little bit for some of these critical squares. Um, White's just a little better here. Uh, kind of typical in a position like this. He wants to play queen d2, bring a rook to the d-file. Georg, even though he is sticking to his style, is definitely going to be feeling the pressure to get a win here, right? Because right. when you move back to having the black pieces against Fabiano Caruana, you're not... It's not everyone's you – don't, you don't fantasize about playing the black pieces against Fabiano Caruana. No, you don't. And right now, knight h4 happened, so he's going after the bishop pair. Yep. And this is just typical Georg. Yep. The, going for the two bishops, the advantage – look at that bishop on g2, by the way. Yep. At some point, you might want to play b4, b5, and get that bishop going. But for now, you can just secure the bishop pair with knight takes g6. Um, you don't have to. You can leave it there for well a long time because right. that bishop's not going anywhere. But you do want to play rook b1 at some moment, and that's why knight g6 is played. And I think we will see a rook b1 or an a3 first. Partly the idea, yeah, you're saying. Even though the bishop wasn't going anywhere, it made more sense for me to be able to launch this queenside plan, you're saying. Exactly. And there may have also been some tactics you have to be careful about at some point um, on, on the loose knight on h4. So makes sense, I guess. Meyer just happily takes his bishop pair home. 
puts the lady on c2. The rooks will go to b1 and d1. And and this is going to be a position that Yorick has good winning chances in. I mean, this feels very comfortable as an edge for white. Yeah, and, and he's just so used to these positions. So he's going to be hanging out in this position, just taking his time. He's been taking his time on the clock as well. Well, we're going to jump over to the other game that just began. We've got Julian Proleko going back to his system we've seen a couple times, kind of a London Kali Tory stuff. Seems to be something that he likes um, with the white pieces. Kolar's also in need of getting a big win. Absolutely. Um, time to strike if you are the snowballs. And I I know it's it's our job to think that way too, and there's always the potential to come back, but I really do think that there this is not over. I, I think that um, the pairings... Other than the fact that Fabiano is a nightmare every round, no matter who he plays, I feel like the pairings get better for the snowballs the later in this match. Yeah, um, and Donchenko beat both Li Chao and Wang Yue yesterday, right. so he's becoming accustomed to beating players in the 2,700-plus category. Right. And I, I want to point out something about styles. Is I think that actually uh, Dimitri Kolars is a bad opponent for Proleko. Okay. Because when, you're, when you have the white pieces and you're playing a system like this, which is like super calm, you kind of want to play someone who's also a very solid player so that if you play your best chess, you can just hold the draw. But when right. you play someone with like a frantic style or someone who's right. willing to get down in the, in the region and, and just fight you mm -hmm. tooth and nail, like Dimitri, I think it actually really helps the Grandmaster when you have these right. different stylistic matchups. Yeah, we'll see. I guess the devil's advocate point of view to that would be if it becomes a position that uh, Proleko is comfortable in, then, you know, uh, someone who's going to mix it up with you dynamically may also risk blundering themselves, right? So we'll see. We'll see what the tactics of this game have in store for us. Uh, Bishop F4 now played. This is a, a very early expansion of the queenside pawn structure. And part of the idea of this, everybody, is if you can get the c5 pawn to blink, like get it to make a trade, get it to make a push, which you would never want to do. But let's say you get this pawn to release the tension. Now you're just never really worried about the structure getting undermined anymore. And you, you're, you're free reign to do the typical Tory plan. Put a knight on e5, right, bishop on d3, bring the other knight to the queenside. If you like it, you might even put a queen on it over here. Right, nice. get, get the mating attack going. So, I mean, this is this is a this is the dream world. If you're wondering what this structure wants, it wants a knight, a bishop, everybody to join the party, right? And uh, love the arrows. That's what White's looking for there. Yeah, sometimes I go full Hikaru, <laughs> half Hikaru, right? But you're absolutely right. I mean, you have a nice space for White. You've got control of the e5 square. The bishop yep. on f4 is a great piece. And, and notice Dimitri is, is doing the opposite here because what to flip the script on that point of view. What Kalars wants is for white to blink first, right? Yep. You want white to start making trades because any sort of thing like this would completely destroy white's grip of the center and leave you with a bunch of positional weaknesses to show for it. So um, just pointing out kind of the battle right there on the queen side. And so, so if all the pawns are staring each other down, what do you do next? Well, you build that tension. You bring more pieces into the fold and just try to try to increase the pressure. Maybe you even play bishop e6 and e5, right? This is the idea you want as black to not let white use the dark square grip. Yeah, and you already have to do something because a, a takes b4 is a pretty deadly threat winning material. Yep, that okay. would be a pin emote in action. Yeah, so I guess, but if you go, okay, he took and he c5. So, so I like this from Kolars, right? We highlighted you want to maintain the tension, but Dimitri kind of wins the first little Kevin Bacon shoe caught in a tractor <laughs> game of chicken. Yeah, he won the stare down there, that's for sure. Yep. Somebody now owes me $100 for naturally working a footloose reference yep. into the chess show. I Who's that somebody, though? He's downstairs. Okay. His name's Ryan. Ryan? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay, Ryan. Yeah, that's right, Ryan. You <laughs> can see that coming. All right. Ooh, G4 emote. If you're a subscriber to my channel, use that G4 emote just for me. Just to show that there's one of you out there. This, this line is actually super interesting and very dangerous for black. Yep. Because let's just show why you don't take on G4. Let's do it. If you take on G4, you're going to get rook G1. Uh, Sorry. I hit the wrong one. Knight G4, rook G1. You and just then, got rook G1. I exactly. love that. Exactly. <laughs> and, and my rook is about to land on G7. Yep. And once it lands on G7, F7 feels right. not so good. Yep. So that's why you can't just – it's not a free pawn. It's a – it's a, not even a sacrifice. So it's a poison pawn if you take it. And, but it also, this is very similar to the structure we talked about in the last game. Uh, oh, sorry, the last uh, game that Fabiano played yesterday. Anna and I had the call against uh, the Armenia Eagles. Fabiano was black in a similar kind of plan of these double king pawns where you, you really advance aggressively over here on the, uh, on the king side. So white doing that right now with, uh, with g4, trying to play g5. 
Okay, the risk is you know it's it's a very double-edged system. In fact, this is this is actually the line I showed. I just this is the two this is the four knights idea I showed on the board when we said this this idea can happen, highlighting that this H6 G5 is a more modern kind of engine approach to some of these double king pawns. You don't see this in the old school classical four Definitely knights games. Not. And and Fabiano went for an H6 G5, and I said one of the lines this commonly occurs in is in the four knights for white, and that's exactly what we now have on the board. Um, and uh, okay, th this is going to be a sharp one for sure. You know that Alejandro Ramirez is smiling downstairs because he coaches Nicholas Theodoro and well, look at the time advantage. Right. He's clearly in his element. He chose this uh, opening for a reason, going for a tactical game rather than a slow positional buildup. And I honestly think this is the type of position that does give Black good chances to fight for a win. It's not just some dry technical position. We're in the middle of a sharp battle where well, you went G4. Yep. So what are you gonna do with your king? You would love to go d3, bishop e3, whatever, castle, queenside. But at some point, time. it's going to take a while to do that. And when your opponent attacks you, you also want to strike in the center. So a move like b4 is always going to be tempting. And I'm sure that's what Ina is calculating. Can I go b4 and try to take this e4 pawn? Right. These positions get super wild and crazy, right? This, yeah. the, this stuff gets nutty and, and very after, fast. Yeah, after b4, maybe is there some g5? Like, there's all these different options that, um, that come to mind. But, yep. All right, well, we'll obviously keep an eye on this one. Our fourth game and the big matchup of the day just got underway with Alexander Donchenko playing D4 on move one. We are quickly heading into a G3 Catalan system. Donchenko doing his best impersonation, perhaps, of, of his leader, Georg Meyer. But after C5, Fabiano inviting potentially a G3 Bononi structure. So uh, look at look at Fabi being Whoa, more than prepared, <laughs> showing so his showing his blitz prowess right now. Caruana saying, "You know, I got a little Hikaru in me." I honestly would not be surprised if there was an upset in this game. Really? I'm going on a limb here. Well, that that's quite the limb. You have not you have not uh, climbed that far out, and you know. Well, since last night. But <laughs> what we've got here is a uh, eye tracker of Fabiano Caruana sitting here considering the typical plans in the Benoni. You see focuses on playing for the B5 push. Uh, obviously, you're considering knight BD7 in a lot of lines, but you have to be worried about the D6 pawn, which is why you play G5. And look at, look at the intensity from Fabiano. That is a local capture and view of Caruana. We see not only is he playing G5, but he practically pre-moved the bishop to F5 super focused and face chest coming through with the super cheer wow thank you so much thank you so much for your support face chess not just today but for the entire chess community we we appreciate it yeah and this i mean i'm watching i was silent for a second i'm watching the eye tracker going look at h4 g4 so anticipating his opponent's moves and replying very quickly yeah but this is one of those really double-edged positions where look at black's king side You've exposed your pawn on h6, so you need your king on h7 to protect it. But you've kicked this knight back to e1, mm -hmm. so you've gained some important space. The e4 square is under your control, or is it? Because if I go e4 right. at the right moment, with your king on h7, there could be some pins that you have to keep an eye on. So uh, knight c2 is a move that I would certainly consider. Knight c2, knight e3, knight c4. Just improve the location of my knight, from, and there it goes. And he goes for it. And then play a5. Go for the clamp. Yep. I like White's position. I love White's position. Again, it's just I'm suffering from a little bit of Fabiano-itis right now, right? Well, I have a hard time believing he's going to lose because of who he is, despite the fact that what I see on the board is a, is a good Bononi for White. I agree. And this is a very – you talk about how committal – I mean, this is – Black has already played a whole lot of moves that he's going to wish he could take back if it doesn't work out, right? Yep. Um, and uh, we see the eye tracker showing that Fabiano is aware of that. He wants to reorganize, puts the bishop on g6. He's considering ideas of moving this knight which will both open this bishop and maybe... I mean, I, oh, but now... now I, I just this, really like White's position. Yeah, and, and you may be right. Maybe you called it in the sense that this is a, uh, a potential for an upset. And, and like we said, if you're ever going to write the ship, if you're going to write the ship today, Donchenko, this is the game, right? Yeah, beating Fabiano sounds like a pretty uh, good thing to do. Right. And it's worth pointing out that, well, the G4 pawn needs defense, but knight e4, this is a tactic with pawn to h5, distracting your pieces and saying you are not going to get knight e4, which is often a thematic way. It doesn't work for many reasons, but I can distract your bishop with a pawn sacrifice. Yep. Over Overloading the bishop and then ultimately winning a piece there. Note that there's no kind of inner mizzo because you take here with Chekaruski mm -hmm. on the king. So... Uh, people in the Chess.com TV chat, Diamond members, calling it the Spy Tracker instead of the Eye Tracker. I kind of like that. 
We yeah. got the spy tracker because we get to see Cause both I, their eyes and then a, and then a spy into their into their thought process. I spy right there for you. Right. Fabi spies with his little eye. Uh, well, a pretty bad baloney. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're going to come back to that in a minute. Let's go back to a game that's moving Whoa. along very very quickly. Georg Meyer is uh, well. This is this is an aggressive kind of game and not something we see Georg play every day. I'm not sure that I really like it. Yes, King looks very exposed, yeah. but it's hard to actually attack it. So you can play Rook F3, King G2, something like that, but Black can also just swing that Rook to D8 and just hang out. Say, I'm I'm here in San Francisco, I'm having a good time, and that's why Rook D1 is played to stop Rook D8, but it doesn't really stop it. You can still play Rook D8. Yeah, transition. And I don't see how Black can be worse. Yeah, it's amazing uh, that if if you do have an upset on board board two versus board one the other way, you really don't want to uh, fall fall prey to that if you're Georg Meyer. But, okay, a draw is not necessarily an upset. On paper, these guys literally have the same rating. <laughs> but in terms of the, the match overall position, Georg Meyer being white, um, you... Uh, you really hoped, as a snowball fan, that he might he might have winning chances in this one. But okay, let's uh, let's keep bouncing around. Back to Nicholas Theodoro's game with Ina Agrest. I like the way that Ina handled that, honestly. Yep, she got rid of a queenside right. B pawn for that G pawn. And that knight on C6 might go to E7 and over to G6. Yep. And this is this is how these G4 aggressive lines can backfire, right? And maybe some of the classical masters of old had it right, saying, "Put that emote away." Don't subscribe to Danny's channel and they don't play and don't play G4. They definitely said that. Oh, yeah, look at this A5 did. move. It's getting your well, isolated like, weak pawn off a right. square. And if A4 is played, you have Bishop A6. Yep. That is a diagonal, and I'm happy to see you. Um, Honestly, I, I like I said, I think Ina has good chances to uh, muddy the waters here. She can complicate the position for sure. 97 G6 is one idea I mentioned. Bishop yep. A6 that we're talking about. Uh, you can. Do you, whether or not you want to castle kingside is up for some debate, but maybe you want to play g5, yeah, and just gain space over there on the king side. G5, the knight ultimately rests behind the pawn, right, overwhelming a square like, like f4. I mean, I, I like Ina's position here. Bishop c4 played by Theodora to stop this idea of bishop a6, but already making me feel more and more like, uh, like Ina has has a decent position here. She's down three minutes on the clock, and that's been a storyline, unfortunately, that's been repeating uh, for Ina, but maybe she can speed up and, and keep it close. Uh, one of the games, again, we haven't looked at since the first few moves of the opening, Julian Proleko versus Dimitri Kolars. Um, okay, I mean, honestly, very, very equal-looking position. I think Proleko is continuing to hold his own. Yeah, the A4 pawn is weaker than the A5 yeah, pawn, which is why I would prefer to black here. But the white knights are going to be pretty active. You can throw one to d6. You can play knight e5 here. Um, but I'm, I'm worried about that a4 pawn. I really am. Yeah, and, and uh, it's a good point because if this knight falls back, you may just not be able to defend it. Yeah, you, and even yeah. if you lose the pawn, white is still fighting, of course. But you don't yeah. want to go down a pawn against Dimitri Kolars. The kid has also picked up his space. I keep calling him the kid. I don't know why, um, but uh, we do have a younger player than him in the finals weekend here in San Francisco, Zhang Di, who, by the way, really was the hero for the Xiangdu Pandas earlier in our consolation match. If you missed it, definitely spend some time. Check out the VOD and the highlights there. was a was actually a thriller between last year's championship, Xiangdu Pandas and Armenia Eagles, the Pandas ultimately edging out the Eagles by one game um, to, to win third place, the bronze medal here. Rook D1. Big problem is the queen has nowhere to move. I guess you can go to E7, but I was thinking you couldn't go to B7 because knight D6 tactics. I like that move, yeah. though. Not only just because the bishop pair. Knight C3 is a winning tactic. Knight, knight C3 is, is being threatened on the board. For example, bishop H2. If you, you, for example, bishop knight H2. H2. Knight C3, knight D. Oh, it doesn't matter. but The point is you're winning the queen with check, everybody. Yep. Check is better than not checking. Like, just in case you're wondering. Checks are better than not checking. You're welcome. Now you can move the queen to unpin the knight. It still just feels very natural. Put the queen on b7 or something, and, and you even can play f6 at e5. Feels like black is, right? Definitely making Col progress Kolar there. strong here. Um, all right, I want to go back to the kind of the big featured matchup here. Fabiano Caruana and Alexander Donchenko. We had Fabiano Caruana's eye tracker on earlier, and I'm not sure that much would have changed about what he's looking at, which is kind of a bad king side. And, man, this really has upset all over it. Look at this. And who called it? You did. Yeah. Hey. I, I, I really don't like Black's position. And 
one of the reasons, like, let's say after knight takes e4 here. Yep. I'll take with my bishop. And you want me as black to take your bishop on g6. Because then you'll take with the f pawn and yep. your f5 is really better. But if you take on e4, then I'm taking back with my rook. And now my rook can go to f4. My queen can go to c2. And I'm throwing everything on f5. Yeah. And the kitchen sink. No, I mean, this is this may have been a game where Fabiano stepped a little too far in, in regards to um, caution to the wind, I guess. You know, if he if he wasn't relying on prep and Donchenko didn't seem to have his A game going today, there we see Fabiano very tense and leaning up in his seat. He was interviewed by Alexander Botez right before this round started. Yeah, she was asking him about that. Like, yeah, you... about the what can you do differently in this format that you don't do over the board? You're not always looking into your opponent's eyes. Um, but he said you can tell by, by how the, your opponent feels about the position by their body language, how they're sitting in their chair, right? You can see the top of their fro just over the monitor. We got the Fabi cam, right? Queen C2. Queen C2 protects the rook on A4, puts more pressure on that diagonal, stops black from playing F5, which might someday be an idea. Yeah, Queen C2 just feels like an automatic move. Yeah, I don't Dunchenko, know what... Donchenko plays it. I don't know what took... I mean, there's not really... Much else to do. I guess Bishop takes g6 is always a consideration. Yeah, Donchenko's a very deliberate player, right? Anyway, he just has a pace that he likes, um, and you, we can see that in terms of when we watch him. He just he, his uh, his body language seems the same. And I think yesterday when he was in his zone, oh, he's kind of just double checking. That's what, he doesn't like a lot of instant moves. Some more games continuing on. Looks like we're actually about to have a result as we quickly go to the game between Georg Meyer and Benjamin Buck. Bach, they actually just finished with a perpetual. Not not the best result for the snowballs. Um, no, but I'm starting. Look at Fabiano's position just happened. So Bishop F5 was played. And then Queen to B5, yes. hitting the E2 pawn. Yep. So was I overestimating White's position? Because I think the Benoni is structurally very dubious. Maybe. Possibly. But I don't I don't know that um, I still like White's you're position. wrong. I mean, I still like White's position too. I mean... Looks like Fabiano found a way to kind of to kind of freeze the f5 square, right? Uh, as you pointed out, White doesn't really want to take here and fix the structure, but you know Fabiano has kind of made that hard. But even if that happens, I think it's still a dangerous position. For I would Black. go knight g2 right now. Knight g2 and working into f4. Yep. What's funny about the knight in f4 is you'd actually be threatening a pinny mode on h5, right? Yeah. And because the bishop can't take it. And a lot of pressure on g6. So you're throwing bishop takes e5, removing the guard of right. The Take on e5, take everything on g6, and deliver checkmate. I mean, knight g2 looks like a good move to me. Donchenko, real focus. We've got a young man on the jumbotron there, looking at himself there. You can tell he's like, "Yo, what's up? I'm on the jumbotron, right?" Yep. And he, he he's chilling, but Donchenko is really like, and we got he looks people pain. waving, right? Give me a dab if you can hear me. I don't know if you can hear me. We've learned, we've 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 come to realize that the the house is super packed downstairs. We actually sold a lot of tickets here to this event. Huge, huge props to everybody that came out and showed up. And I don't know what our final number was, but it was almost almost an official sellout. And uh, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's apparently hard to hear us down there. So, Oh, well, that's better for them, right? Yeah. But yeah, here at Night G2, I mean, Night G2 just feels right. Come on, Don Feels Jango. right. I mean, I'm not rooting for him, but I I like his position, right? And IG2 just feels good. Yep. He doesn't play it. He plays rook a1, continuing to just sort of sit on the pressure. I, I don't really mind that move, Robert, because it does free up the queen, right? It says, hey, I'm not worried about tactics anymore. The rook is now overprotected. I'm able to keep it on the fourth rank. And I can get back to knight g2 later, because what does Fabiano do? Let's ask, what, what, are, what are Black's plans here? Don't know. Normally, yep. I ask you that question, so yep. I'm not used to being asked the question. And I certainly am not now aware. Now who's the coach? Yeah. So if you have rook C to E7, for example, it's like, what are you threatening? Yeah, your rook's on E7, great, but what next? I still can go knight G2 to F4. I really like this knight G2 F4 idea. I don't know if you could tell. Yeah. There's still, oops, there's still no way to really stop it. People in the chest of each chat asking if we have a kiss cam on the Jumbotron. We do not have that. Maybe no. someday someone will propose, though. On, would, a, on that, a pro chess league jumbotron. That would be super adorable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this game is quite tense. We saw Dimitri Kolar's uh, game earlier. Looked pretty good for him. If I was okay, Bishop. 
So now knight g2 still. You're like forcing me to play knight g2. Yep. Bishop, bishop h6 forces knight g2, but it also kind of stops knight f4 in terms of the trade. Oh, I, I would trade there. If I'm I white. guess that's true. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I, I would love to bring that pawn here. Uh, yeah, the pawn made the rook. Absolutely. I don't even know what, but I'm getting right. In, there it is. Yeah. I'm worried for Black's position here. Well, the main thing for Donchenko, I think, will be keeping up on the clock, not trying to go into perfectionist mode, which people can do when you're playing a 2800, right? You get nervous, you start, you start feeling that, like, oh, I might win this game, right? So then you overthink it and then end up not winning it, right? So as long as you keep a tempo, don't get yourself under time pressure, I think you're going to be are, in good shape in this game. Are you telling him to game. keep up with the clock dashians? Keep up with the clock dashians, that's right. I um, cringed myself. That, I, you know, sometimes... It's like yesterday when I when I did the obligatory May the Fourth be with all our players today. Yeah. It hurt when it came out of my lips. Yeah. Right. A part of me died inside. But hey, shout out to all the Star Wars fans who caught that reference. Um, what is happening in this game? This is. I mean, Theodoro's playing super aggressive, which I I, I think is is proving a practical uh, plus because of the time pressure he's putting Ina under. But I don't I don't know that I'm thrilled about White's position at all. Yeah. I mean, this is like super. Super double edge. You're creating a situation where this king will have no home, right? And actually, you can even take on f4 because bishop d4, I have queen h4 check. Yeah, if takes, we get shake and bake, and actually, black loses no material. Can even play rook g8 and is probably fine. So, I mean, better even. Okay, so she doesn't do it. She plays d6. I see a future for that bishop on b7, and it might be on c8. She's focused, zoned in. This is her opportunity. One moment. Don't lose it. In the music, the moment. Right. Don't ever let it go. You can lose yourself, but not your chess game. That's true. Also, ooh, look, E5's coming for Dimitri Kolars to go in E5, Knight C4. Honestly, these, <laughs> I'm liking the Snowball's games in this round. I know. And, and again, I think, I think even a round that gets it a little closer, I, I meant what I said. And, again, it's, like, hard because I feel like sometimes people just assume we're, you know, providing fodder for the crowd or pretend it's close. I legitimately think the pairings favor the snowball the longer as this match goes on. Meyer, Meyer doesn't seem to have his A game there right now for the uh, on board one for the snowballs, but even if he holds a draw against Fabiano in the last round, that's going to be considered a successful result. Um, and, uh, and I think Kolars and Donchenko, I mean, who knows, right? Yeah, but I feel like Benjamin Bach is a really tough pe person to beat. Like he is a good chess player. And, of course, yep. everyone here is a good chess player. But in particular, I feel like he's been really solid. And he, one of my favorite games of the entire Pro Chess League season was his win over Zavin yesterday. A really instructive, fine performance. Yep. yep. Julian Proleko, head bobbin. So, yeah, I was going to say, why not E5? Knight C4 coming? Knight B3 is going to be an option as well. Yeah. He's, Look at he's, those light square control. The queen on F7 is so good. I was gonna say, I think he's bobbing his head to the to the sound to the music, but not not to the love of his position, unless he sees something we don't, because well, this queen side is about to become a real hurt for White. Knight of five. If you go knight c four, I'll go ninety seven check. Oh, you would. I would. You would. By the way, you're probably still worse in the end game. I, I'm not doubting that, but at least I'm trading off some right. pieces. Right. I mean, d three, d three. It was yeah, it so, was overwhelming. So yeah, I, it, it is a. Uh, it is a nice tactic, but e5, like we said, freeing up the c4 score. I think that probably Kolarz doesn't go for that because because why allow this? But but Black is probably choosing between his uh, his favorite flavor here. It's the Baskin Robbins of chess positions. Put the king on f8 even to guard e7. Why not? Then knight c4. What you think? I don't really want to put my king on f8, but it's probably not that bad. But I yeah, it's something like king on f8 just always feels a little risky. The queen can go b5 eventually and cause some problems. And, whoa. Okay, the Fabi game has changed a lot. Wow, wow, wow. Bow wow? Lil, lil bow wow. Um, How lil? Uh, uh, the kind that you misspell, L-I-L. Um, C4. Oh, the D5 pawn I don't think we saw that coming. Well, I thought C4 would always allow rook B4, but if the D5 pawn is yeah, falling, then... and that was one of the key points to bishop H6, removing the knight from E3. So it turns out... We had some baloneyitis, right? We didn't like the Bononi. Maybe we were a little more biased against Fabiano's position, but it turns out this this maybe maybe was harder for White to fully coordinate than we realized. And uh, the fact that he had to he had to go for this sort of transition. Yes, C4 is weak, but it already feels like Black has seen the worst of it. Well, that C4 pawn is real weak, and I'm not sure how you're going to keep it. So I, I still like White's position. 
I like White's position at the very least not to lose, which is already, as we said, like a step in the right direction. Yeah. You can, even if you can't stop him, you can contain him by getting a draw, and that would be a successful result. As uh, you know, Greg Shahadi, the commissioner, said in his interview, he said, you know, for the snowballs to win, they can't let Fabiano go 4-0. I mean, that's for sure. Right. They've, they've got to they've got to get some points on the board there. But Fabi, being the beast that he is, is not going to be tamed by the commissioner's words. That's right. Take that, Greg. Knight to B3. He even told me he likes Roger Goodell more than Greg Shahadi. Oh, man. Those are <laughs> fighting words right there. Them's be fighting words, man. Yeah, I can't can't say that with a straight face. Okay, so C3 <laughs> Knight is under attack. Maybe Queen A6. I'm always just trying to get active. Yeah, but these knights are creeping. Knights be creeping, yo. If the queen comes to G4, this could get weird. It's, it's already getting weird. I mean, weird. Kolar's is... Can you take A4? He's thinking about it, but you got to be worried. Oh, knight queen, D6. I mean, no, I'm going to go knight queen G4 right away. Oh, that, that, my rook's hanging and there, now too. And now I'm winning all kinds of stuff. Yeah. You're not wrong. Threatening knight takes H6, I know. And, and when I'm not wrong, it feels right. And, yeah. If I've, commentating with you is wrong, I, I don't want to be right. I knew. I was trying to go That's there. Right. So, the... Uh, the move knight to e4, some things are turning around. And, and the biggest shocker has been the confidence that Proleko has played with. Because look at the time management. Yep. He's, he's not only doing fine on the board and really every game this round. Let's remember that Georg Meyer barely escaped the kid. Mm -hmm. Right? That's just been a, that has just been a, a sign of, of, of things for the bishops. Queen g6 is a good move because there's no 97 check. Your yep. bishop covers that square. Otherwise, very, that'd very be key. a huge family fork. Fork and emote. A fork and emote. And... Um, that's actually a really good move. Yeah, Queen G6 actually just solved all the problems in one. <laughs> it steps out of that's the That's the life though. of a chess commentator. It's our job to get excited, but we can't calculate as deeply as them. Queen G6 looks like it might have just saved black. But back to the game with Ina Agrest. The king did ultimately end up on E2. I think Ina is playing well. Look at the time, getting much closer here yep. to equal. That's a huge step in the right di direction for the snowball board four. Absolutely. If the queens get traded, that bishop can go to g5 and try to take over the dark squares. Because if you ever take on g5, hg5, the h2 pawn feels weak. Yep. I'm, I'm feeling her position. I'm liking her position as well. Again, time pressure is going to be key. How she handles herself in it, if she can avoid being the first one under it, right? Uh, we've got... Uh, okay, no moves here. Back to the game. Donchenko working hard to corral oh, that c He's getting it. He's getting it because he's got, he's got B4 coming. You want to go rook C5, rook C7, but B4 attacks your rook with tempo, and then I win this uh, right. C3 pawn. It happens too fast. Wait, actually, okay, it was rook F7 going after the F2, but you can't get to the F2 pawn. There's no rook F3. Rook F3. Is he really going to go rook F3? He's going to go full rook F3 on you. Wow. Can I go E5 somehow? That would be a killer move because what would happen, everybody, is if something like this happens, not only can you not take C3, but if you do this, now you can't deal with the mate on the light squares and the rushing of the C pawn at the same time. Yeah, that would be... Right? That would be immediately losing. But can, I'm trying to figure out if you go E5. I don't know if it actually works well enough, but I, I'm trying to like distract your rook from C7. I don't think I get there in time. Well, you may have to create a passer to compete with the C pawn in terms of counterplay, right? You got a, a baby girl, Clara Cottontail, over here on C1, <laughs> along with uh, Daryl. Yeah, that, but the deep one's not not going to be as fast. Not running fast enough. Wow. Rook F7, F3. Rook F7 what? is a strong move. What we'll, concept? We'll, we'll see. Okay, the queens are off in the game with Augrist and Theodoro. And uh, Proleko has. What? Uh, He's gotten a rook to the seventh rank. Oh my god, Bishop F8, Rook takes G7, check. Only a minute on the clock for Kalars. Bishop F8, Rook G7 this check. Is, this will be a result that the that the bishops uh, would it would be everything that they ever wanted. A single win. Thank you, Face Chess, for all the love. We love you, buddy. Um, I, I don't even know what to say right now. If this if this upset happens, then as Mike Cummer said yesterday, get your Mike Cummer emotes out, subscribers to the Chess Channel. The manager said, "You'll see." Those were his final words. We said, why do you bring Julia Proleku, who hasn't played a game in the Pro Chess League all season long? And he said, you'll see. Look at that. He just took back on B2. Could have won Rook takes G7 check. He said, I'll do that next move. Your 9 on B3 is hanging here. This is mature chess right now. Yeah. And we're, we're at a PG wow. audience here. No, I mean, this is these are some <laughs> adult moves, right? I didn't get the memo on this. Cover your eyes, kids. Yeah, but is the A-pawn going to be good compensation? That's the essential question. So the well, we're going to find out. Queen, an extra wait, wait. queen for Perleko right Rook now. Rook C1 check. 
-hmm. And then rook to a1 is a funny little thing. But maybe just, I rook just a8. don't buy it. I feel like this king will get mated. All this queen needs is one diagonal, and she will have herself a mating net. Yeah, I actually would have went rook a8 instead, just try to protect the pawn from behind. I, I think this is over. I think this is the upset that may end up clinching the match ultimately for the bishops. I mean, this is absolutely huge. Now, games like this, Ina Agres against Theodora become must win suddenly. Yeah, and, I mean... Fabiano Caruana has sacrificed the F-pawn for counterplay against Donchenko's king. Wow, that king is on F3 and just hanging out there. So B4 is going to be some rook F7 check, queen G4. And maybe that king will be hunted down. Yeah. I'm actually not sure it is, though. Most dangerous game. So, like, if you go B4 here, just run away. Run, Flores. Takes in C3. Uh, it's, yeah. There's some rook C7 check. I, get, I escape. If you go to H6, Queen I get C1. the queens off the board. Yeah. Okay, it would be crazy. We have a lot of noise being made about the Julian Proleco game. Yeah. You can hear Mike Cummer. And I can hear Alejandro Ramirez. Alejandro Ramirez getting excited. Hondi letting his uh, letting his cheers. I also letting his so glow these days with the fro. So is that pawn going to be able to be pushed? Queen b6 hits that bishop, and that looks other than rook b7. So like barely holding on to, I mean, the position is, just, is losing for black. But you have all these little tricks to help you yep. hold on. No, but I mean, this has been quite the game, quite the turnaround here for Julian Proleco. Day one to day two at the Pro Chess League finals here in San Francisco. He goes 0-4 on day on day one, and has has nearly had a, had a had a point in every game today. Yep. Um, Georg Meyer had a great position against. Then he drew Alexander Donchenko Wait, in the last round, and this, he might be about to win. No, but this a pawn's getting scary now against Kolars. Yeah, because the king's is, running away. You know, this reminds me of. The game I lost to and I bought at the Rapid at the Mechanics Institute. <laughs> I had I had an extra queen yeah. and a position that felt totally <laughs> winning, and it was very, I I ended up losing some position where the king ran up the board and a queen a queen was there. But okay, like my game with Vanai, I'm sure White should be winning with the extra queen. But right. but okay. Oh, look at that pin. Knight takes before comes winning that rook. The threat is 97 as well, and it's it's Stop almost both over. One. But, but now e5 is hanging. Take e5. Take e5, then rook and, it's, c5. and it's going to be over. Then rook c5. There's actually annoying counterplay like in every single move here. And look at the clock series. 50 seconds for white now. You get, start getting nervous, start getting time trouble. That's how you botch winning positions. Yep. He goes 97. Oh, he take miss, it. Bishop takes? Oh, no. I wonder knight, if he knight missed before? that. Knight before or rook c5. Oh, knight c5. Why not? The, knight, the knights defend the king so well in these a3. positions, everyone. Oh, no. This is getting... Oh no! Super tricky. Yeah, rook a6 is the e you put the rook behind the pawn. The queen's stuck. He's well, gonna have to play queen a2, but then the knight comes in d3. Oh my gosh! Well, why move the king in first? Because he, he probably wants to win like knight a4, knight, knight c3. c3. Okay, I thought knight d3, knight b4. That also is definitely an option. Okay, so he goes for this way. There's gonna be checks on the king, but the problem is, knight will it be enough? Wait, knight, knight c3? c3, and there's no more checks king after b3. king b3. Oh my gosh! This is a, this is exactly oh how I lost to Benai. Yeah, Julian, break the curse. Oh my gosh, a two a one. How do you stop it? I don't see any way to stop it. Oh, and g four saying with check two, and that's a really important pawn, obviously. Wow, absolutely. Oh my nuts. gosh, Kolar is gonna win. Oh, he's so frust frustrated right now. He's flustered. Yeah, I mean, how can you not be right? This went from a completely winning position to one that you sort of accidentally. Got swindled, right? The king rocks up the board. We're going to stay right on it. I was just, I had to look at the other game. Oh, gosh, there's no Queen more checks. G6, king C1, you're out of checks. King we C1. Have a, we have a baby girl, Anna. Welcome to the show on A1. Oh, my gosh. That is the that epic is turnaround. That is absolutely nuts game. If this ends up helping propel a comeback for the snowballs, we will remember what the moment of the match was right here. And Amazing. It, it's over. It's over. Yeah. Just Wow, oh. bananas, right? We have a we have a queen, a king that and just And what a well played game by Julian Paleco. And you know Seriously. You that doesn't mean anything at this point. You know, you Right. If you lose the o game almost lose almost for you know, horseshoes and hand grenades, right? I mean at this point you don't care. But but wow, a mate is gonna be on the board. Although wait, was Queen A check a huge blunder? That looks like you look how it's a huge blunder. How are you protecting the knight? Oh my god. You don't he, he lost just the rook two. the queen, queen and the three. Rook. Oh my god! Oh my gosh! That, 
I, I don't even know what to make Queen of this. Queen A8 check was a huge blunder. And he just missed Queen F3 check securing the draw. So now he's going to fight for the draw all over again. He's going to lose this. Now White's going to win this. Oh, my gosh. And but the, even, even a draw is already a successful result. What a huge... That has just been a day and a half for the snowballs today. Wow. Queen A8 check feels instinctively like it should be putting the game away. Actually walks into a... a, a a losing position for for Kolars and and Jimmy and uh, I don't. Uh, I feel like I accidentally just took a trip to Six Flags and I'm just been up yeah, and down the roller coaster. Yeah, this roller coaster is enough to, uh, you know. And he's he's doing pop, this. Pop a ginger pill. I'm oh. queasy. <laughs> Could be the Red Bull here. King G6, Queen G5 after Queen check. Just keep trying to okay, run away. It's, it's still a draw though. Uh, it's just that a draw is really a successful result anyway. Yeah, it felt like actually it was probably winning at a certain point. And we didn't even see the finish where, unfortunately, for the snowballs, Nicholas Theodoro came came back in a game that felt like it was going Ina Agres's way. Theodoro gets the point. The Bishops now have a four-point lead. Yeah. And we are going to be in... And if Fabiano can somehow if, pull if off Fabi that one, the Anno match is over. If Fabiano somehow wins here, the match is over before the last round even begins which would be quite the shock. A draw there, unfortunately, for Dimitri Kolars. He misses his opportunity. Misses his opportunity to win there, and uh, the crowd is into it. We have not, not an empty seat in the house. Shout out to the fans downstairs. Nearly 8,000 of you with us on Twitch and chess.com TV. Welcome to the Pro Chess League Finals and all the drama you could ask for. That was, that so, was so crazy. That was Kolars comes all the way back with a brilliant king march. <laughs> And then B Queen A8. Yeah. Oh my God, the pain. And then almost lost. I mean, okay. If Donchenko draws, then it is still within comeback distance. It, it's a 4-0 sweep that would need to be happening. Um, but it's not over, as Adrian would say. It's not over. <laughs> wait, wait, no, that's uh, that's Arnold. I don't know. Like, but this is uh, already tough territory for both players in this game here because it's even material after all that. Right. But the king on b3, it just, that walked. Yep. That, that king sprinted, really, across the board. And the king on b3 is looking relatively safe. Yep. The king on f h7, relatively safe, but can come under attack in a few moves. Donchenko came up with the biggest win of the match yesterday for the snowballs to help it get to overtime. Can he do it again? Can he come up with a win that secures the fact that the match is not over for the snowballs? So... Fabiano looking Rookie three calm. check. No, rookie three check. Rookie three check was winning for Fabi. I don't know if it was winning, but it was I mean, it was definitely a really good move, but he's just taking the pawn here. Um, rookie three check blocked the... <laughs> you, but you this block is going to be a weird race. If rook c7, rook d3, the queen side is faster for white. Yeah. So uh, rook b7. But what is just rook d7 here? Don't you get Zugzwang at some point? Rook d7, d5, like king a4? Don't have any moves. Oh. Wow, rook d7, d5, king a4. So play b6 here. Nice. Okay, b6, got it. But take on b6. No, you can also play. You take on b6. You can play, play rook b7 here, and if takes, you take b5. Oh. Rook b7. Oh my gosh, rook b7. If, if rook b7, you might have a winning king and pawn ending. Oh, oh he, he, didn't, he didn't see it. Was that. Rook b7 takes, takes b5. Obviously, yeah, yeah, you can't you... take. And if a4, this is a winning king and pawn ending. The yep. b pawn is strong. Yep. Did he just miss rook b7? It looks like he did. Oh my gosh, Donchenko with an opportunity. Rook to b7. Yeah. Followed by rook to. I mean, this is a winning position well, for White. Well, rook b7, yeah, no, that, I, yeah, missed opportunity. How is this not a win for White? No, it's. It's threatening rook yeah. takes b6, and then a6. If you take it, you lose the king opponent. Literally, Donchenko just missed a win in one move against Fabian. And, and Fabi saw it after. I could tell the you saw it after. he played b6, you could, and now. now now it's going to be a draw at best for Donchenko. And in fact, Donchenko might lose this because with the time. And oh, take on h4. This has just been a day of heartache right now for the snowballs. Oh, no. It's been one one bad beat after another. And I, if they catch it one more here, the St. Louis Archbishops will have clinched the Pro Chess League title before the last set of games even begins. Yeah, it looks like this one, if you take on h4, the d6 pawn is hanging. But that's why I threw in rook b5, hoping the king would take on d6. And then I would take on b4 and take on h4. So instead, he's going to go like this. Okay, and, and it's an h pawn. So fortunately the king, for the fans, we will still have an opportunity for games in the last round. I don't even know what the league rules are, but I assumed if the bishops have this clinched, 
that there's no re need to play round right. four. This is this is there's no more to the season maybe, here. Maybe there is for MVP or something. Okay, something like interesting. That, but yeah, I, but okay, this should be a draw regardless. But again, I think that um, I think that should this have been and Fabiano Caruana has finally not won a chess game. Yeah, to meet uh, Alexander Donchenko keeps the snowball's hopes alive, however slim. Down four games heading into the last round. You're at your best and there. That rook b7 fine. Rook b7. The moment he played, I was like, wait a second. Yeah. Hey, when, you, when you've when uh, you blown yourself a few rook endings. Oh, my gosh. Not again. Not then again. You know, you know exactly how to lose some <laughs> others. So um, that was, that was, oh. OMGs or snaps. Use the emote, OMGs or snaps, because the fact is the match is still going. It's not over yet. Uh, but you cannot feel anything but heartache if you're a Snowballs fan right now. They let several games get away from them there. Yeah. Several games. I mean, Perleko played a great game yep. and should have won. And then all of a sudden, that A-pawn ran down the board and it was, became a queen. Yep. And then in time trouble, they both were blundering left and right. But credit to Perleko performing well above his rating. And he's just punching above his weight in today's action. Yep. Wow. Well, uh, we're going to take a very quick break before the action continues. Don't go anywhere because when we return, the final round will be set to begin. It's going to need to be an epic comeback if the Snowballs are going to keep their Pro Chess League Championship hopes alive. When we return, round four begins. I'm here with Grandmaster Benjamin Bach from the St. Louis Archbishops who are just half a point away from clinching the victory and becoming the 2019 Pro Chess League Final Champions. I know that chess players are very reserved and they're focused until the very last round, but Benjamin, you're only half a point away from winning. Do you feel a little bit more relaxed now? I'm um, sorry, no, we're still very focused. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we cannot, uh, I mean, if you relax, uh, you never know in sports. So, yeah, we're very focused till the end. That was a very creative answer. I haven't heard it at all this entire league. So thank you for sharing your insights with us on that. I know you're also part of the St. Louis University team. What's it like being a professional chess player, but also a student at the same time? I mean, it's very tough, obviously, because I have finals right after this. So I really have to work very hard once I get back to SLU. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I do what I like, and I'm also working towards my future uh, at college. So, yeah, it's def I'm definitely enjoying uh, my life at SLU right now. Being so close to winning the Pro Chess League yet again, do you think that if you guys get yet another championship title, this will put more pressure on you next year? Uh, well, next year is still very far ahead. Right now we just want to win this year's uh, championship, and we'll see what, what uh, comes in the future. You also mentioned that you have a lot of friends who are watching you from home. Is there anything you'd like to share with them? Yeah, I just want to give a big shout out to uh, all my brothers at St. Louis University, especially those who are watching right now, and also to all my fans in the Netherlands. So, uh, big shout out to you guys. You get to play with Fabiano Caruana as one of your teammates. As a professional chess player, is he somebody who you've looked up to, who you're excited to have as part of the team? I mean, it's obviously great to have Fabiano on the team because he's extremely strong and I mean, he's really delivering in this championship. He's almost won all his games. Uh, and yeah, when you talk to him like outside of the games, it's always very insightful. So, I mean, it's great to have him on the team. I've seen you a little bit as a guest on a couple streams on Twitch. Do you have any plans of maybe streaming a little bit more just yourself? Uh, who knows? Yeah, well, uh, there are some plans. Um, yeah, we'll see. And before we let them go back to the booth. Is there anything you'd like to add? Fabiano said that he'd like to get, watch Game of Thrones after the match. What w would you guys like to do to celebrate if you win, which I know it's still very far because you still have half a point? Well, uh, yeah, probably I'm just going to do homework because I <laughs> have finals uh, next week. So, uh, yeah, nothing. But, yeah, we'll definitely celebrate uh, tonight if we win. Well, sounds like a great plan. He'll be doing his homework. If you guys want to help, what do you need help with on your homework? Uh, I know you're very smart, but uh, so I can definitely use your help. <laughs> I was going to volunteer someone to help do it for you in the crowd so you could celebrate, but I am happy to do it for you. Back to you guys in the booth. Thanks. Definitely wouldn't want to ask me for help with any kind of homework. So, um, Yeah, I was going to try to figure out a subject that I would ask you for help on. And, um, you couldn't come up with one, right? Nah, there you go. <laughs> well, we are, uh, we're back here now at the last round here for the Pro Chess League Championship. 
Currently, the St. Louis Archbishops are holding a four-game lead. The results from round three, unfortunately, just were not enough to swing the momentum or stop the snowball from rolling out of control there uh, for the team from Baden-Baden. So the, the half point taken away from Fabiano is the first time anyone's done that. So there is a, uh, uh, if there is such a thing as a moral victory. Uh, but uh, the snowballs are facing exactly what you would think, which is in need of a 4-0 sweep. Because we have a 16 total game match, a single half a point will win it for the, for the Archbishops. If they get to eight and a half, Robert, it's all over. So it's, it's literally win or go home on every single board. Let's look at what the pairings are in this round four of play. Um, it's hard, hard to pick one that's going to be easier than the other. I, I, I said all day I think that Ina Agras is the favorite against Julian Perleko, but right now it's hard when you've been losing. Obviously, Perleko seems to have found his sort of mojo uh, on day two, right? Playing very good chess overall. Um, and I think right now it's just, you know, tip your hat to the St. Louis Archbishops and wish the Snowballs the best of luck. And I guess you got to win one game at a time. And normally I wish chess players good skill, but in this situation, luck is definitely required because you're down eight to four. Any single draw wins the match on the spot for the St. Louis Archbishops. Five minute Caruana has the white pieces against Georg Meyer. So, you know, if he could draw Magnus Carlsen 12 games in a row, I think he, uh, Georg has his hands full there. Right. But it is rapid, yes. right? Anything can happen, of course. That's why we do it. If it was a science or a foregone conclusion, right? As they say on Sunday, that's why the game is played, if right? If it was a science, I wouldn't ask you for help. We that's, just established this. That's right. But exactly. commentary, I need you by my hey, side. I need you, buddy. And we are going to need each other, everyone here in the stands. It's been an amazing event. Uh, regardless of what happens here in this last round of games, we know that it's been an, a great season for all the teams who made it to the Final Four. Uh, of course, the bottom bottom snowballs would like this thing to go a little differently, and they're now down to the wire. Maybe Georg Meyer can help help the party get started with some crazy chess against Fabiano. Alexander Donchenko there giving us a smile, feeling pretty loose here before the round begins. Hey, buddy, you can give me a thumbs up. I'm here. <laughs> Alexander, this is your conscience speaking. <laughs> I'm watching you. Honestly, I thought Fabiano was Alejandro because yep. he had the similar hair, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, Donchenko is, uh, you know, doing his best. Stay loose. Knows it's been a rough day. There's, there's who, we, there's who he actually was. It wasn't Alejandro's fro. It was Fabi's. Yeah. But uh, clearly, Fabi looks like he's in the zone. He's in the zone. Yeah, and he's uh, watching as board three gets underway right now. For the last round of games, we have Dimitri Kolars taking on Nicholas Theodoro. And. Uh, and we saw Dimitri get a great position with this opening in yep. the first game of the day. Yep. And he was unable to defeat Benjamin Bach. And that actually was, you know, because there's been so many swings in this right. match, so many yep. games that could have gone either way. Right. So Every forget one of about them matters, that one. Right. But that game actually in particular, they lost the first round because they didn't win that game. Yeah, and we, call, we called this moment, right? We said, like, hey, even though it's early in the match, you start to look at those two three-board matchups on each side. And that was exactly what that was. It was the three seed for the Snowballs, unable to get a victory despite being better against uh, Benjamin Bach out of the opening. Significantly better, actually. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, but those little things add up and uh, throughout the match. And obviously, Kolaris hopes to, to get a win here, even if it ends up not being enough. Wants to... Uh, Wants to show that he knows what he's doing in this line. And, and I, I, as I said all weekend, I feel like he's been one of the better prepared players overall playing quickly. Seems to be getting good positions after the first stage. Um, and we'll see if he can do it again. Yeah, and sort of the issue at this point is it's not just about getting good positions. It's about getting fighting positions. You don't want some dry position where the likelihood of your point. Essentially, sometimes you play it safe, right? Mm -hmm. You have a position where it's an 85% likelihood your opponent makes a draw and 15% chance you win. That sounds great, right? There are no losing chances there. You're just playing a, a one-sided game. Unfortunately, with such a large likelihood of drawing and knowing that it eliminates your team, right. you got to win. So you have to play a position where maybe it's a 50-50 shot, but at least right. it's just a pure fight. Right. No, you got to mix it up. you got to create dynamic stuff. you got to thank Face Chess for the love and support he's going to. Shout out to all of our moderators as well. Uh, Moobot seems to be working again, so glad that that robot got kicked and uh, started, you know, got back into gear. Um, but thank you to everybody who's, uh, who's with us, supporting things. And uh, we will indeed update the scoreboard. We know it should be 8-4, to four and we are on it. Um, we have uh, D4 now played for Dimitri Kolars. As you said, Robert, we're going to need to mix it up um, if we're going for a win. Right, last game of the year, Dan? Don't have anything back? That's right. I, I really just... That 
It's like slurred that. It slurred it. What, what's in your cup? Uh, water. I don't <laughs> even have a cup. Actually, I have the cup with the Armenian lavash on it. Lavash. Lavash. I got a uh, gift from Artok Manukian. Uh, uh, some dollar dollar bills, y'all. Uh, from Armenia with Tigran Petrosian on it. Oh, I, I, I thought yeah. you were just saying that he bribed you. Like, <laughs> I got a gift from him. Well, it, money. If he bribed me, apparently he needs to find the right guy to bribe because they got fourth <laughs> place on the weekend. <laughs> so, no, that's not what happened at all. And oh my gosh, we just had some crazy love dropped on the channel. I don't even know how many subs that is. 100. That's 100 subs? Yeah. That's not possible. I mean, it's what it says. An anonymous gifter just dropped 100 subs on the chess channel. Apparently they like themselves some Pro Chess League, and we are just super appreciative. Oh, my gosh. That was amazing. Thank you. If it's an anonymous gifter downstairs, just, like, secretly blink twice at me later, and I'll know <laughs> who you are, um, and I'll try not to shoot you with a T-shirt gun. But thank you for whoever that was for, and if you've got a new subscription courtesy of that anonymous gift, get your Mike Cummer emotes out. And use them. Yeah, if you don't use them, you lose them. That's right. If you don't Actually, use, if you don't sub, you, you don't. If get you don't them. sub, you literally don't get them. And then we have another one coming. This has been such a great time, such a great season. It's not over yet, um, but regardless of the result, this has been so much fun for chess. Yep, and fun chess. Look at look at Theodore here. He's just hanging He's just out, chilling. Yeah, he's been actually an yeah. MVP. MVP candidate for them. I know Honestly, Fabio has this a big weekend. Score. Is, it's it's hard to not think of Fabio Caruana. The guy is currently five and uh, six and a half out of seven yep. of the games he's played this weekend. The problem is when you're that good, we expect they, you to yeah. do that well, yep. which is kind of sad because he's playing right. some good games. Right. But Nicholas Theodoro at the third board, and some would say that's the target point, right? Because Benjamin Bach is could be a board one for he, he's literally the same rating as Baden Baden's board one. Yep. Nicholas Theodora on board three, he's a very strong player. He's, he's a great player. But it's like that's where you want to try to you know, tackle St. Louis is on yep. board four, of course. Right. But you need a second point to attack, and that would be him. But he's held his own. I keep uh, repeating that against Zavin Andreas, and he held a critical game with the black pieces yesterday. Yep. And today he's two and a half out of three. Yeah, and uh, he's – Kind of seen the worst of it, I think, as far as maybe getting blown off the board by Kalars. This is going to be sort of a closed middle game uh, with some maneuvering. White's going to have an edge for a while, and I think Kalars is is the favorite overall in the game, especially with the white pieces. But as we've said a lot, I mean, right now it's winner go home, unfortunately, for the bottom bottom snowball. So playing for two result positions, like you said, is not as good as it might have been otherwise. Yeah, and just a good choice by Theodoru because this is in a position where you're going to you know, blunder a piece and some random moves. Like, right. no, like if uh, Dimitri is going to beat him, he's going to have to grind him down, really outplay him. And we've seen Dimitri's form today. It's, it's really not the right. standard we've seen throughout the season. Yep. In fact, he just barely escaped against Julian Proleko right. uh, in a totally losing position. Yep. Wow. Well, we've got another game underway, the board four battle. Ina Agres versus Julian Proleko. And uh, very often, a lot of these tightly contested pro chess league matches come down to who wins the board four battle. Unfortunately, today, it may not even it may not be enough for the snowballs, but Ina would like to get a victory um, on the weekend. And uh, as would as would Julian. But um, this is uh, this will be a, a weird one actually to start. If you look at the opening, we have a Karakon with a Fianchetto, some sort of modern system. Um, after this F3 move. And, uh, okay, well, Ina playing playing an opening that you don't see very often, now taking a think. Yeah, let's say it was the fantasy variation yeah. of the Karakon and then declined. And then that, that starts with F3, and the main line of the fantasy, everyone, is to take and play E5. Right. And um, the main idea is that if D takes E5, you have Queen H4 check and E4 falls. So this is often how black deals with the fantasy variation, but um, um, not today, Junior. Not today. Not today, Julian. Not today, Junior. The No Mariah Carey song going to be sung on this show. <laughs> Take that sweet fantasy somewhere else. That was a that was a really good one. Back to Kolar's game. Ooh, wait, we saw a take on C And this is where things start to compromise, right? Because I don't know that Kolar's would have done that if he didn't have to win. Right. Like, literally, I mean, not to say that white isn't still okay, but I think that you know, you sit on a lot of positions where you feel you can comfortably play for two results. B4 just feels so much more natural. You could take with this pawn, and 
you know, maybe you play for some sort of slow game, but you accept the fact that you might not win, but you're probably not going to lose. Taking on C6 here for the chance of going after the D pawn is just super double-edged because this pawn's weak, this pawn's weak, this pawn's weak. And uh, being down on the match uh, score is, is why you make decisions like that often. Yeah, and, and black can just throw a knight into f4. White can follow suit with a knight to f5. And that, that is a good thing for uh, Dimitri Kolars is he actually has a target now, the pawn d6. You can go after it, whereas before was additional space, but not something to strictly take advantage of. And so, you know, he is going to keep trying to pile up pressure on the pawn d6. As you mentioned, though, the pawn a5 is indeed a weakness that uh, might just come under fire very quickly. Yeah. I like your idea of knight f4. I guess the more I look at it, though, I mean, it, it does seem like white is getting to d6 a little bit first. What is going on? Uh, 99 problems. I, I got 99 gifted subs. And... Uh, Unfortunately, it looks like Crypto Chess was not one of them <laughs> there with the random, the random Twitch algo that gives, gives out subs to people. Whoever, whoever our, uh, our, our philanthropist, our, our angel in, in, the, uh, in the midst throwing those subscriptions our way anonymously, we really appreciate it. I you know, don't even know what to say. I love that. Someone goes rigged. Someone goes <laughs> rigged. <laughs> Classic. All right. Well, we have another game underway Oh, wait, that was the... That was amazing, by the way. It's just, it just so awesome. Thank you for your support. Is that amazing. There's the Chess mic Angels. Not rigged, you know? You wonder sometimes. Good angels exist. That was awesome. Yeah, this is great. Everyone's using the Mike Comer emote. Yeah, that, that well, it's, it's the best emote. Although the uh, Heskasm's in there, too. Yeah, <laughs> so is OM Jesus Snaps. That's right. Facial expressions for the win here in Twitch chat. Okay, we've got Grandmaster Benjamin Bach now underway against Alexander Donchenko. And uh, again, this is just this has been a really, really tough day for the Snowballs, who uh, won in overtime fashion yesterday. If you missed it, there's highlights all over the internet. Check it out. Um, it was an amazing match that went all the way to literally the final possible blitz game against the Shangdu Pandas. Unfortunately, today they have just not had the same mojo. Uh, rolling and uh, they also ran into the buzzsaw of the Fabiano Caruana led St. Louis Archbishop. So, do you think St. Louis should change their name to the St. Louis Caruana? The St. Louis Caruana. Yeah, I, I'm going to say no, but you know, d you know, whatever. Why? <laughs> I <don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> I feel uh, like he deserves it. There's Benjamin Bach right there. I mean, that, they're actually. You know, we should speak about this because there's actually a lot of pressure on Fabiano. Yep. He's really chill you know he's taking all these games in stride but when your team sort of relies on you to win pretty much every game yeah it's not easy it's really hard we've seen magnus carlson play in the olympiad for example right. and norway is a an improving team but in the past it's like yep if you don't win your game we don't have a chance to tie the match yep and playing grandmaster after grandmaster granted of course magnus carlson is the best player in the world but playing tough player after tough player you can't just win every single game yep and it puts this a ton of pressure on you, and well, I mean, if I isn't up to the task. No, I mean, you're right, and, and I think it's, you know, it seems afterwards like a foregone conclusion, but it's just, it's not easy to, to win chess games against Grandmasters and guys like that that can do it so consistently. In Rapid, too, I think Fabi just, you know, doesn't get enough credit sometimes in that time control because of what happened at the World Championship, but, but, but I know a we, lot of people that would lose to Magnus Carlsen in a rapid a rapid match. Yeah, so. you mean everyone? Everybody, <laughs> right? <laughs> we, so. we, and we did see Fabiano absolutely demolish Pantala Hare Krishna right. in, in their rapid match in St. Louis. So there you go. I mean, uh, and obviously as a, as a guy who still has a lot of upside trying to get better, you know, a concerted effort, maybe we see a stylistic change. We know Fabi has said he really enjoys this time control. He feels kind of at home here. And that's, uh, that's been amazing to see. He hasn't even started his last round game yet. We're talking about him. But um, we've got uh, all three of the other games have begun besides the Caruana Meyer matchup. And look at the game with Kolars having just seen the move D5 by Nicholas Theodoro. Look at that. That's Ta an aggressive transition of the pawn structure that takes advantage of the pin emote. If you're a new subber from all of our anonymously gifted subs, which has been amazing, then use, use your penny mode. D5 takes advantage of the fact that the C4 pawn can't take, and after E takes, you take with the knight. The same would be repeated if you tried to go full capture on D5. So um, the transition 
Well, optically looks good right away because you just removed your D6 weakness, Robert. Yep. It's also a little double-edged, right? Because now that you've gone out of your way to do that, White still has a three-on-two potential majority here. You've given up the initiative with the knight to F5 square, but I guess the main point is you're going to put your knight into F4 and you feel like you've got just as good a counterplay. Although, n this D6 square is a problem, right? So... Can I do it? Knight without H3 check, I guess, I would, will be I was played? Yeah, knight H3 or, or, knight G or even knight. I, I wasn't sure, but you're right. They're both they're both in the air, right? Something like this, and then you have knight H4 was Ooh. my idea. Yep. Um, that looks scary. So let, instead of allowing you to take on G2 after knight F4, okay. what if I play rook D6? Okay, there we go. So if you had knight H3 with check, I'm not going to take you. You're going to go here. Exactly. Oh, you would. I would. And King I H2. Did. Just looks like I'm picking up your knight there. So I think the move rook to d6, just kicking your queen off of the c6 square looks good. That rook can also swing to b6 uh, in the near future. Yep. And then if the queen moves away from the d7 square, my rook can come to d7. So uh, Yeah, looks rook d6 looks good. And that's kind of what I was saying. Is D5 was played by Theodoro to eliminate the weak d6 pawn, which makes sense positionally. But, you know, you're constantly weighing. It's the Taoism of chess when you're a chess player, right? You've got this 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 balance of, you know, tactics versus positional chess, and you want to make sure that while you're aware of your positional weaknesses, you don't give up too much of the initiative to eliminate them, and uh, that may have just happened for Theodoro if Rook D6 happens. We now have moves on the board, and I like what Georg Meyer's doing. Look at this ever over here, because but you mainly like it because you like. This cannot be Jorg with the black pieces. This could not be Jorg Meyer with the black. <laughs> this is a new Jorg, a Jorg whose back is literally against the wall. Yep. As as uh, leading the snowballs on board one, and uh, this is full Jorg Gruber. Yeah, he's gone Jorg Gruber or <laughs> Hans Meyer. I think it's Jorg Gruber. Man, I need to just turn that fat head into an emo with the silencer. I'll get it. <laughs> um, for those who follow the Chess.com shows regularly, you 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 know you know that one there, but. Georg Meyer, often known as kind of just a silent, deadly killer for a super solid, blunder-free, kind of uh, just ruthless chess style. Unfortunately, in a game where he has the black pieces against the world number two, he has to mix it up. He's playing kind of a kind of a weird system here. Something where, where honestly, the risk is Hikaru that he just gets destroyed. Like the pro Hikaru. Uh, sorry, the risk here. Did you, call me Hikaru? you know why I said Hikaru? Why? Because I was looking at the pawn on B6, and I was thinking the risk of playing like Hikaru. That was oh, okay. I was mixing up my thought processes. I'm pretty sure you just called me Hikaru. I know it was awesome. I love it. How do you feel about it? I love it. Are I love lying? that it was a Freudian slip. <laughs> I, I don't know how to respond here. <laughs> no, but you know, I had told, I had so many sentences going on in my head. Yeah. Because one of the risks of playing B6, these positions like Hikaru plays, which is what this looks like. Right. Anyone who for follows sure, Hikaru sure. Nakamura's channel knows that these positions, if someone gets a big center and they know how to use it, 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 was, yeah. it that's how you, you get blown off the board. And, and actually, that's what Fabiano's going to do. But I, I like the choice by Georg because if you play something standard, you get a slightly worse position, you're groveling anyway. Right. Here at least you're directly challenging the center. You're directly challenging Fabiano and saying, I'm going to give you some concrete weakness right. and try to take advantage of it. Okay, well, that weakness is going to go away. But even if you play C takes B6, I can take with my C pawn. And when yep. I take with C pawn, I'm just trying to get my knight to the C4 square. And it's funny because we talk about the bishops being an advantage usually. But with, let's say, after C takes D6, uh, C takes D6, then I'm going to put a rook on CH with my knight on C4. And where's your bishop going from C1? You know, your, your so-called advantage doesn't have a good diagonal to right. work with. We've got an octopus, right, as, as Anna Rudolph would say. I feel like the reason why that term octopus didn't exactly exist is because until you had these, these chess.com arrows that are kind of awkward looking at times, yeah. it didn't exactly look like that. But now we know exactly what to call it when a knight is dominating in the middle of the board. And I'm a little bored right now, if those of you can't tell, drawing a little smiley face. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Can uh, I fire you? No. Uh -huh. <laughs> can, can I just? Well, we've know. been trying. Yeah. Everyone at Chess.com has been trying to find a way to fire me for a long time. So let's see. Theodoru's game is the most advanced, mm -hmm. and Theodoru has a, but looks like a pretty good position. The e5 pawn is a problem. The b7 pawn is a problem. So maybe exactly what we're talking about with White just kind of clamping down on the position here, mm -hmm. and. 
you know, you can always go G3. Well, you can't always do it because the H3 pawn might hang. But you can at some point play G3 to kick the knight from F4. This rook on D6, if it's captured, your knight lands on D6, and that's a great square for the knight. Uh, I don't know. To me, it looks really good for white. I would not like to have black here. That's, that's mm -hmm. my essential point. Yep. And the three on two is also just healthy. Much in, a much easier majority to advance than anything that black's going to have on the king side. Um, no, I like the way that Kalarz is playing. He's he's up a little on the clock, which, you know, one thing we haven't drawn attention to, but a pattern that has persisted for Kalarz even against the lower-rated Proleko is he's been down on time in almost every game. So even when he's played well, right, uh, Kalarz has has been down on the clock. Thank you for uh, Ryath and your continued gifted subs. Really appreciate it. I feel like he's, he's picking out people he knows are regular viewers and supporters of the chess community. I saw a gifted sub to the St. Louis Chess Club watching from somewhere. Not sure who's logged into that account. Yeah, that's awesome. There's Kolaris right there. You see Proleko, his last round opponent behind him, fully focused on his game. Let's jump over to Julian's position here against Ina Agrest. It's, uh, okay, dynamic. We've got... Oh, queen takes F3, there's knight B6, huh? Yeah, it's a broken structure for black. Uh, sorry, for white in the center here. Queen takes would allow knight to B6, and if this bishop has no way to defend itself, then that means d4 is going to fall. Yep. And this is a possible way to get away with that. You, you're suddenly defending both, so that, that might work. At least white is not losing material. It just doesn't look ideal. It doesn't look ideal at all. And although you already have the bishop pair, so losing the bishop pair is not a positional disaster in that sense. No, not a disaster, but still not... Not looking good for winning chances. And that's exactly the line we now have on the board. Fabiana Caruana and Georg Meyer. Someone in the Chess TV ch chat saying we would freak if Fabiana lost. Well, we would because it's just not something that has happened all weekend. So you're right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Um, but, uh, okay. Right now, it just doesn't seem like it's it's, it's a possible position um, to, to really think that that could happen because... Huge center. A shout out to York for trying to mix it up, going against what his normal grain would be. But the problem is that um, going to be very difficult to create winning chances. Black. In this I kind of like York's position though. Really? Because there are no targets for White to exploit. I would actually play think about Rook D to B one, then go Rook B five, then go Pawn A five. Because I'm not okay. I'm not really seeing anything in, in the way of activity for White. And Black is an easy plan. Rook C seven, Rook D to C eight, Queen to A six, pile up on the C four pawn. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a very concrete plan and actually quite a, an annoying problem. C4 square. There it Bo is. Boom goes the dynamite. This is all I need. I've made so many blunders today in my analysis, yep. but I feel like Fabi and I are on the same wavelength. If, if you and Fabi are thinking the same, right, you'll take that one home, right? I definitely will. Yeah, I like that plan as well. Put the rook on b5, which has a dual purpose, right? Not only does it punch your move a5 through, but it also stops the queen from ganging up on a6, right? Yep. But Georg quickly plays the move knight c6, and I like it. You, you're not worried about a move like d5 here, everyone, because that quickly gains a tempo and wins a pawn. And the point is, if you follow now with your plan as Fabiano, the queen will come to a6, and then that you've just sort of helped force the a5 square free for my knight. So, you know, Georg is playing quickly, up a little bit on the clock. Got to appreciate that. It looks like Dimitri Kolars is is uh, still a little better, but shout out to Theodora who found a way to coordinate. Those knights were sort of in front of the pawns against their own will, right? Now you've sort of righted the ship, you've defended your potentially weak e5 pawn, and improved your knight to hit b4. Actually, suddenly knight c6 is a threat as well. This looks like it's turning around. Well, then I was about to suggest knight e1 as a yep. way to trade off one pair of knights, and that way the b4 pawn is not a target, but you have to consider moves like f5. The problem is after f5, I go knight takes f5. And the reason why I want to play f5 is your rook, the only square your rook can defend the knight on e1 and the pawn on b4 is from e4. So if I can go f5 and kick your rook, yep. that's good news. But after f5, knight takes f5 actually wins a pawn uh, immediately. The, you can't take both d3 and f5 at the same time, right? Right. So there you go. Okay. So knight e1. If the transition happens, are there real winning chances here, right? I mean, the snowballs are fully up against the wall. You can see the scoreboard, down four games, heading into this last round of play. Yes, very, Th this huge, is very, very much winning a, chances. Yeah, this very much has winning chances. It's a two-result kind of position for White, but one with real winning chances to go with it. 
Yeah, you just can go, like, you want to bring your king straight to c4, so you want to just dart king f1 to c4, protect those pawns. The flash. And then try to either go b5, well, that, that would be really nice, or try to play on the king side as well with your rook coming up to the third rank. Hmm. So Theodoro says, I'm not going to trade. I don't like the simplification. And he's trying to get something like knight c6, knight d5, but now white can go knight c2 to protect everything as well. So he plays g3 to kick the knight to d5, and then Kolars can then bring the knight to either c2 or d3, and he continues to have an edge. What about the game of board twos? What in Yeah, the Donchenko actually has made it messy here. I mean, the biggest issue, I guess, is whether he can actually win the d6 pawn before white fully cements it in. Well, I'm taking on c7. Well, and, uh, the problem is I'm going to take here. Uh, bishop a6. Oh, I didn't even realize. Yeah. I, I wasn't even doing the math on the fact that my king had no squares. Yeah. <laughs> I was just sitting there like, all right, well, he obviously has to take right. a6, right. and then I'll play e5. I was not even looking at the king's position. Yeah, this is actually wow. quite a bit problematic. So I was going to say bishop h3, it's attack d7. makes perfect sense. Okay. But after knight c7, pawn takes, rook takes, uh, rook takes d7, takes, takes, two bishops. Did you just go full Hikaru? Takes, I takes, did. takes? I did. All right, takes, 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 GG, yo. Takes, 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 GG, yo. Um, Take that paw. Oh, we're singing different songs. Yep. Okay, so somehow Ina manages to keep the bishop here on the board and not lose the d4 pawn along the way. Let's see what happened with that maneuver. Queen d3 was played as we predicted. Perlenko decides not to take on c4. I'm not sure that was the right decision. Yeah, maybe he was expecting bishop b3, which would be a big blunder because then knight takes e5 is a free right. pawn. The pawn is pinned, pin emote. If you've got a new sub, use it. Thank you so much for all the support, by the way. Viewers, look at those takes, takes emotes coming out. <laughs> Hikaru fans, we have a lot of them. Knight c4 is now played. b is under fire. Um, but okay, this is unbalanced, right? If you were asking for something weird, right, as a snowball fan, at least give me winning chances or give me death, right, even if I have to die along the way. Yep. And I, right. would, I would take on d5 and then put my bishop on f3 and say, whoa. Ha yeah, I love that. Also, knight c4 stopped the blockade that you worked hard to put. Right, you put yep. a knight on b4, knight on b6, so you could blockade there. And now my bishop yeah, are coming like free. Yeah, it feels like Proleko's losing his thread a little bit. We got the pin emotes being used in the chess TV chat. Shout out there. Um, oh, well, that did not come recommended. Yeah, why? Uh, that also didn't come recommended. I don't I don't know why Ina would part with the bishop here. It feels like she just finally had the opportunity to break the blockade on the light squares. Yep. Even bishop three first made sense. I mean, if you can force this, even better, right? Yeah, that's Now awesome. I've got a solidly supported center. A couple of big pawns there, right? I like big pawns. Me too. Cannot lie. Right? And the bishop here, you can't deny. So that would have been good. Um... Donchenko, Speaking of bishop pairs. Yeah, he's got the bishop pair as well. Honestly, I'm liking their position in a lot of games. It's just that it, that it has to keep going their way if you're looking for a comeback, you know. Kjorg's um, up a minute on the clock, and I, I prefer his position. Yeah, it's still still going to be tough, I think, because hard for, hard for, White has to create some weaknesses, don't they? I mean, can you really get enough pressure on c4 for that pawn to fall? Uh, just, I'm just going to rook c8. I'm going to play knight f1 and knight e3. The thing is, you're, I'm not saying that black is winning, of course, but white is forced into passive defense. Yeah, I hear which you. Which is yeah. very uncomfortable. Yep. There's knight f1. Knight f1. He's going to bring the knight to either d2 or e3 on the way. Yeah, it's just trying to be very solid here. And honestly, it can become a mindset issue, right? You're trying to be so solid that you end up playing too solidly. Yep. And not really playing for your own plans, but just to avoid any uh, pitfalls. And this has been a weird transition Whoa. in the Kalars game. Theodoro allows the takes on b6, and I think what Kalars is banking on is that if he can get this knight to... Okay, well, either a5 or d6, they both hit the b7 pawn. But um, he, might be, he might be winning either way. One of the reasons why knight a5 is possible is because in this situation, if the rook ending can happen before the black king is too close, then suddenly you have just... Pawns very far advanced up the board, and, and it may be really dangerous for black. Yep. Um, and if you want to be more uh, you know, solid, but it's going to knight f5 to d6, same exact plan, but without giving it the possibility of taking on b4. Yeah. It's looking good. Yeah, so this will be a tough one for Theodore to hold. 
Um, we keep moving along. We've back to the game with Agres and Proleko. Again, it's one where you just have a hard time believing that uh, that the best approach was played by Ina, but still some still some outside winning chances here for White. Yeah, Bla um, Black has got to coordinate. Okay, so at what point can White try to play D five? That's the real question. So Black's going to take and play E six, and say you're not yeah. getting D five, and so. How do you make progress? You got to bring your king in, trade queen. You've got to, you've got to also try maybe for an outside mating net. You do hold the only open file on the board currently. And that's huge. You're right, but queen right? can come to e4 for black. Right. No, that's true. No, so, I definitely uh, thought she had winning chances, but I all think of a sudden, she did earlier. All of a sudden, there's not that much material left. Perleko plays very confidently here as the time pressure sets in, and that's been been something he's done well all weekend. Yep. Um, especially today. Playing H5, he, he senses that he's getting under time pressure. What's that having the Benjamin Bach game? He, he mouse what? slipped. He mouse, I saw that at the corner of my eye. He mouse slipped his rook D3. Oh, my gosh. I, I just picked it up. And it has to stand. That's the yeah. rules. He just mouse slipped rook to D3 instead of trading, and that's, that's how one of these games is going to be lost. And uh, you said that it would take more than skill but luck for the snowballs to come back. Yep. And that's about as lucky of a game and a win as you can well, get. Well, Donchenko had a good position. I mean, Donchenko had a good position, but not an upper rook position. Yeah, that's for sure. And, and that, I guess actually the position wasn't even that great anymore because the knight was coming to e4 very quickly. Yeah, wow. What a heartbreaking loss for the St. Louis Archbishops. Uh, the, the snowballs will take it. It's part of the game. Mouse slips are real, and it's one of the reasons we... We always kind of recommend people to, to fully move the piece and drag it, right? We, I was talking about this yesterday, Robert, where you go, and if you don't want it on a square, you go here. Right. Right? You never try to control it, moving it back and forth, right? Take advantage of the online setting by releasing the piece and let it go. I, I don't know what happened there, but what a heartbreaking way for Benjamin Bach's uh, pro chess league finally to come down. Of course, his team is still in great position, but suddenly... Suddenly, there feels like there's a little bit of life here in the snowballs' chances. Now, they're only a draw away from winning the entire Pro Chess League Championship. Nicholas Theodoro is trying to get closer to doing that. Honestly, Pro Lego is the best chance for them because I don't particularly love Fabi's position. I don't like um, Theodoro's position. Yeah. And uh, Pro Lego is the one who's holding for them. Well, and if a comeback did did happen in absolutely insane fashion, I don't think we're close to that. But then you would really look back at that mouse slip with some just real pain and cringeworthiness. You hate to see someone lose like that, but it is it is part of the game, part of the rules, and it's something we've seen in the pro chess league. Uh, in our old days of chess center, we used to have mouse slip of the week, right? Blunders of the week like that. It it happens. Yep. Wow, that is really surprising. Finish there. Checking on the boards, but obviously, you know, the best thing you can do is focus on the game in front of you. Um, says Danny, going into coach dad mode. But, uh... Wait, who's... Isn't G7 hanging here? Yeah, G7's hanging with check. The problem is that B4 then falls. I think that probably Kolarz is trying to calculate whether you can take and come back to F5 and get H6 before King D5 and B4 falls. Because it's going to become a real race. That's the thing. Yeah, it's actually it's trickier, but knight g7 check looks pretty good to me. And then you have to guard the rook somehow. Either rook e2 or probably f3, I guess. I think f3 because it also guards g4. g4. Exactly. And if something like this were to happen... Oh, that a pawn's actually rolling. Yeah. But that's knight e8 is a possibility. Knight e8 possible. Or knight f5, yeah. Even just... this and then takes... A king Right, and g5. then g5. Okay, yeah. that, that would be key. That has to work, which means that King goes the Adora would have to come back, and then the question is, you know, what's happening in an endgame like this? Well, you can't go A2. I'll take it and play C6, so it's yeah. super complicated. Yeah, but at some point you got to go for it. Oh, and he did. He played F3, and look at the Adoro choosing not to trade Rooks. Maybe he just didn't have the time to calculate. Yeah, this whether, is going to hurt him. The but I think F6. that's huge, because I think his best chance was to go into the night ending... White's picking off a lot of pawns here with check and, and pay, playing G5. We got a real wizard, Harry, Harry on H8. Yeah, take on F6. And is there some like knight F4 check and trying to make some kind of draw? I don't see it, but it looks like the attempt. Wow. Whoa, what's happening? 
And in this game is Proleko. Oh, it looks like she's about to lose because. Oh, wow. Palmer was just captured over there on H4. Yeah, it looks like e she went really too crazy over here with this move H4. She was trying to avoid the draw, so you give her credit for that. Yeah, and I mean, Black was going to go H4 if she didn't, so it right. was a tough position. Which, which would have been the draw that I was talking about. Oh, I was playing for a win. Yeah, but at least a perpetual. Right, that was right, my point. Sure, so now sure. I think it's... It looks like we are going to have the kid as the hero. Uh, I guess Mike Cummer said, you'll see why we brought him. And Perleko coming up with three half points against three higher rated players in the last day. <laughs> there's uh, there's our manager down there. Yep, just screaming Julian. Screaming Julian. And with other games potentially going the snowball's way this round, I, I think so. That, that uh, the, the, the play by the board for Proleko may be the most critical of the day. Yeah, he's, if he wins this of two out of four, which is a phenomenal result. Yeah. You, you, we, if the Snowballs are going to win, they needed to kind of sweep him. 4-0 would have been necessary. Yep. But he said, I'm, I'm, I'm just as talented as everybody else here. And look at Theodoro coming oh. all the way back to create, create counterplay. Look then we've got our uh, streamer sweepstakes winner there, JJ. Behind That's Mike the Keller. last sam seven samurai. You can follow him on Twitch. Streaming chess regularly, and then you've got the Wait, manager, why, Mike Cummer. Why did, why did take on B7? That, I don't... Yeah, I don't know why take B7 instead of C7, you mean? Yeah, or just even leave it there for a bit. But okay, one second left for Theodora. Yeah, hard to play the no, most accurate moves. It should be winning here for White. Unfortunately, though... I don't think it's going to be enough as G5, Julian G6. Proleko has essentially put the archbishops on his back. I don't even know which game to go to, but if we go back to the Proleko game here, you can see the manager like a proud papa watching Julia Proleko bring the Pro Chess League Championship back to St. Louis. And, and yeah, up, uh, up a piece here. He's just up a piece. That's game. The queen is coming. <laughs> Mike, Mike Cummer, the manager, would say the Pro Chess League Championship belongs in St. Louis. And it is coming home. Yeah. And he's definitely feeling like a hero and a well-deserved reaction Huge for him. Huge win there for the board four. Played yeah. phenomenal chess today. And and especially uh, after yesterday. You know, so many fighting good positions and went 0 out of 4 today as well. He, um, absolutely. He got unfortunate in that game against Dimitri Collars. So... Yeah, could have could have had even more points today. Just wow, what an amazing performance from the youngster. Dimitri Kolars does rally himself to get a win against Nicholas Theodoro. Helping things sting a little bit less. Unfortunately, not enough for the snowballs with the board for Julian Proleko for the Archbishops playing hero. Yeah, and what, honestly, the Snowballs are having a phenomenal round four because the only game left is Georg Meyer versus Five Minute Caruana. And now it's, it's still messy. It's been right. messy. But they already have scored. Um, they, they won on the board three matchup. Right. They won on the board two matchup. Granted, it was a mouse slip, but right. still, it was a very fighting game. And so they scored two wins this round. And it's like. And if Meyer wins as Black here, you can't ask for better winning chances than uh, Five Minute Caruana's King being open. I mean, unfortunately. I actually think it's about to turn into a really dangerous ta attack with this move E5 about to happen. Right, so Black is probably going to have to play E5. Yeah. But then so, you take on E5 with Rook D6. and. But uh, wow, you, we had the moment there. You saw Mike Hummer on camera. You saw Julian Prolango join his team. He helped bring the title of Pro Chess League champions back to St. Louis. And uh, congratulations to the Archbishops. Not exactly... Uh, in the most dramatic fashion, Robert, but that's because the Archbishops were just dominant from start to finish today. Yeah, it was really impressive showing by St. Louis, and they brought five in a Caruana here for a reason. The world number two player decided to beat everyone in his path, yep. except for one game thus far. And, well, you know, he did what he needed to do, but his teammates also lifted them up right. because yesterday Benjamin Bach was great. Nicholas Theodoro throughout the weekend was very, very good. He yep. lost his last game to a determined Dimitri uh, Kolars, but ooh, F6 check, sacrificing. Freeing up the ooh. F5 square. That's huge, everyone, because it prevents the king from taking. Then rook takes D6 will happen with tempo, and the lady falls. And if king G6, there's probably just queen H3. Right, and suddenly we have a mating net that you didn't think was coming, right? Uh, putting your king on the eighth rank might be forced, but then... 
then you've got other problems, right? Now you've got this huge thorn in your shoe. Yep. And uh, something like this might even just lead to back rank problems, followed by knight f5. You've got checks here. You've got forks there. Yeah, this doesn't look good. Leave it to the world number two to find accurate ways to turn his huge center into a huge attack. And, you know, we talk about that's the problem with these openings, but it's why you see someone like Hikaru play it so often in Blitz and Bullet, but you're not going to see them throw it down against 2800s and even rapid chess or, or classical chess because the truth is Fabiano had a huge pawn storm from the very early stages of the middle game here. Yeah, it's what happens when you go for a sort of... Um, you're playing on the side of the board, yep. more so you give up control over the center, and then when those pawns start coming, it's going to be difficult for you to withstand them. And right now, the, your idea with queen takes e5 and knight f5 seems very logical. And, well... Okay, queen h3 is trying to inch his way into h6 and, and deliver a checkmate on g7. So and there we go. And what in the world just happened there? We had Cash Menke, who's here in the house, give 64 subs to the chess channel in honor of the 64 squares on the chessboard. I can only guess Cash Menke being a cash man, chess guy. Shout out to the man downstairs. Yeah. Cash Menke. Cash Menke? Cash Menke. They say Cash Menke mo problems, but not, not today. They never, no one's ever, ever said, said that. that before. No, no. Wow. Thank you so much for the subs there. And thank you to the St. Louis Archbishops for playing the best chess of the weekend and ultimately winning the Pro Chess League Championship, helping to bring the title back to the chess capital of the world there in Missouri. And, uh, and wow, 500 Carwana, the 2000, giving a hug to his co-manager and buddy. Now we know why I thought that was Alejandro sitting there before. That's right. The, the, hair, the hairstyle there, they could be brothers. Uh, but seriously, just amazing chess there. Fabian Caruana finishes the weekend with a score of seven and a half out of eight. Not bad, right? I mean, why couldn't Fabiano go eight and zero? That's what <laughs> I'm upset about. No, it's just amazing chess here. It was it was a dominant performance from start to finish today by the Archbishops. Uh, they they were led by the man there, as you said. Yep. Other unofficial MVPs you talked about, Nicholas Theodoro. But what about Julian Proleko? Recovers yeah. from an 04 day one. Anyone with the word Leko in their last name right. they have to support their chest. Turns and out he is a pro, Leko. <laughs> well, that was well, a really good performance by the Archbishops, and you got to give the Snowballs credit for fighting in that last round, but it was too little too late, and yep. if they had shown that performance in earlier rounds, it would have been a closer match. Yep. It, it, it was tough, right? We, we, we will recap it. There were, there were several moments that probably could have gone the other way, but ultimately the momentum... It was captured by the Archbishops. They didn't let it slip. They are officially the 2019 Pro Chess League champions. More from San Francisco when we return, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Official Random Chess, a game where creativity is king and memorization impossible. 960 different back rank configurations turn the world's best chess players into mere competitors trying to outwit and outclass each other with every unprepared move. Only one will be worthy of the title, official random chess champion, but the best part is that champion could be you. The official random chess championship will be unlike any tournament ever held. With a global qualification system, for the first time ever, everybody truly has a chance to prove themselves the best player in the world at a chess variant. Are you a chess artist worthy of the 11th World Champion's admiration? We're going to find out. The tournament features open qualifiers beginning on April 28th and the title player qualifier stage beginning in June. Over $300,000, Fabiano Caruana, Hikaru Nakamura, and world champion Magnus Carlsen await you at the later stages. The Fisher Random Chess Championship title is there for the taking. Will you make a run at it? Go to frchess.com today to register and stay tuned to chess.com for all the latest news and updates regarding this historic event. It's the FIDE World Fisher Random Chess Championship organized by Dune AS and chess.com. The most elite event in online chess returns with more than $100,000 in prizes, the Speed Chess Championship is bigger and better than ever. 
As players try to qualify their way in through the women's and juniors field, we take a look ahead and see who's on deck waiting amongst the seated players. Of course, right there at the top, you have defending champion Hikaru Nakamura. He'll face a familiar cast of foes in guys like Jan Napomniashi, Alexander Grishuk, Jan Christoph Duda, and more. But perhaps his biggest challenger will be a brand new player in the field. Currently the world number three and the top chess player from China, Ding Li Ren at 2809 looks to make his SCC debut a memorable one. Look ahead and mark your calendars for November 29th through December 1st, where the semifinals and finals will happen. You can follow all the action at twitch.tv slash chess, chess.com TV, or go to speedchesschampionship.com to stay up to date with all the latest news and info. Be sure to fill out your fantasy bracket and try to predict who's going to win this year's Speed Chess Championship, and we'll see you on chess.com. And the 2019 Pro Chess League Championship has been won by the St. Louis Archbishops. The season comes to a close, and before we look forward to the 2020 season and bring the closing ceremony here into full motion, we have the commissioner once again. Greg, the season's over. Pretty exciting. What are your thoughts about the champions, the Archbishops, and the fact that they brought it back to St. Louis, given that they started off the inaugural season back in 2017 with a title? I mean, I came into this final knowing any team could win, um, and St. Louis, uh, they put a total team performance in. You know, a lot of people are going to talk about how Fabiano Caruana got 7.5 out of 8, but then you look at Pro Proleco in the final match getting 2 out of 4, I mean, that's huge. Benjamin Bach had a huge performance le uh, yesterday, and Theodoro, I think, started out this match with a big win to get the momentum in the Archbishop's favor, so I think... Everyone on that team can be really happy with how they performed. Well, we're, we're about to get the closing ceremony underway. Thank you, everybody, for being with us, sticking with us here before we invite our teams back on stage and give the medals to our winners. Greg, we look forward to the 2020 season. There's going to be lots of surprises, lots of fun, but you, I understand you have one big announcement you want to make while we have everyone's attention. A huge announcement. So there are a lot of teams that really want to get into the Pro Chess League. Like last year's qualifier, we had 30 teams trying to get eight spots. And then there's a bunch of teams that we didn't even let into the qualifier. Um, we think there are too many strong teams out there that want to get in. So next year, instead of 32 teams, we're going to have 40 teams. We're going to add eight extra teams. We're going to have more qualifiers in the fall. So it's going to be more exciting than ever next season, and a lot of different cities and countries and players are going to get a chance to play in the Pro Chess League. And that means I have to update all of our media assets instead of 32 teams from around the globe. It's four. No, I'm kidding. No, of course, it's great news, and it's really true that we... we finished last year's qualifiers with so many teams that we just felt terrible about sending away. Like, how do we send a team from Poland with a, you know, a huge average, guys like Wojtaszek and Duda, and they didn't get in, right? So going to be really exciting, 40 teams, and uh, thank you so much for all the work, dude. We're going to do the closing ceremony here, and thank you. All right. Well, um, before, we start to bring, before we start to bring the teams on, I just want to say to everybody here, thank you so much for being here. Our CEO always says that our, our mission statement as a company is to bring joy to people's lives through chess. And I was thinking about what this event means to us. And this event is really an extension of that and that we're bringing people together through chess. And I, I want to say that I've met so many people here this weekend that we've developed relationships with online. And I think a true testament to our partnership with Twitch and really what Twitch represents is that it's technology doing something that brings people together rather than separating them. And I think that getting to know people online and then seeing them come here in person has just been a really special experience. And I know we're all going to continue to play chess together online and, and watch shows together online. I just want to thank everybody for being here and celebrating this with us and coming together through chess. And here we go. We're going to get the show on the road. All right. So we have, we are going to start with the fourth place finishers, obviously the Armenia Eagles were last year's champions, and we know that this weekend didn't necessarily go the way they wanted it to, but uh, obviously making it to the final four is a huge accomplishment, super difficult. We have Zavan Andriasian, Haik Matiriasian, Sean Sargisian, and Anna Sargisian here. Mr. the hand, and then of course the manager, the man, Artak Manukian. Let's give them a huge round of applause. We are, we are sending, 
We, we are sending the 2018 champions back to Yerevan, of course, but we know we look forward to seeing you guys again next year. We know you'll be back bigger, better, stronger than ever. Obviously, the taste of the championship from last year got away from you this year, but Artok, thank you so much for all the work you do there in Armenia, Fort Chess, and for being here. And again, Armenia Eagles, we wish you the best of luck, and congratulations on getting fourth place this year and making it all the way to the finals. Thank you. We're going to have you guys step over here. And okay, our, our next team, we're gonna bring up the Shangdu Pandas right now. This team comes farther than, than anybody, although I don't know the distance from China to San Francisco over the Pacific. You, maybe Yerevan's far, I don't know. Alex Liu, the manager. Zhang Di, the, the young star. We've got Li Chao, a true ambassador for the game of chess growing in China. Wang Yue, and of course, Zhao Jun. These guys are every year people's pick to win it all. You guys just bring, you bring not only super strong players on the top boards, but underrated players. We never know what to expect. These guys had an amazing season, fell short, a rematch of last year's championship. They did win, so they get the bronze medal. And we're gonna start, go ahead, Anna and Alexandra, let's give these guys their medals and congratulate the Pandas one more time. Big round of applause. Bronze looks good on you. I know it's not gold, but bronze looks good on you. Thank you, guys. Again, congratulations again. Third place, Xiangdu Pandas. Our, se our second place finishers gave us, I think, what most people would agree was, was the most exciting victory of the entire weekend yesterday in an overtime thriller when they got by the Pacific Division champion Pandas. Obviously today did not go their way, but the bottom bot and snowballs fought through more trials and tribulations than a lot of people know to have an amazing performance this weekend. And let's give them a huge round of applause for the silver medal <laughs> for being here. What's up, dude? Hey, guys. Thank you, Paul. X marks the spot there, yeah. Let's go ahead and, and pass out the medals. I'm sorry, I, was, I thought it was gonna happen all at once, so we'll go ahead. We're gonna give these guys their silver medals, as we said. This was the first time of all the four teams here, they are actually the, the only new team. All, all the other three teams were here last year and they made it all the way to the championship before falling just short. So just an amazing season. We can't wait for next year and see what the bottom bot and snowballs bring. And I don't know, blue's my favorite color. That's all I'm gonna say. It just looks good, so. He's tall, he's tall. All right, thank you again to the snowballs and uh, thank you for everything. Congratulations on making it to the championship, and we can't wait to see what happens next year. Thank you, guys. I think they stay on stage. Go ahead. And okay, you've been here all weekend. You know what team is next, the St. Louis Archbishops. They, uh, they, they came, they came on a mission in many ways. To, uh, to bring the championship back to St. Louis where it started in 2017. A couple managers here, Mike, you said that uh, you felt that the Pro Chess League Championship belonged in St. Louis, it got away from you guys last year. What, what, was, what was the key to this year, just uh, from start to finish? What made you feel like it was a magical championship season as a manager? Well, look at the team we have, you know? Uh, the Young Guns, man, they're awesome. Th <laughs> you you were asked you were asked and and I, I don't want to say given criticism but asked asked a fair question about the lineup you chose to bring here we know that there's all kinds of chess tournaments you deal with what you have with necessity but you said you picked these guys for a reason right starting with Julian Perleko on board four you said we'd see why you brought him here and what did we see today on Sunday well he really uh, persevered today he got the 
the clincher, the match clincher, so I couldn't be more proud of that guy than anything. Well, and uh, obviously we know that the chess is strong in St. Louis, the growing, all kinds of stuff going on, but just how much does this mean to you, the club, the entire city of St. Louis to bring the Pro Chess League Championship back? The World Championship, right? <laughs> back in St. Louis where it belongs. Hopefully it will never flee. All right. Well, there you go, everyone. Your 2019 Pro Chess League champions. We're going to give them their medals. Let's give them one more round of applause here. And again, the last round of applause, of course, has to be for all of you guys for helping this event be incredible what it was. You guys have been loud, you've been proud, you've been amazing all weekend. One more round of applause for you, the fans. This is a different kind of chess event, and you guys make it possible. Thank you so much for being here. I think we're gonna get, what do we do now? We say goodbye, because this is the 2019 Pro Chess League. And uh, this, these are our champions. These are our Final Four teams. Thank you to all of you at home, everyone who tuned in on behalf of Chess.com, the entire crew here. We wish you good night, and we will see you next year. Goodbye. <laughs>